A very good morning to one and all who have joined us here in the Global Nursing Congress good morning, 2023. Very good morning, ma'am. Uh, I welcome each and every one of you uh, to this Global Nursing Congress organized by the Society for Nursing Practices and BioLeagues in association with renowned institutions as our academic partners. Rathland Regional Medical Center, Vermont, USA, Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamaya Hamad University, New Delhi, India, Dr. Malela Ramaya, College of Nursing, Nellore, India. To brief about the Society for Nursing Practices, shortly SFNP, the Society for Nursing Practices is a professional association caring for people. The dedication of SFNP to the advancement of nursing science and healthcare is truly commendable. The role of nurses in healthcare is pivotal and organizations like SFNP play a crucial role in promoting excellence in this field. SFNP's commitment to being a non-profit organization underscores its genuine intention to serve and uplift the nursing community and healthcare sector without any commercial interests. The, intent, the international dimension of the Society for Nursing Practices is significant as it signifies a global community of nurses who can learn from one another, bringing diverse perspectives and experiences to the table. In today's interconnected world, the importance of international collaboration in healthcare cannot be overstated. By creating a forum for nurses from around the world, Society for Nursing Practices facilitates cross-cultural learning and the exchange of best practices. Society for Nursing Practices is a, is a vital organization that serves as a beacon for the nursing community. Its dedication to knowledge sharing, international collaboration and the betterment of healthcare through nursing science is both noble and inspiring. SFNP brings together nurses from the nook and corners of the world. SFNP delivers access to its members, the industry's most essential technical information by organizing conferences, workshops, annual convention meetings, and provides networking opportunities both locally and globally. To brief about BioLeaks, BioLeaks is a not-for-profit not professional association which prominently promotes research and development. We at BioLeaks have brought a revolution in the field of worldwide conferences. BioLeaks conferences serve as a catalyst for professional development and knowledge exchange, bringing together the brightest minds and thought leaders in life science and medicine technology sectors. This platform plays a pivotal role in facilitating collaboration, innovation and information dissemination among professionals from diverse platforms. Biolix is at the forefront of fostering a positive in impact in the field of life sciences and medical technology. The commitment to sharing knowledge, international collaboration and professional development is indeed revolutionary. We look forward to witnessing the continued success and contributions that Biolix will make to the essential fields in the future. About the Global Nursing Congress 2023, with an earnest objective of creating an international forum for nursing academicians, researchers, and novice nurses, the Society for Nursing Practices enunciated the Global Nursing Congress 2023, which is held on the 27th and 28th October 2023. Following the success of our previous six editions of this nursing conference, Society for Nursing Practices continues to foster progress in the field of nursing and healthcare. This conference is a multidisciplinary program with broad participation with members from around the globe focused on learning about various facets of nursing and healthcare research. It is considered as an opportunity to be enlightened with the most recent advancements and developments in the field of nursing. The conference enlightens on the theme research-based practice of education nursing perspective. Research-based practice, commonly known as evidence-based practice, is now widely recognized as the key to improving healthcare quality and patient outcomes. The innovative ideas and intelligence have recently compelled all industries to lead the way in creating modern technical software and systems in the healthcare industry. Global Nursing Congress 2023 will expose you to a variety of viewpoints as well as the latest developments research-based practices and advancements in the field of nursing. I would like to take this time to introduce the academic partners. Rutland Regional Medical Center is the largest community hospital in Vermont and is dedicated to providing the best possible healthcare to the community. 
Uh, I request everyone to uh, have your microphones muted. To uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it is the second largest hospital in the state. Rathland Regional Medical Center has been providing high quality healthcare to the Rathland region for more than 125 years. The Rathland Regional is a magnet hour hospital supported by excellent nurses, high quality diagnostic and ancillary services, and a broad array of sophisticated equipment technology including advanced diagnostic imaging, a top-of-the-line linear accelerator used in the treatment of cancer patients, and a diagnostic cardiovascular and angiographic lab. Rutland Regional manages to adapt to change and growth while continuing the focus on a high standard of personalized quality medical care, adding key specialties to serve community needs and focusing on attracting and recruiting highly trained doctors, nurses, and staff. They are committed to providing the services both in and out of the hospital required to maintain the health of not just the patient but also of the community. <laughs> Rufai, the College of Nursing. Uh, the Rufaida College of Nursing, now Rufaida College of Nursing, was established in 1983 as per the vision of Janab Hakim Abdul Hamid Saheb, the founder of Jamai Hamad, who wanted to encourage girls from Muslim minority committee, community and weaker sections of the society to take up the noble profession of nursing. Rufaida College of Nursing has completed 30 years of its existence with commendable achievements in the field of nursing education. They carry, they carry the legacy of their founder, Hakim Saheb Janab Abdul Hamid, who gave the name Hamad to his venture, which means sympathy to all and sharing the pain. It offers diploma, graduate and postgraduate programs in nursing to meet the diverse needs of the healthcare com community. Qualified and experienced full-time nursing faculty provides the right mix of inputs comprising of theoretical, practical and clinical experience. Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing, Nellore, India is one of the top nursing colleges in Andhra Pradesh, which is situated in the Nellore district. It is also considered to be the best nursing college in Nellore. Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing is affiliated to Dr. NTR University of Health Sciences, Vijayawada. Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing is approved by the Indian Nursing Council and Andhra Pradesh Nursing and Midwives Council. Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing is a well-known institution for the BSc courses. These programs are delivered by highly experienced faculty. The college presents a collection of courses like BSc and Medicine and Health Sciences, Nursing programs, etc. The institute gives offers to students to gain proficiency and expertise in the specialization of oral pathology. I would like to welcome all our honorable dignitaries now. The conference organizer, Mr. Rudra Banu Satpati, Founder and CEO, Society for Nursing Practices, Technorate Group, India. The conference chair, Dr. Carol Gert Mays, Manager of Nursing Excellence, IRB Co-Chair and Coordinator, Rackland Regional Medical Center, United States of America. The conference secretary, Karen Cochran, Professor, Blue Ridge Community College, United States of America. I would like to welcome all our co-committee members of the Global Nursing Congress 2023. Paladino Francesco Pio, Administrative and Legal Nurse in Health Management, Correct Application of the Food Safety Protocol, Italy. Dr. Vimala Ramu, Senior Lecturer, Department of Nursing, Faculty of Medicine, University Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. <laughs> professor Veena Sharma, Principal and Professor, Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamaya Hamad, Deemed to be University, New Delhi, India. Dr. C. Kanyamal, Dean, SRM College of Nursing, SRM IST, SRM University, Chennai, India. Mr. Eba Adisa, Chief Academic and Research Director, Institute of Health Sciences. Uh, I'm really sorry, but please mute your phones, whoever is having your uh, uh, mic on mute. Please unmute your mic. Please keep.
Uh, I apologize. Uh, I request all the participants to keep your mics on mute. Just please make sure that it's on mute even if you leave and come back uh, because it really greatly helps the conference go smoothly. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Dr. S. Vasanta Kumari, Associate Professor, Department of Pediatric and Neonatal Nursing, Institute of Health Sciences, Balega University, Ethiopia. Dr. Seema Singh, Nursing Director and Professor, Medical Surgical Nursing, uh, Shalinitai Mege Hospital and Research Center, Maharashtra. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our eminent keynote speakers, Professor Shuli Sen, Principal, Tirthankar Parshnath College of Nursing, Tirthankar Mahavir University, Moradabad, Uttar Pradesh, India. Dr. Benjamin Joel Prabhonera, Program Director, Chair for BSN and MSN, Department of Nursing, King Faisal University, Board of Commissioner for Certifications, um, NLN, CNE, CNECL, CNEN, National League for Nursing, Vice President, Sigma Theta Tau, Industri International Honor Society for Nursing, Saudi Arabia, Dr. Veena Sharma, Principal and Professor, Rafaida College of Nursing, Jamaya Hamad, Dean to be University, New Delhi, Dr. Saji Baby, Professor and Program Director, Department Sustainability Studies, MIT, World Peace University, Pune, India. Dr. Suja Shamali G, Principal, Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing, Nalor, Andhra Pradesh. Daphne Peneza, FAORN, Perioperative Services Manager, Neurosurgery and Otorallingology, OR, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, USA. Dr. Gail M. Elliott, Associate Professor of Clinical Nursing, Western Carolina University College of Health and Human Services, School of Nursing at Biltmore Park, North Carolina, University, uh, United States of America. Darlene B. Murdoch, Vice President, Association of Perioperative Registered Nurses, AORN, United States of America. Dr. Abdullah Ali Ngala, Chief of Nursing Affairs, Eastern Health Cluster, Brand Ambassador, Nurses for Future Project, Saudi Arabia. Patriot Harry TMD, Chairman, Quality Improvement and Patient Safety, Charisma Hospital, West Java, Indonesia. Dr. Karen Kochrin, Professor, Blue Ridge Community College, United States of America. Dr. Karen Gert Mayes, Nurse Scientist and Clinical Educator, Institutional Review Board Coordinator, Rackland Regional Medical Center, Beaumont, USA. I welcome you all and I would like to welcome all the participants and students from Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamaya Hamad University, New Delhi, India, Dr. Ma Malela Ramaya College of Nursing, Nalor, India, SRM College of Nursing, SRM IST, SRM University, Chennai, India, SCM College of Nursing and Paramedical, Jammu and Kashmir, India, Vinayaka Mission College of Nursing, Puducherry, affiliated to Vinayaka Missions Research Foundation, DU, India. I welcome you all. Now I call upon Dr. Suja Shamali Ji, Principal Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing, Nellore, Andhra Pradesh, to welcome the gathering. Good morning, everyone. This is Suja Shamali, Principal Dr. Malela Ramaya College of Nursing. Hope I am audible. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Yes, thank you. On behalf of this International Organizing Committee, I'm honored and delighted to welcome you to the Global Nursing Congress 2023. This Congress is organized with the theme Research Based Practice and Education with Nursing Perspective. First and foremost, I'm extremely happy to welcome the organizer of this event, SFNP for taking a great lead to change the nursing perspective in view of research-based practice and education. I am glad to welcome scientific partners. I am glad to welcome scientific partners, Ruthland Regional Medical Center, Vermont, United States of America. And this event is really a fruitful platform to meet great partners. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Academic partners, Dr. Malal Ramya College of Nursing, Nellur, and Jamaya Hamdat Deem to be University for this event. I take great pleasure to welcome many professionals and presenters in this Congress from all over the world with keynote, keynote talks and invited speakers, scientific 
presentations, poster presentations, and also we will have the special sessions. Welcome to our discussion on research-based practice and education, the nursing perspective. We are delighted to have you join us in this exploration of how research informs and advances the field of nursing. This theme is of the heart of ensuring high quality patient care, professional growth and the development of evidence-based practices in healthcare. Throughout our journey, we'll delve into the crucial relationship between research and nursing, emphasizing how evidence-based practices improve patient outcomes, enhance the quality of care, and promote innovation in the field. We'll also discuss how research-based education empowers nurses to stay current with the latest developments in healthcare and equips them with the knowledge and skills they need to excel in their roles. As we engage in this dialogue, we encourage you to share your insights, experiences, questions together so we can foster a deeper understanding of the intersection of research, practice, and education in nursing. I am glad that you all are being a part of this brilliant event and let's embark on this enriching journey to promote excellence and drive positive change in the world of nursing. Looking forward to meet you all and have a great day. Let us all begin the day with a great aspiration. Thank you and all for giving me this opportunity. Welcome you all again. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to hand over the session to the pillar of our association, Mr. Rudra Banu Satpati, founder and CEO, Society for Nursing Practices, BioLeaks Technorate Group, India, to give the welcome address. Very good morning, everyone. Uh, hope I am audible. Thank you very much, Pauline, for this wonderful welcome and the entire team of Society for Nursing Practices <clears throat> and our beloved academic partners, esteemed dignitaries, uh, my revered speakers, uh, faculties from uh, Nook and Corner of Globe and different uh, states of India as well, and all our academic partners, uh, the brilliant uh, young presenters and all over 250 participants of this conference and uh, almost 80 plus presenters uh, those who are going to make their uh, scientific uh, abstract presentations uh, who have been shortlisted after a thorough uh, review of uh, received of 150 abstracts and uh, by our editorial committee uh, dignitaries and uh, experts uh, in nursing healthcare practices over these last uh, eight years of our journey society for nursing practices has always emphasized on globalization of evidence-based practices, and knowledge and skills in nursing sectors. We have uh, always been committed towards development of the institutions, research centers, colleges, universities to come forward and uh, make them more capable with our schemes and our skill development programs of capacity building, where we encourage and motivate uh, our institutions, uh, particularly colleges in developing countries, and almost in developed countries also, where we give them all round supports in terms of globalizations and uh, in terms of uh, building a professional community networking through our couple of services that focus on knowledge sharing and uh, community uh, management services by organizing these all multiple conferences. Like uh, we had organized successful conferences in different uh, countries, uh, maybe in, in, in Dubai, in, uh, in Singapore, and uh, in uh, Malaysia also, uh, like fourth international conference and uh, nursing con uh, congress and healthcare was organized at Malaysia. We organized multiple conferences in uh, different uh, colleges and universities, uh, Asia and India particularly. Uh, uh, we created a platform uh, that would but it is uh, universities all across the globe. So that an interconnected uh, platform could be created. Uh, we are in verge of providing end-to-end -end, uh, academic and scientific as well as professional services that includes uh, the capacity development in field of research uh, uh, productivity in increasing the research outcomes of the institutions because we have strongly believed the development of the research outcome is the most uh, important aspect on which every responsible association and organization must focus on 
and uh, we provide all round uh, uh, professional services including uh, publications uh, you know uh, training uh, youngsters young researchers about the research methodologies the ethics of the publications and uh, evidence based education as well as outcome based education so these are the things we have been focusing over these years i express my hearty gratitude and my heartfelt thanks to my respected uh, conference chair dr karol uh, from uh, the manager of nursing excellence uh, and coordinator ratland regional medical center i express my gratitude to honorable conference secretary uh, dr karen koshran professor blue ridge community college united states of america uh, mm -hmm. this wonderful meeting and this wonderful conference would not have been possible unless and until our core committee members of global nursing congress uh, 2023 would have taken leadership uh, i would like to name them uh, dr bimala ramu ma'am thank you very much uh, professor veena uh, sharma uh, dr uh, c kanyamal dean srm college of nursing uh, mr eva abdiza uh, from ethiopia dr vasant kumari dr seema singh and paladino francisco uh, uh, the uh, administrative and legal nurse in health management with heartfelt feelings if i would have pronounce the names wrong kindly forgive me my hearty gratitude to all the series of excellent thought provoking keynote speakers we have here in this wonderful morning uh, those who are going to dissipate uh, the knowledge because uh, dissipation of knowledge in the community management and uh, knowledge circulation has been our prime goal and we have been focusing on this uh, i hope this conference will be a wonderful experience for everyone and this uh, could be done in a virtual way we are very soon looking ahead to participate uh, to organize and uh, partner with uh, other institutions and colleges in universities uh, all across the globe where the conferences could be organized and where we can meet physically as well very soon i wish everyone uh, very all the best and uh, i wish everyone to have a wonderful conference i thank you very much thank you sir i now call dr c kandiyamal Dean SRM College of Nursing, SRM IST, SRM University, Chennai, India, to deliver the inaugural address. Very good morning to one and all. So the this is my immense pleasure to be here uh, in the morning session to inaugurate the highly uh, motivated group. So it, uh, I, first I would like to thank uh, the founder, uh, Rudra Banu Sadapti, and uh, the CEO, and uh, the welcome address by Suja and uh, Sushmita. I, I want to thank you for uh, the, even though at the end moment, uh, you just communicate, uh, we, we just noted this because of our busy schedule, but uh, we have make it possible. And many of our faculties are also involved in this uh, conferences to present about virtually so here the uh, as such the conference theme it is uh, very much need of the hour for everyone so throughout the globe it is very very uh, essential for all of us to become to follow the evidence based practice to improve the quality at the bedside so this is very vital for all the nurses particularly uh, it is a global health uh, uh, issues uh, it is existing beyond the pandemic uh, a lot of uh, issues in in front of the health environmental issues uh, and nursing shortage a uh, lot many things it is there beyond to that the practice of evidence based practice is uh, very essential to improve the quality at the bedside so that is the foremost important whatever may be the virtual or the uh, on uh, on campus uh, conferences so we want to thank the pandemic because of the pandemic uh, so we are virtually connected earlier to that not much uh, virtually connected only on campus uh, we used to disseminate all our knowledges everything so but uh, we have to uh, there is a good thing it happened because of the pandemic 2019 and 20 we were uh, freezed at home and we were interacting through online lectures for the classes and uh, even for the practical simulations everything so but uh, we came so uh, out of that pandemic we cannot say we came out fully but even now uh, reemerging in somewhere some else in some different forms of uh, respiratory illnesses throughout the globe so it is a challenge for all the nurses so that's why so the challenge how to overcome so with this uh, 
we have a lot of challenges to overcome to practice the evidence based nursing so we, we you know we know all the evidence based practice steps for how to uh, deal about the clinical evaluation and evidence what is the clinically un, uh, unanswered questions can be taken off for the evidence based practice and in how to integrate the clinical experiences and the patient experiences as well and evaluate the results uh, finally with the challenges and everything we are overcoming the funding a uh, lot many difficulties uh, to conduct research so even beyond to that we are uh, because of the benefits uh, it is overway uh, the um, all the struggles uh, we are uh, just uh, taking up the evidence based practice uh, so that it, uh, to improve the patient's outcome and uh, uh, self satisfaction and then the uh, clinical uh, improvement in uh, terms of quality patient care, efficient in youth, uh, use of uh, healthcare resources, and improve the job satisfaction for the nurses throughout the globe. So it, it is evidence-based uh, nursing is the cry. So we, we are here as the nursing leaders and the managers, we need to face a lot many challenges to implement evidence-based practices. So in order to achieve the benefit of which our foresight uh, by a few uh, benefits for the patient and for the organization and for the nursing as a whole. As we, we need to have a self-satisfaction in terms of professional satisfaction as well. So for that, we need to take up some uh, steps as a leaders. So we need to have a, overcome the, the lack of organizational support and resistance to change view of the nursing professionals as well to conduct research so it is a very, uh, very, very uh, important thing we have to take into consideration as a nurse leader, as a manager at the bedside. So uh, jointly we need to work for to fill the gap between the nursing education and service. So the integrative, competent and collaborative throughout the globe, international participants are here. So I am very much delighted to uh, see all the em eminence uh, uh, in, in the introduction speech. So we will have a very thorough uh, MOUs and we will develop, uh, definitely we will cooperate with this society and then we will do marvelous uh, improving in status of our professional image and then as well the patient quality care at the bedside. So everything, all the research focuses for the patient care. So that is the one, that is the core point we need to know as being nursing professional where, where we are in service or maybe in education or doing research. So if all the purposes, the quality patient care improvement is needed, that is the need of the hour. And we all are here to cooperate for the society. I thanks for the opportunity because of the time constraints. I, do, I want to talk more on uh, global the health issues and other thing, but no time. Uh, so I know, uh, so I want to cut short. So I just to conclude my speech with evidence-based nursing is a critical approach that enable nurses to provide care based, that is the best available evidence, clinical experience and patient experiences. By following the steps of evidence-based practice, nurses can make informed decision about patient care that are based on uh, the best available evidences. Evidence-based practice has numerous benefits for the nurses, patient, and healthcare system as a whole. However, there are several challenges to implement evidence-based practice, that is lack of uh, knowledge and skill even for the uh, nurses, nursing people, about the research I'm telling you, and time constraints, lack of support, and resistant to change. These are some few uh, challenges we have to overcome as a nurse leaders, as the manager, and then we need to propagate the evidence-based practice by doing high-quality researches and disseminating through publications with the high-index journals and other things. Nursing is the emerging profession in terms of research, I'm telling. So it is a good old profession, more than uh, in that ICN has uh, very well uh, said uh, large uh, in terms of three terms of a goal, how it has to be with uh, WHO. But even we, we are not achieving still throughout the goal. There is an inequality and imbalance in everywhere throughout the nation, uh, not only here in developing nation, even in the developed nation, the shortage of nurses are there. And uh, uh, in application of evidence-based practice is also very 
uh, it is very challenging for all of us. But however, like this kind of conferences, it will uh, eye opening uh, create an eye opening session for all of us and to improve our standard and professional exhibit will be there and we uh, assure all our young generations are so fortunate to have uh, this kind of uh, disseminations and take up these challenges uh, as a uh, um, footing, uh, stepping stone. And then we need to improve and we will develop so that I, with assurance, uh, uh, all uh, we have to work collaboratively, internationally, nationally, and regionally, everywhere. So definitely we will come up with the good uh, challenges uh, and uh, we will face the challenges we will uh, come out with a fruitful solution for all kind of uh, this evidence-based practice. So with this, I will conclude my session. I thank the opportunity opportunity provided for to, uh, uh, to speak in this inaugural session. So I am very much delighted. So I am thanking all the organizers, so especially Susmita, and to have a very nice uh, cooperation to, with all, all of us. And then uh, our faculties are also involved in many of uh, the research knowledge has been disseminated through this conference. I am thanking for each and every one. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I now request Professor Veena Sharma, Principal and Professor, Rafaida College of Nursing, Jamaya Hamad, Dean to be University, New Delhi, India, to deliver the inaugural address. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, greetings from Rafaida College of Nursing to all the distinguished guests and delegates. Uh, the Feather College of Nursing, Jamia Hamdard, is delighted to co-host the Global Nursing Congress 83. And this is the third year in a row that we are co-hosting the International Conference in association with Society for Nursing Practice and BioLeads. Uh, like in the past years, this year also, the theme of the conference is very re relevant in the context of nursing profession. That is research. are from different parts of the world. be delivering keynote addresses today and tomorrow are from different parts of the world and different parts of India. And for the scientific uh, presentations also, I could see that we have got overwhelming response. Uh, and this just goes on to show that the nursing fraternity now more than ever is actually sitting back to take cognizance of the importance of research-based practice in clinical and academic setting. Like the previous speaker uh, told that uh, quality nursing patient care is the focus even when we are talking about evidence-based nursing practice. Uh, the, so there is this importance of research-based practice in clinical academic setting. Uh, while in the clinical setting, research-based practice by nurses is bound to propagate patient-centered care, improve patient satisfaction, good quality health care, and improve treatment outcomes. In the academic set setting, it is destined to raise standards of nursing education. At this juncture, I invoke all nursing fraternity holding key leadership positions to promote, perpetuate, and propagate the search temper in clinical nurses and nursing students alike. And this has to be done right from the word go so that research-based practice in nursing becomes rule rather than an exception. I congratulate the organizers, Mr. Rudra Bhanu Satpati and his team, namely Sushmita Lawrence, other co-hosts and all stakeholders for envisaging, planning, organizing, and partaking in the conference today and tomorrow. My best to all guests and um, delegates. Thank you. 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity once again to extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you who have joined us here for the Global Nursing Congress. And we hope that this conference will be a source of inspiration, innovation, and uh, camaraderie. Let us embark on this journey of discovery together with open minds and eager hearts. On that note, I would like to welcome our first keynote speaker, Professor Shuli Sen, Principal, Tirthankar Parshanath College of Nursing, Tirthankar Mahavir University, Moradabad, Uttar Pradesh, for her keynote lecture on the topic, Transforming Practice Through Clinical Research. A very warm good morning to all and one present over here in this online session. All the dignitaries, guest speakers, participants, organizers, a hearty welcome to each one of you on behalf of Tirthankar Pashtanath College of Nursing under the University of Tirthankar Mahavir University, Muradabad. It's my proud privilege to talk regarding the topic which has been given to me that is uh, transformation of practice into clinical nursing research so before we go into the clinical nursing research what is clinical research it is a branch of a healthcare service that determines the safety as well as effectiveness, efficacy of medications, devices, diagnostic products, and treatment regimes intended for human use. And these may be used for the prevention, promotion, restoration, duration, and treatment, diagnosis, or for relieving symptoms of a disease. So keeping this in view about the clinical research, the clinical nursing research is a systematic inquiry into the problems encountered in nursing practice and into the modalities of the patient care. So basically, we do the clinical nursing research to uplift and to enhance the health care standards and qualities uh, in the patient's care in different hospitals, either in the hospital level or at the community level, because the nursing services are rendered under the two pillars, that is hospital and community. So, if we want to do the clinical nursing research, then we need to have some kind of level of evidence. And these level of evidence we collect from the unfiltered information as well as from the filtered information. If we find any problem or any kind of challenges are encountered by the nursing personnel, either regarding the nursing service administration or nursing care administration to the patients, then we need to have some supportive documents to support the problem or the challenges what we face. And that supportive documents can we get from the extensive review of literature uh, with some significant statistical data. So under that, we have unfiltered information which we get from the hospital or uh, from our uh, community. That is the background information and expert opinion we take before we take up that uh, challenging problem. Uh, to be sorted out, to be solved in the clinical nursing research process. We have case studies, case series, case reports we collect from the medical record sections and also while doing the research study in the among the patients in the hospital by analyzing the trend. So it comes under like case control studies, cohort studies, that is the trend studies, randomized controlled trials. So these are the unfiltered informations. And these we collect from the textbooks or from access medicine or clinical field. Filtered one, informations we have like critically appraised topics, systematic reviews we do, meta-analysis we do. And these all uh, informations we can gather 
from the Medline PubMed. Uh, then we have Super, Sinhal, Trip, and different other database like Cochrane data, Cochrane database of systematic review. We have Dare, uh, we have Campbell collaboration, library of systematic reviews, and Trip. So, as a nursing personnel, to support the challenging issues what they have faced or they are facing in order to represent it in the form of a research problem statement and to do a clinical research, it is very important to have the evidence-based supportive documents to support the study with some relevant statistical data which we collect from these levels of evidence. Now, why clinical research is important to the nursing practice? Very important question because it results in better patient outcomes. The more we do the clinical research, we get numerous number of uh, remedies, we get different kinds of uh, uh, enhanced practices, which helps to improve the patient quality care, faster recovery, restoration of health, prevention from any kind of diseases. So it's very important to have a clinical research on a uh, regular basis in the clinical setup so that we can give a better patient care. Second is it contributes to the science of nursing. The more we do the research, the science of nursing improves, enhance. We get a number of knowledge informations which we can help in providing the best quality care to the patient in a holistic approach. It also keeps practice current and relevant. It increases confidence and decision making among the nursing personnel so that they can do critical analysis. And uh, by doing the critical analysis, they can have the judgmental uh, aspect in a very critical manner with the reflective thinking. And accordingly, the best possible decisions are being made. Policies and procedures are correct and include the latest research. So the more we do research, the more we have advanced procedural steps, we can develop protocols which will help the uniformity in giving care to the patients in the hospital. And also we can have the policies, the ethical aspects, which uh, helps to provide no harm to the patient and best outcome in the patient care. So the need for clinical nursing research. It is very much important to have a clinical nursing research because Evidence-based practice always ensures efficacy, efficiency, and effectiveness. And it also weighs risk. The more we do the clinical research, the more we can reduce the risk. And we can have a very good risk management, benefit and cost effective against a backdrop of patient preferences and promotes patient satisfaction and higher health-related quality of care. So this is the ultimate thing. The more we have uh, reduced the risk, uh, risk among the patients, the more we have cost-effective uh, uh, modalities or interventions in our research outcomes, which we can implement on the patient. Definitely, it ensures the efficacy, efficiency, and effectiveness in the patient care. And that is how, ultimately, the patient satisfaction comes out. So why nurses? are very important in this particular team of doing the clinical nursing research because critical members of the patient care team. The nurses are the critical members, the primary members, the important, significant, pivotal members of the healthcare delivery system in the healthcare team. And also, as it is a noble profession, the nurses are empathy, having empathy, sympathy, and noble fellow beings, closure to the participants and the patients. We all agree that nurses are there 24 into 7 near the bedside of the patient. In terms of any kind of uh, assignments we provide uh, to render the care in the hospital, it may be the progressive patient care, it may be the functional assignments to the nurses, it may be the primary nursing care. Everywhere, nurses are the first person to come in contact and to remain in contact with the patient and the participants throughout the hospital stay. Care and research are a continuum because these are the both extreme ends of a health illness continuum. Patients and good interpersonal relationships recognize globally 
that nurses play an important role in, in emancipating quality care by research and quality framework. So the more we do the research, the more we enhance the nursing science in terms of knowledge, attitude, and skill. So the role of nurses in clinical research, mainly there are two major roles of the nurses in clinical research. The first one is the clinical research nurse, and the second one is the nurse researcher. So the clinical research nurse, they are the registered nurse with an exclusive focus on the care of clinical research participants. And uh, the nurse researcher, they are the chief scientist designing and implementing the health research projects. So both of them are equally important in the field of clinical nursing research. The, there are some different sources of clinical nursing research from where we get the ideas and we take into different innovative things. That is the benchmarking data, the clinical expertise, knowledge, experience, and exposure, what we have, the cost-effective analysis, as well as the infection control data. Other sources are like from the medical record data, we get it from the hospital, uh, while we can take these data into consideration to identify the significant statistical figures uh, to support the study. And other than that, also, we have different case studies, case reports, cohort studies, which also helps us to provide the information and the outcome data related to the research which has been done maybe previously. But we can take into consideration to see how better and effective way we can use more innovative implement interventions to sort out the problem. We also have national standards of care, quality improvement data, as well as patient and family preferences. Because according to the modern phase of the location, we always consider two important things, that is the patient-centered care, that is the extended to the family-centered care, and another one is the participatory care. So, we always give the preference to the patient family members, to the patients, to involve themselves as a participatory caregiver in the patient recovery process. So, clinical nursing research priorities. What are the priorities a clinical nurse research should nursing research should have? The first one is the effective workforce, that is, evaluating the competency framework, patient nurse ratio exploration of different models of care delivery and program development. So these are the very important, basic, fundamental things one must have in their list to before they start with the clinical nursing research. Followed by that, we have effective clinical outcome or we can say clinical governance, that is clinical innovations. Different kinds of innovative ideas, innovative interventions, can be taken into consideration after doing several extensive review of literature, uh, consulting with the experts, so that we can find out some cost-effective, eco-friendly, and user-friendly interventions, which will help in the patient's better outcome. Optimizing patient outcome. So once we have the clinical innovations, we, inter we do the intervention implementation, and we see the optimizing patient outcome uh, in terms of doing the data analysis, what we get the result inferences. Integration of evidence into practice so that whatever we have the evidence-based uh, findings we have got, we need to implement into the practice to improve the quality and standard of care. Systems and progress evaluation, process evaluation, it is very important. Quality improvement initiatives, which is again, uh, as an example, like Lean Six uh, Sigma for weight reduction, which we will come in the uh, next coming slides. So these are the very effective things uh, should be keep, kept in mind as a clinical nurse research priority. Other important things are like positive experience and collaborations, the process of developing the partnership with the consumers fostering engagement with patients and families to participate in either in their own care as well as the impact of disease causes and interventions upon the quality of life or patients and their families. The last but not the least, that is patient safety and zero harm. We also have to keep in mind 
because when we do the clinical nursing research, we should not do anything which may harm the patient's outcome, the, the progress or the treatment regime. So we have to, uh, again, take into the ethical consideration part of it. So in that, we have incident review, development of policies and protocol, system analysis, product development, and clinical risk management. What are the different steps now in clinical research? That is, all of us we know, and uh, we also uh, do it in our uh, research methodology, research design, when we guide the students in our master's levels on and the PhD scholars also, they do the research. The basic fundamental steps are formulating the research questions based on day-to-day -day care. So we need to formulate the research questions, like what are the problems or the challenges has been encountered and how we can frame it in a research problem statement. Defining the purpose of the study, what is the purpose, why we are taking up this challenging issue as one of the research problem statement to sort it out. So the significance of uh, doing the study on this uh, area is has to be defined in terms of purpose and followed by which we have to support again the study with some relevant data, facts and figures which we get it from the review of literature then formulating the hypothesis which is empirically tested and defining the variables different independent dependent and extraneous variables has to be defined in the study followed by which we have selecting the research design, which includes the research approach and the design, what kind of approach we are using, whether it is qualitative, quantitative, what kind of designs we are using, whether it is experimental, pre-experimental, pre-experimental, quasi-experimental, different kind of designs. We decide based on the type of the problem and what is the intervention or the process of implementing the intervention we are working. Along with that, we have to have sample who are the samples which we derive from the population and the setting where we are going to do the study and conducting a pilot study to check the feasibility of the study. And then we go for the collecting and data analyzing change of practice towards the quality input. So once we analyze the data, we draw the inferences and we see uh, how the inferences, the outcome uh, result is going to be definitely implications can be done in the nursing research, in the nursing education, in nursing practice, in nursing administration, in nursing healthcare delivery system. So we have some kind of regulations that is uh, the clinical trial registry India, CTRI, has been set up by the ICMR's National Institute of Medical Statistics and is funded by the Department of Science and Technology through the Indian Council of Medical Research. An institutional ethics committee also come into existence when we proceed for any kind of clinical nursing research. What is the basic process of clinical research that is developed a clinical judgment measuring measurement model? So when we have some kind of uh, research design with the uh, research uh, interventions, we also should have some kind of clinical uh, judgment measurement parameters so that we can identify or evaluate or assess the effectiveness of the intervention. We should also have the item prototypes development, item usability testing, item data collection. So tools and techniques has to be clarified, validated, and reliability should be tested. Measurement research that is related to mostly the quantitative research, technology built, alpha or in beta testing, whatever we have to do the testing, either in the lab or in the natural setting or in the simulated setting, and followed by which the launching of that particular intervention as an evidence-based practice can be done. So this is one important aspects of doing the process of this the clinical nursing research in short form we call it as PICOT, where P stands for patient or population and the problem, I stands for intervention in terms of dependent and independent variable, C stands for comparison, O stands for outcome that is the result and D stands for time. So we have an example of the PICOT format that is population who can be the characteristic in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, or any health issues like diabetes, access to health care. Interventions, what we give it on the patient, and we see its outcome after giving the intervention. So it can be 
any kind of drug surgery or any program we have made in terms of like uh, any kind of it information or programs we have made and we want to disseminate among the population policy or any setting that is the geographical areas comparison we do with the control group like we don't keep intervention no intervention or some common practices or we keep uh, there is like solomon four group design where we keep different interventions and we give in a uh, permutation and combination basis so those aspects are included over here outcome is the example like blood glucose body mass index and the time and type of studies it depends upon the type of questions and the type of studies what we are doing so the clinical nursing research designs also includes descriptive design like we have the survey methods correlational studies where we uh, try to find out the entire uh, communities rituals religion habits practices their the dressing style their eating pattern everything because all these things it directly contributes or uh, have an impact on the healthcare aspect of that particular community next we have analytical studies like already have mentioned case control studies cohort studies or epidemiological studies we do experimental research designs like we have pre experimental quasi experimental and randomized clinical trials we also have mean six sigma and qualitative research so it includes the phenomenological studies grounded studies ethnographic studies all these uh, are related to the qualitative research design now coming to this uh, lean six sigma methodology we have in that defined so we need to define the what we are trying to achieve that is what and next is the measure that is uh, what we are doing and how well we are doing it we need to have certain parameters which is reliable and valid one to measure as well as we have analysis part that uh, identifies you know the statistics what we do in terms of descriptive or inferential statistics to identify what kind of association what kind of correlation what kind of uh, frequency percentage are the data is are producing so that we can draw the inferences from that we also have uh, improve that is uh, identify the options for improvement or to compare and to implement a road map for the changes and lastly we have the control that is the new process which defines the desired key outcomes create the dashboard and ensure the implementation so what are the different types of question or the best type of study we can do according to the type of question so here we can see uh, the type of question uh, which indicates the therapy how to select treatment to offer patients that do more good than harm and that is what the efforts and cost of using them so the best type of study we can do if we have this kind of questions that is clinical randomized controlled trial design if we do uh, the question in terms of prevention like how to prevent a disease or condition then we can go for either rct or cohort study or case control for the prognosis kind of questions like how to estimate the patient's likely clinical course over the time and anticipate likely complications of disease then we can go for cohort studies or case control or case series or case report in terms of diagnosis kind of questions like how to select and interpret diagnostic test then it is blind rct uh, we can go for and etiology or harm if we have some questions regarding that how to identify causes of disease then rct cohort study or case control will be the best option and cost analysis point of view if we see then economic cost of all facets of an intervention or disease treatment then we can go for economic analysis kind of study so what are the different challenges in clinical nursing research so we have here navigating organizational restructure sometimes it happens we need to restructure the organizational uh, part so that we can get the best support in terms of uh, financial aspect in terms of ethical aspects and in terms of feasibility of the study so that it can be done in a very 
well mannered women and managing with the uncertainty many a times uncertainty comes so the flexibility should be there in the plans of our study controlling and working with economic constraints so with this um, if you have any questions uh, any one of the participants you can please ask so this is very important to have the clinical nursing research uh, either in the hospital or in the community just to improve the quality and standard of patient care so that we can get the best outcome in terms of patient's health for prevention, promotion, restoration, and from the curative aspects of the patient care. Thank you. If any of the participants have any questions, uh, you're most welcome to uh, put them forward in the forum or you can also uh, type it in the chat box. You can probably give a couple of minutes, ma'am, if any of the participants have any questions. Okay, if there are no questions, I would like to uh, thank you uh, so much, Professor uh, Dr. Shuli Sen, for taking the time to impart your knowledge on this vital topic. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, I would like to welcome the next keynote speaker, Professor Veena Sharma, Principal and Professor, Prophetha College of Nursing, Jamaida Hamad, PNGP University, New Delhi, to deliver her keynote lecture on the topic, Enhancing Sustained Productivity for Nurse Scientists. Uh, so, good morning and greetings once again from Rufaida College of Nursing, Jamia Hamdard, New Delhi. Um, I welcome you all to this keynote session on enhancing sustained productivity for nurse scientists. Now, from the very beginning, when we joined nursing profession, we have been uh, learning that nursing is both an art and science. And there is no debating over the fact that nursing is both an art as well as science. And since nursing is science, therefore, research is one important aspect of nursing as science. However, uh, research in nursing is often overlooked or undervalued by nurses themselves and also by the other healthcare professionals or other health team members. And nursing has evolved over the years and there has been uh, the talk of uh, nursing research in clinical setting as well as academic settings. And uh, over the years, it has been gaining momentum and it has been in the forefront as an important contribution to healthcare and health policy and um, better patient treatment outcomes. If we talk about the term nurse researchers, so there have been nurse researchers mostly in academic sectors, set, which either as part of the partial fulfillment or at times, even otherwise, they take up researchers. Some of the academicians in nursing, they conduct action research, hands-on on-site uh, research in the hospital or in clinical setting. And it is mostly the academicians in nursing who write research articles and reports for professional journals and publications. So that way, uh, academicians in nursing have been active in participating in uh, researches. 
there have been certain benefits. Uh, we have coined the term nurse researcher now, nurse researcher, and another term that we have coined is nurse scientist. So what are the benefits if all nurses across the board, whether they are in academics or in cl uh, clinical area, they uh, also assume the role of a nurse researcher? Definitely, there will be benefits for all to reap. <laughs> So nurse researchers often conduct research researches in partnership with other disciplines, be it pharmacy, nutrition, medicine, social sciences, and psychology. And that way they can better address complex complex questions and problems both in the clinical and academic settings. And having an on-site nurse scientist, particularly in a teaching hospital, can lead to really important scientific breakthroughs that combine research with real world. Because there has always been a felt gap between the researches and the practice which happens in the real world. And it is important to bridge this gap so that whatever researches are conducted, they are translated into practice by the nurses uh, on site. We also believe that whenever we will have nurse researchers in the hospital setting or in the clinical setting, there will be a snowball effect, which means one nurse researcher can, uh, can produce the reverberations which will touch all the people, all the nurse professionals around them. And they will also have an inquiring mind. They will also be asking questions as why a certain phenomenon is happening or how a certain phenomenon is happening. And asking these questions is very much important if we talk about the evidence-based nursing practice. So the snowball effect is going to be infectious and not only the nurse researcher, but all the nurse professionals around them will wake up to the fact that nursing research is required and that they need to ask questions as to why they are doing a certain practice and how they are doing it and how they can change the practice and base it on the research evidence available. According to an article in University of California, San Francisco, uh, the positive effects for patients uh, of the nurse researcher, it can be in both big and small ways. That is, in the clinical setting, we can see that nurse researchers can bring about change in terms of reduced infections, reduced falls and lengths of stay for patients, more informed and better informed parent, uh, patients, reduced readmissions and improved transitions from hospital to home. Now, another term that we coin is a nurse scientist. So who is a nurse scientist? A nurse scientist is a nurse with advanced preparation, such as MSc nursing or PhD nursing or related field, including the knowledge they have about research principles and research methodology, and also expert knowledge in their particular clinical area. In India, we have uh, qualifications such as MSc nursing and PhD nursing, which prepares nurses to become nurse scientists. Uh, but um, in other countries, I've, I have read that there is uh, a qualification called as doctor of, doctor of uh, nursing practice, which we still don't have in India. Uh, however, uh, as I said earlier, just now that uh, uh, MSc nursing and PhD nursing uh, prepares nurses in um, the process of becoming a nurse scientist. So traditionally, nurses have been known to be caregivers or assistants in clinical settings. And these roles are important, but equally important are the nurses' roles as researchers, scientists, and innovators. And gone are the times when nurses would just be uh, sticking to the uh, caregiving in the hospitals, now they are uh, basing their care on the research evidence 
and not only are they basing their care on the research evidences but they are also contributing to the body of knowledge in nursing so that they can improve their care giving practices and base it on sound solid scientific uh, research evidences so since we have coined the term nurse scientists we believe that with their qualifications in the background they would have this unique knowledge experience and wherewithal in research evidence based practice and different theories of nursing which will help them to uh, not only assume but also play a significant role as nurse scientists they apply their deep and diverse expertise to design implement and evaluate new nursing interventions in the clinical area and that in turn will promote improved health outcomes better satisfaction for patients and satisfaction for healthcare professionals as well dr nancy blake from children's hospital los angeles has something to say on nurse scientist i quote with their knowledge and hands on experience nurses can theorize hypothesize structure studies and collect evidence that leads to better care the goal of nursing is to achieve better care standards and applications for patients and families i unquote so in the beginning of uh, today's sessions one of the speakers said that our goal uh, in evidence nursing practice is definitely the patient care so nurse scientists eventually through their researches are working contributing towards improved patient care improved nursing care for the patients nurses in the leadership roles they can benefit from research based education and experience and as i said earlier it can be gained through an advanced degree program such as msc nursing and phd nursing and these prog programs provide the medical professionals or nursing professionals with the skills and wherewithal required to conduct research and lead teams of nurses towards making new discoveries now what does a nurse scientist do nurse scientists they conceptualize identify research questions they design the research methodology and they conduct research studies collect data analyze data and then further report their findings in scientific journals they are also responsible for teaching and mentoring students and colleagues in their fields like i said earlier the snowball effect which is going to affect all people around which is going to touch upon all the people all nursing professionals around the nurse scientists and uh, 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 teaching and mentoring students and colleagues in the field also requires its own set of skills and is necessary to create the change Dr Renata Jonas a uh, staff educational consultant in Kaiser Permanente Hospital uh, has something to say on this i quote research can become a component of a nurse scientist role when insufficient clinical or scientific evidence is available or when lessons learned during translation lead to researchable questions thus collaborating with a nurse scientist who is an expert in designing and implementing scientific studies may lead to new knowledge that can be applied to further improve patient outcomes i am quote what are the key responsibilities of a nurse scientist so the first key responsibility of a nurse scientist is conducting research which means they have to conceptualize conceptualize and identify the research questions then design the methodology implement and analyze studies to address nursing issues they also have to identify and fill the gaps between research and nursing practice and thus contribute to the advancement and improvement of evidence based practice in nursing and other responsibilities that they have to formulate nursing theories and uh, they with their research evidence and empirical evidence they can formulate models and frameworks and theories which will help towards scientific nursing practice communication is another responsibility of a nurse scientist that means not only has she, uh, has she got to uh, conduct uh, researches in her 
or his area, but also disseminate those findings by publishing research studies in scientific journals. They can also attend and participate in conferences. Like today's conference is one case in point where we will see that uh, many of our uh, uh, colleagues are going to uh, do the scientific presentations. And this just goes on to show that more and more nurses are conducting researches and also they are more than ready to communicate their findings to the entire nursing community and thus share their knowledge and expertise and research findings. Another key responsibility of a nurse scientist is education. That means uh, she, has, she has to teach and mentor nursing students and not only nursing students, but even uh, subordinates in the clinical area, subordinates and even superordinates in the clinical area and to provide them with continuing nursing education uh, so that they go on to improve their knowledge, skills and attitudes. Collaboration is another key responsibility of a nurse scientist, which means she has to play essential roles as anchors for interdisciplinary researches and interdisciplinary teams, be it pharmacists, psychologists, uh, social scientists, uh, uh, even uh, medical doctors. And uh, the uh, collaboration is uh, required for healthcare professionals, uh, uh, researchers, and policy decision makers to improve patient care. Uh, Another key responsibility of a nurse scientist, and this is a very important one, is obtaining funding or finances for researchers. That has always been an issue uh, in any field, wherever the research are, researches are to be conducted, uh, that um, researches require some funds and grants. So writing grant proposals, uh, research proposals, and applying for grants is another key responsibility of a nurse scientist so that uh, resources, finances, which are required to conduct and support research projects that are done and so that the research, once taken up, goes on uh, seamlessly without any interruptions. Joining important conversations is also another key responsibility of a nurse scientist. That means they have to talk, they have to join in the forums, forums like this conference also, uh, so that they can talk to their colleagues, they can talk to the other healthcare professionals, uh, and so that they can share their unique expertise with other healthcare professionals, with their own colleagues, and um, this way they can inform them about their research findings and how the research findings can be implemented in the practice and uh, how we can formulate healthcare policies, guidelines. So uh, important conversations are required uh, by the nurse scientists so that uh, whatever research is they are conducted, they are disseminated widely and they are not just kept in a library or shelf once done. So as I said earlier, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration is crucial for nurse scientists and this collaboration will be with other health care team members to develop effective evidence-based practices and also collaboration with very important stakeholders that is the patients, families and communities because without them we cannot, uh, the evidence-based nursing practice would not have any meaning. Teamwork is essential for nurse scientists because there has been a lot of emphasis on interdisciplinary research. Even the uh, National Policy of Education 2020 also gives a lot of emphasis on interdisciplinary research, which means that now we cannot be isolated in nursing discipline. We have to expand and extend the scope of research beyond nursing and reach out to other professionals for collaborations and for uh, working with them so that we can exchange research ideas with them, we can exchange expertise, we can collaborate with the experts in other fields and we are able to together find innovative solutions to healthcare problems. So collaboration and interdisciplinary research, the more I talk about it, the less it would be.
as said earlier that resource pooling is very very essential uh, when we talk about teamwork because we can uh, pool in the resources be it the finances and funds equipments and facilities uh, and we can share it we can we can share it with other healthcare professionals other care, healthcare professionals can also share it with us so that the uh, equipments funds and finances are not a hurdle in uh, conducting researches for nurse scientists very important thing which is required for nurse scientists is networking and this conference that we are holding today and tomorrow is also a very good platform for networking with co professionals with other healthcare professionals not only in one's own country but across the globe this is also a global nursing congress and a very uh, effective platform for networking and getting to know other professionals because in nursing profession we just can't stay isolated we just can't stay in ivory towers not networking not conversing with others and uh, it is required that we all build professional networks so that research opportunities can be shared expertise can be shared resources can be shared partners and partnerships can be forged and that way uh, one can advance one's own career and also uplift nursing profession in general improved patient care that is the main goal of uh, nurse scientists and nurse researchers because in eventually whatever researches we are doing it has to target at improving the patient care that should be the biggest goal of all nurse scientists and researchers uh, in, in clinical area especially and those who are in the uh, academic side besides improving the standards of nursing education they also have to work towards improving patient care because um, uh, that is what nursing is all about so for a long time there has been in a gap in uh, the best practice and what is actually happening in practice and uh, we require a change we require a change to bridge this gap in the best practice and what is actually happening in practice and how we can do it we can do it i suggest here that we can do it with action research which is a strategy that tries to find realistic solutions to organizations difficulties issues and problems and it aims at solving the problems addressing the concerns at workplaces and improved methods and approaches of those involved in the workplace area action research generates new knowledge through systematically studying the process and outcomes of change so nurses or nurse scientists nurse researchers can actually become change agents and it is research conducted for people and with people rather than on people so says reason in 1988 main features of action research are that it is participatory in nature that means grassroots practitioners and as well as nurse managers they are all empowered to change or to bring about the change in their work areas and they work together to bring about the change in their practices it is democratic in nature and uh, again the researchers and nurse practitioners they work together and uh, uh, together they um, direct the course of change and uh, implement the evidence based nursing practice then it also contributes to social change as knowledge that is more meaningful to practice rather than just knowledge which is not used but rather as knowledge which is which is used and which is brought about into practice action research is also cyclical in nature that means the findings of the researches are fed back to practitioners as they are generated that means they are put into good use and uh, not that once the researches are done then they are shelved in library and not to be used rather we would want that action research remains in circulation whatever researches are done the findings are used to improve the practice and patient care so in action research each study aims to involve and include grassroots level practitioners in exploring what changes required in their 
nursing care area how that change will be brought about and how the process and outcome of this change should be monitored and implemented so nurse scientists that way are in a unique position to be the change agent in the nursing profession patient care evidence based nursing practice and healthcare delivery in conclusion i would say that Florence Nightingale, who is considered to be the pioneer in evidence-based nursing care, and this has been there since the, uh, the 19th century. Uh, and although uh, this dates back, the use of evidence-based practice by uh, Florence Nightingale dates back to the 19th century, but today, even to this date, in 21st century also, the medical fraternity is still has the notion that nurses cannot be the key drivers of healthcare research. And this is where we have to make a dent that uh, nurses as researchers and nurses as nurse scientists, uh, they are very much a thing of the present and not uh, just the past and future. So um, and since 1950s and 60s, the nursing practice and nursing care or nurses' role as caregivers was the focus. Uh, but in 1970s, as more and more um, bachelors in nursing and masters in nursing programs opened in uh, various schools of nursing, uh, the research thing, the research focus came into the being. And uh, since that time, many nursing theories also form were formulated by various nurse researchers. And um, since then, the ball has been rolling and uh, we are uh, into the process of uh, inculcating the uh, research temper in the minds of the nurses, whether they are in the academic setting or whether they are in the clinical setting, so that eventually we can raise the standards of patient care, uh, we can practice patient-centered care, and we can also raise the standards of nursing education. These are the references, and thank you. And you can ask your question to ma'am. Questions. Thank you so much, ma'am, for imparting your knowledge of this uh, subject. Thank you so much for the interesting lecture, ma'am.
I was just a little bit of a technical issue for the next uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Saji Baby. He's unable to join the Zoom meeting. Uh, we're trying to help from our end as well. Uh, we hope that he'll be able to join very shortly. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Sujat Shamali, ma'am, if you are available to uh, deliver your keynote lecture, uh, that would be fine if it works for you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Dr. Sujash Uh, yes, hello, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, can we go ahead with your keynote, ma'am? Suja, so, ma'am, uh, I think you're on, ma'am. Ah, okay. Am I audible now? Uh, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, you're audible. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, for the next keynote uh, speaker, uh, I welcome Dr. Suja Shamili Ji, Principal, Dr. Marela Ramaya, College of Nursing, Nellore, Andhra Pradesh for her keynote lecture on the topic, Research Intensive Training Environments. Oh, ma'am, it says that you're on mute, ma'am. Can you uh, Good morning. Good morning, yeah. everyone. Good morning. Respected dignitaries, distinguished guests, speakers, and beloved students, and all the participants who all uh, who all are present here. So this is Sujash Shamli. And I'm here to present uh, research intensive training environment. And one second. So let me share my screen to give inputs. One second, I'm trying to share my file. Uh, sure, ma'am. Uh, I'm <laughs> 
Excuse me, I'm Uh, ma'am, I'm unable to hear you, ma'am, again. I think it's on mute. <coughs> Hello? Hi, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. So I think I have some problem in sharing. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I'm just sharing. Ah, yes. Is my screen visible now? Yes, ma'am, it's visible now. Yeah, thank you. So good morning once again. So I'm here to present about research intensive training environment and this is the outline of my presentation. I would be uh, explaining about introduction, definition, characteristics, components, uses, and steps to establish the uh, research intensive training environment and factors and roles of research intensive training environment in nursing and the best practices to research and ways to create a functionally efficient research environment. So when coming to introduction, so research intensive training environment. So it is a kind of a specialized educational and professional setting which is specifically designed to cultivate the skills and competencies which are required for an young researcher's to develop research and scholarly work. So in order to create such an environment, the primary focus is for providing students, researchers, and scholars with tools, guidance, and resources necessary for conducting advanced research. So this fosters intellectual growth, innovation, and the creation of new knowledge. So simply speaking, so a training environment, research intensive training environment is about creating an a very specialized and educational setting in which the students and researchers and scholars can uh, do research work without any uh, obstacles. So that is what called as a research intensive environment. And what, what actually it is, it is a, a learning and professional context which prioritizes research as a core component of education and career development. So it is characterized by a strong emphasis on scholarly inquiry, original research, and the dissemination of research findings. This environment encourages critical thinking, problem solving, and the development of expertise within a specific field of study. So this is what actually a research intensive training environment is. So this is about more of a learning and professional kind, which mainly focuses on the career development and uh, research uh, education and competencies, which is to be developed for the students and research scholars. And when coming to the characteristics of uh, RIT, that is Research Intensive Education Training Environment, so there are a few characteristics which uh, give more inputs or valid inputs to the development of the training education training environment. So these are a few points like emphasis on research, mentorship, access to resources, publication and presentation opportunities, collaboration, rigorous training, and academic rigor. So in coming to emphasis on research, so emphasis is nothing but the, the primary activity of the research is to be valued and encouraged and integrated into the curriculum or job description. So this is a central characteristic of the uh, for creating a research intensive training environment. So this is more about the commitment to research. So this, uh, this training environment must be focused or committed as a primary activity. So without a training environment. So no further development or further uh, further improvement we cannot do in the uh, research programs. And second, second characteristics, mentorship. So mentorship, obviously mentorship is uh, 
uh, used for uh, with the help of experienced researchers and faculty members often pro provide guidance and membership to help individuals develop their research skills. And next is access to research. So obviously, we know uh, there are uh, resources are uh, essential and vital part of conducting a research activity. So resources such as uh, laboratories, libraries, funding facilities, financial help or financial support, technological support or also can be made available for the research researchers and also the research scholars and publication and presentation opportunities. The research is well established or well emphasized once it is published and presented. So the opportunities must be made available for the researchers and the scholars to publish their research findings in peer reviewed journals as well as uh, any uh, just like an, a scientific paper presentations in any conferences and collaboration. So next characteristic is in collaboration. So collaboration and interdisciplinary work are encouraged promoting the exchange of ideas and methodologies. So just like in uh, participating different uh, educational uh, workshops or conferences or seminars. So having multidisciplinary collaboration with many organizations, we can improve or promote the uh, ideology or methodology of doing a research. The next characteristic is rigorous training. Individuals whom ever receive training in research methodologies or who involve uh, in conducting a research or developing a uh, theory or uh, developing a research work or intend to receive a, a rigorous training in research methodologies, data analysis and critical thinking and equipping them with tools necessary for effective research work. And the last academic, uh, the last um, characteristic of RIT is academic rigor. So in education tech settings, a strong academic foundation complements the research focus, ensuring that individuals have a solid theoretical basis. So uh, we all know that research for conducting and uh, research, effective research. So the researcher or scholars must need a strong academic foundation. So strong academic foundation will be ensured if the individuals have, give, uh, have a solid theoretical basis, which only comes with good, good academic settings or educational setting. So these are about the characteristics of um, uh, research intensive training environment. So let me summarize the characteristics, so emphasis on research, mentorship, access to resources, publication and presentation opportunities, collaboration, rigorous training, and academic rigor. So let us now see about the components of research intensive training environment. So components as are like uh, faculty expertise, research facilities, funding opportunities, publication and dissemination channels, and interdisciplinary collaboration. So these are considered as the components, components of conducting and components of conducting So the first component, faculty expertise. So faculty expertise, experienced faculty and researchers who can provide mentorship, mentorship and guidance. So as we discussed in characteristics, so mentorship uh, lead a main characteristic or main role, vital role in conducting a research work. So the research scholars or researchers should be guided by an experienced faculty and researchers who can guide them very well in their research work and research facilities. Research facilities are uh, like well-equipped labs, libraries, and data resources for conducting research work. So we are, we see we have seen this in characteristics also and funding opportunities. So definitely the researchers or uh, the scholars must be given financial support to access grants and funding to uh, and funding to support their research projects and publication and dissemination channels also must be provided. So in a way like connecting them to journals, making them publish in more peer reviewed journals or international journals and making their papers, uh, papers to be presented on the international conferences or conferential platforms and various platforms where they can share their findings and research outcomes. So uh, next is interdisciplinary collaboration. So next is interdisciplinary collaboration. So interdisciplinary collaboration is culture collaboration.
So a culture that encourages cross-disciplinary -discipl collaboration and diverse perspectives. So this could be the components of um, developing and research training environment. And coming to users, so what could be the uses of developing an environment? Is it really necessary to have a research intensive training environment is? Yes. So it helps in academic research and advancement and professional development, innovation and problem solving, evidence-based practice, public policy and advocacy, business and industry advancement, scientific and technological advancement, healthcare and patient care improvements, environmental and sustainability solutions, social and behavioral insights, global challenges and crisis, quality assurance and continuous improvement, leadership and mentorship, international collaborations, education and training for diverse disciplines. So these could be the users if you develop an a research intensive training environment for the research. Uh, ma'am, is everything okay, ma'am? So, yeah, ma'am, uh, we're not able to hear you. Only we can see the slide. Ma'am? Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, I think you're on uh, mute, ma'am. But not able to hear, ma'am. We can see you. 
was not able to hear. Am I audible, ma'am? Am I audible now? Ah, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Is it visible now? Yes, ma'am. So these are the uses of uh, developing and research intensive training environment. So social and behavioral insights, it helps to develop social and behavioral insights, uh, which are essential for understanding human behavior, social trends, and the impact of public policies contributing to better societies and communities. And also it, it helps in global challenges and solving the crisis. So they play a critical role in addressing global challenges and crises such as pandemics, natural disasters and socio-economic issues by producing research that informs effective responses and policies. And also it helps in quality assurance and continuous improvement. So by, uh, by maintaining high quality standards and fostering continuous improvement through data-driven research and analyst. And it also helps in developing leadership and mentorship so they provide opportunities for experienced professionals to mentor and to guide the next generation of researchers and leaders in their respective fields. And it also helps in international collaboration. These environments often foster collaboration between individuals, organizations, and countries, facilitating knowledge exchange on a global scale. And also it helps in education and training for diverse disciplines. They cater to a wide range of disciplines from the arts and humanities to be sciences and technology, making them versatile tools for knowledge development and skill acquisition. So these are about the uses of developing and research intensive training environment. So let me summarize the uses. So uses are academic research and advancement, professional development, innovation and advancement, problem solving, evidence-based practice, public policy and advocacy business and industry advancement, scientific and technological advancement, healthcare and patient care improvements, and it helps in environmental and sustainability solutions. And also it, it's just helpful for social and behavioral insights, and it helps in global challenges and crisis. And it also you're useful for quality assurance and continuous improvement. It helps in leadership and membership development, mentorship development, and international collaboration and education and training for diverse disciplines. So let us now uh, see about the steps to establish a research intensive training environment. So here are a few steps. So first of all, define objectives. Define objectives, secure resources, recruit expertise, monitor progress, promote a research culture, curriculum development, and disseminate the research and support collaboration. So these are the steps by which we establish an research intensive training environment. So define objectives. So that will be the first step what we, uh, we could able to do in developing an environment. So defining objective is nothing but clearly define the goal and objective of the environment, why the environment has been established and what is the goal, what we are going to do with the research intensive training environment. And second one is, second step is securing resources. So once we define or we identify the goal, so next we have to search for resources which are available for the researchers and we are make the research environment is uh, held with. 
So ensure the access to the necessary resources such as funding, facilities, and mentorship and guidance, expertise and guidances. And the third step is recruiting expertise. So expertise, so as we discussed earlier, so it is a uh, characteristic for developing a research intensive training environment that we must have an expertise or someone must be there to guide uh, the experienced faculty, must be there to guide the researchers and the research scholars and curriculum development. So that there should be an educational context, a design, a curriculum that integrates research into coursework. So curriculum development will be uh, should be done. And the fifth step is promote and research cults, culture, promote a research culture. So encourage a culture that values and prioritizes a research. So this is something about um, making research as a priority. So a primary focus of the organization should be like a um, research as a priority. And sixth one is monitor progress. So regular assess, regularly assess the effectiveness of the environment and make necessary adjustments. So regularly the environment must be progressed for, uh, for the availability of resources, for the availability of expertise about the curriculum and uh, the, the culture, the focus, how we are focusing on the research work. So regularly it should be monitored and necessary changes should be done if, any, if anything identified. And the seventh one is disseminate research. So encourage participants to publish and present their research findings and support collaboration. The last one is support in collaboration. So promote collaboration and interdisciplinary work, which is done by the researchers and scholars. So these are about the steps to establish and research intensive training uh, environment. So let us move to the factors which influence uh, influence the development of research intensive training environment. So first of all, funding and resources, infrastructure, faculty expertise. So under uh, funding and resources. So for funding and resources, we need to collaborate with some other organization like collaboration. We must look into the ethical consideration and inclusivity. And for infrastructure, so again, for infrastructure, we have to check for the publication and dissemination, innovation and entrepreneurship, and international collaborations, and faculty expertise, the support services we are rendering for them, the flexibility given to the faculties or the research scholars and PhD scholars, and government and institutional policies to be adopted or included, and student recruitment, so that how we are going to mentorship them, and the evaluation and accountability and community engagement. So at last, work-life balance, long-term planning, and feedback mechanism. So these are considered as the factors for building up a research-intensive training environment. So these are about general factors about uh, developing and research intensive training environment. So now we uh, see about research intensive training environment in nursing. So how does it work in nursing? So research environment training environment plays a significant role in advancing the nursing profession and improving the patient outcomes. So here advancing nursing knowledge, it more often helps the intensive training environment in nursing, it often helps in advancing nursing knowledge. Nurses in research intensive training environments have the opportunity to engage in rigorous research activities. This allows them to contribute to the development of nursing knowledge by investigating various healthcare topics such as patient care, interventions, health disparities, and evidence-based practice. And it also helps in enhancing clinical practice so as said by the previous speakers, so it definitely helps in clinical practice, enhancing the clinical practice. So through research, nurses can bridge the gap between the theory and practice. They can apply the latest evidence-based practices or findings to improve the uh, health care of the uh, patients. And they can make, uh, um, make health care standards more effective and safe for the patient. And also, it helps in improving patient outcomes. The research conducted in such environments often leads to innovations in healthcare delivery system, which can translate into improved patient outcomes 
shorter hospital stays and reduced complications. And it also helps in fostering critical thinking and problem solving. Engagement in research activities for nurses helps to improve their critical thinking so as they can, uh, it enhances the problem, problem solving uh, skills of the nurses. They learn to evaluate the evidence, they learn to identify the research gaps, and they design and implement studies, which are all valuable skills in clinical practice. And it also helps in educational growth. So nurses in research intensive environment often pursue advanced degree of certifications, which can lead to career advancements and opportunities for specialized nursing roles. And also it helps in promoting evidence-based practice. So nurses are engaged to base their clinical decisions on the best available research evidence. This approach leads to more effective and patient-centered care. And it is useful for mentorship and collaboration. So such environments typically offer mentorship from experienced nurse researchers and faculty. Collaboration with colleagues and interdisciplinary can lead to more comprehensive research projects. It helps in professional or career development. So engaging in research activities can enhance nurses' professional development, helping them stay current with the latest advancements in healthcare and nursing. It also uh, helps in disseminating their research findings through publications in journals and presentations at conferences. This contributes to the broader nursing community's understanding of best practices. And obviously it helps in quality improvement. So research intensive training environment often emphasize about quality improvement initiatives, which help the nurses identify areas where healthcare delivery can be enhanced and work to implement those improvements. So it also um, can be worked as a powerful tool in developing leadership in nursing. Participation in research can prepare nurses for leadership roles within healthcare organization, academic institutions, and professional nursing associations. It also can be helpful for developing a policy. So nurse researchers in research intensive environment may have the opportunity to influence healthcare policy by providing evidence to support changes in nursing practice, staffing, and patient care standards. So uh, these are about uh, the uses or uh, the, the, the um, uses of research intensive training environment in nursing. So now we'll see the best practices of research which will be helpful in nursing. So like uh, first one is generating a topic and developing keywords and narrowing the topic and doing a research, making an outline, and checking for plagiarism, and going for bibliography. So this is the normal, usually uh, usual steps we we do follow for doing a research, and these are and these are considered as the best practices for conducting a research. And these are few ways to create a functionally efficient research environment. So like gathering the relevant data, planning for safety and well-being of the uh, participants considering the contingencies, empathize with individual needs, invest in building management systems, and break the physical boundaries, plan for future expansions, and ensure optimal and acoustic and lighting. So these are a few uh, ways to create a uh, research environment, which should be very functional and very uh, efficient environment for conducting and research work. So here is few uh, implications that uh, which can be found in various uh, educations. So research organization and even within specific programs or departments. So these environments uh, emphasize emphasize research as a core com component of the educational experience. So research intensive training program for nurse is instrumental in fostering professional growth, improving clinical practice and positively impacting patient care outcomes. It equips nurses with knowledge and skills which is required to contribute to the evidence-based evolution of the nursing field and healthcare at large. So these are about uh, the implications, how we can imply our uh, research work or how we can imply the, encourage the research work in our educational organizations and institutions. And to conclude, so research intensive training environment stands as catalyst 
for progress in the rapidly changing world so they can empower individuals to become an agent of change equipped with the knowledge and skills necessary to address the complex challenges of our time whether it's in the real times of healthcare technology or the arts these environments play a pivotal role in fostering innovation and expertise so this is all about the research intensive training environment so this can definitely bring a change in the nursing profession so which we can make wonders in and maintaining uh, standards of high quality of healthcare to the patient as well as the society thank you thank you ma'am We'll give a few minutes for uh, the participants if anybody has any queries sure, sure. Uh, they can drop it in the chat box or you can just unmute yourselves and ask the questions hello ma'am yes yes sir well if you talk about research i am also from the research r and d background so what type of researchers in which direction you are thinking about is your institute undergoing any uh, research uh, so because which, our institution uh, which, which is, has uh, which is based on artificial intelligence which can be application for nursing professional with new technology or anything like that so our season uh, bsc program college so our college is providing only bsc program and we don't have any uh, advanced, i mean uh, advanced research centers to adapt uh, new research technologies and other things but it it will be better i suggest i would suggest to have a good uh, research labs or something like that as you said no artificial intelligence to adapt uh, nursing procedures new innovations in nursing procedures so i would definitely suggest our management also and this is my point of view so if these um, new if these research environment is adopted uh, there would be definitely we can see some changes in our nursing profession So okay. that is a point in that, of in that respect if i can collaborate with research rnd because i have been experienced with rnd for last 29 years yes sir so i may be useful for you yes sir. so you would like to collaborate with us sir you yeah, like to collaborate maybe, maybe if you are interested in the field yeah yes sir sure our, sure our... we are we are ready to collaborate with you so thank you thank you for the opportunity to discuss it hello sir so this is from uh, kanniyamal srm university chennai sir okay uh, and i am a dean uh, here for the last 8 year okay oh, uh, here our university is very much focused for the research in all the discipline multidisciplinary and with medical college we having a, a phd enrollment here in nursing and uh, we have full time scholars under me five uh, full time scholar and part time internal faculties and external part time uh, phd is also available and we at present about 10 uh, almost 7 at hand uh, another 2 3 are uh, to wait for viva and uh, 10 uh, faculty with phd scholar and they we are in need of uh, creating a forum for a separate forum for a research department as a unit separate unit within college and apart from this our university is having a research uh, university uh, level and medical and health sciences level also we have a unit so we think this also we can able to have a collaboration with you we are ready to take up collaborations and uh, we will uh, do extend our good quality researches also sir thank you thank you Yes. because i have i was in abroad and i was having abroad for 18 19 years so i was uh, yeah, i was in kuwait uh, i was a principal scientist in kuwait and uh, yes. yes sir yes. please sir okay, okay. Uh, we, we need yeah. to have your uh, contacts and other thing we will communicate yes. and we will keep in touch sir thank you oh, so okay, much sure, sure, sure. thank you thank you thank you sir yes sir thank you sir Thank you so much, uh, ma'am. Thank you, uh, sir, for uh, uh, the question as well. And it's wonderful to see how a beautiful collaborations can blossom in these kind of educational events. Uh, thank you uh, so thank much. Thank you, Sushmita. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just to clarify, 
I am Pollen. I moderate the session. So Shmita is here. Okay. She's taking care of the okay. organization okay. part and the technical okay. part. Okay. But it was wonderful to meet you, ma'am. And uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is relevant, ma'am, but there is a question regarding the cost of the PhD program in Asharam University. So if you would like to address that personally to this uh, candidate, that would be great. And on this note, uh, I would really request all the participants to turn on your cameras so that we can have a group picture taken. If it's okay, I request all the participants to have the cameras on. It's wonderful. Just uh, thank you so much. Wonderful. And keep smiling, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everybody keep smiling. We'll take the picture in just a second. Just give me a minute. Perfect. Okay. Okay. A lot more people are uh, turning on the camera, so we we'll just wait for a minute more for everybody. Okay. Perfect. Three, two, one. Okay. Next. One more. Three, two, one. Okay. One last. Three, two, one. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, okay, so on that beautiful note, we'll welcome the next keynote speaker, Dr. Saji Baby, Professor and Program Director, Department of Sustainability Studies, MIT Walt Peace University, Pune, India, for the keynote lecture on the topic. Unprecedented climate challenge urge an unprecedented response. What can nurses do? Hello, everyone. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, how are you today? I came a bit late, so I express my regret and apologies for joining late. So, how's the weather there at your each place? In Chennai, it is uh, a little bit uh, wow, it is uh, cool, sir. Now uh, rainy. My, my okay. Time of rainy. Yeah. Okay. Today. And what about the climate throughout the year? Throughout the year, maybe in April, May, uh, sometimes uh, it will be very hot uh, during May summer. But other than that, it is bearable. But uh, now it is uh, a bit of a change of weather. It has become very cool. Very cool in front. On nice to, he on nice to hear. Uh, <laughs> nice to hear from you. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's what I wanted to hear: the yes. difference between a climate and a weather. Yes. Sir. Hmm? yes so sir. what you are experiencing? Very, AP is yeah. very, very hot, sir. <laughs> yeah. So you are experiencing something crazy type of climate, isn't it? Yes. So that's what Even I'm going in to. Even this uh, October, we are experiencing second summer. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, sir. So that's what I wanted to The September 2023 records 1.82 degrees centigrade about pre industrial level, the highest since 1850. September 2023 also registered the lowest sea ice maximum in the modern satellite record since 1979. We know that the Earth is the only planet that has worked variability of weather and habitable climate across different regions at different times. Weather and climate are crucial and have a huge effect on our livelihood, our health and our future. Today's climate seems so alarming. So happy morning, happy afternoon, happy evening to all of you. A healthy, contagious greeting to all of you. Myself, Saji Baby Utio, Welcome to my talk by professional profession. I am a researcher, consultant, and academician in the field of environmental science and engineering, climate sustainability, and pollution. It's truly a wonderful time to have virtually so many distinguished audiences from different time zones and from distinguished institutes from all over the world. At this juncture, 
I deem it a great honor and pride to thank the conference chair, conference secretary, core committee, coordinator of the Global Nursing Congress, and all dignitaries. Thank you. I am delighted and privileged to be amongst you today to give a talk on an unprecedented climate change and urge an unprecedented response. That's what we need. So here, what can nurses do? I would appreciate everyone to listen actively for another 20 minutes with zeal towards a better earth and human well-being. Moreover, it is indispensable to advocate for a restored and healthier environment. So am I audible to everyone? I hope so. Yes, yes sir. Uh, unsustainable development has caused chaos to our surrounding ecosystem. It is bleeding and it's looming over us with every moment. Life-threatening weather events are crushing records around the globe. Climate change indicators and health impacts are worsening and they are dreadful. Many of these consequences are intensified by climate change. Let's have a deeper look into it. The average surface temperature of the planet has risen by around 0 0.8 degrees centigrade since 1880. You can imagine 0.8 degrees centigrade since the industrial revolution. The rate of warming per decade has been around 0.15 to 0 0.2 degrees Celsius. There is a worldwide shift in the temperature of the planet. It would not be, it should not be confused with the local changes we witness every day and night or the seasons. Climate has always changed and the changes have implications. Uh, sir, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, sir. I just wanted to confirm that uh, you're not sharing your screen. You don't, uh, because Slide? I just no, no, to confirm. No, 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 just, uh, no Okay, no okay, sir. So, yeah, thank you so much. So. The local changes we witness every day and night or seasons. Climate has always changed and changes have impacted the civilization and much more. Since the Industrial Revolution pumping huge amount of greenhouse gases into that. So you know about the greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, methane, and NO2, all these are some of the gases which does not allow the heat to go outside the space. So it traps and re-radiates back to the earth and raising the temperature high. This is the cause of all causes, the cause of conflict, instability, diseases, and disharmony. What we put out into the world will come back to us that we naturally know. As we saw injustice to nature, we reap calamities. As a result of our action, we generate greenhouse gases resulting in global warming and climate change. Climate change is the most pressing challenge humankind has ever faced. It's impossible to avoid the sun or curb its activities towards the functioning of Earth's climate. The crucial matter is our uncalled, unsustained activities that are subst substantially responsible in one way or other, less or more, in contributing towards changing the climate. When I use the word our, it means we humans, women and men, girls and boys, kids, nurses and doctors, students and teachers, engineers and technicians, researchers and scientists, bureaucrats, administrators, and managers, contractors, businessmen and industries, sec security and defense person, politicians, lawmakers and judicial, policy makers and strategists, young and old. We are all responsible and we are all affected. We are experiencing never expected devastation, devastating hurricanes, ferocious storm surges, dreadful floods, horrible famines, glacial outbursts, scorching droughts, furious wildfires, shimmering and rippling heat waves, blanketing sandstorms, suffocating air pollution, natural hazards, engulfing coastal storms and sea level rise. So you can understand the things, what is going on. And all this leads into depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress order, disorder, heat stress, heat stroke, long-term breathing issues, and cardiorespiratory problems, malnutrition, undernutrition, widespread vector food and waterborne diseases, 
increased allergens and toxic effect can aggravate disorder of heart, lung, kidney condition, physical burns, where death rates upsurge and much more. So I'm coming to the medical ground. So you may all be thinking, oh, I'm going something far away from the theme of the symposium. My friends, the impact of global warming are going to increase tremendously in the coming decades. The effect of climate change and pollution on human health will increase. So it's with a great enthusiasm and collective responsibility I'm addressing the Global Nursing Congress 2023. I wanted to state that your profession can considerably do a lot to mitigate and control climate change and to adapt to climate change with time and space. It's a time to fix this mess. We need to understand with our growing knowledge about the devastation brought by global warming. Nurses, you can do a lot. Let me express my special appreciation. Your actions shown during the COVID-19 pandemic have highlighted the impact of your healthcare service worldwide. Your contribution was exemplary and is a living testimony. You are the heroes. The stress and mental pressure resulting from the challenges posed during the COVID-19 crisis didn't deter you from your service to the community. You were endangering your lives to provide high quality care and reduce patient suffering. You displayed strength and perseverance while facing risk and vulnerability. You were the frontline caring brigades for the patients, day in and day out. You deserve to be truly be praised recognized and commended for your life-saving effort and personal sacrifice and increased medical risk and in spite of facing harassment and attacks on times. Nurses, you are an epitome of humanity. Thank you very much to you all. First of all, you choose this profession for your humanity and later comes the training you received for humanity. Climate change is a complex web of environment. Health and sustainability. The World Health Organization has described climate change as the defining, complex, and critical health challenge of our time and for the future. Royal College of Nursing, RCA, recognizes, recognizes the climate change undermines the very foundation of our health. When health is at risk, everything is at risk. When we are dealing with consequences of climate change, it would be more appropriate we begin with the causes and the reasons of climate change. So what we need is a sustainable way of development for present and future. Sustainable development is not sufficiently recognized by society. So nurses, so the question is, now the question is why nurses for sustainability and global climate change? So what nurses have to do with this? So every citizens have to do, but particularly why I'm addressing to the nurses. According to the World Health Organization 2020 report, 59% of all healthcare professionals are nurses. Global working forces of nurses is currently about 28 million. You can see the enormous number of people in the nursing profession. As per Indian Nursing Council records, there are about 33.41 lakh registered nursing personnel in India. As the largest group of health professionals worldwide and the most trusted group, the nursing professional has a capability and responsibility in assessment, planning, intervention, evaluation regarding impacts on health in a climate changing world. Nurses have a tremendous opportunity to protect nature humans and patients from the impacts of climate change and to create sustainable, climate smart, green hospital and health system. Nursing is a scientific and social profession. So you are well placed to speak out on these issues to the patients. Talk to your patients about the relationship between climate change and health. Tell them what they can do. Nurses work across acute care, primary care, public health and community settings, you can be leader in protecting the health of the public from the consequences of climate change. Even your small action when spread across network can have significant impact. 
the International Council of Nurses, ICN 2018, argues that nurses can make a powerful contribution to mitigate climate change and support people and communities to adapt its effect. Nurses have the incredible power to drive changes. It is bitter to hear, but the healthcare sector is responsible about 5 to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Imagine 5 to 10% if global greenhouse gases Hello, the video. sector. It jumped exponentially during the pandemic because of the heavy use of PPE. Biomedical waste has increased with frequent use of disposable products at healthcare facilities. High income nations generate 1.1 to 1.2 kilograms per person per year. Middle income generate 0.8 to 6 kilograms per person per year. And low income nations generate 0.5 to 3 kilograms per person per year. You can imagine this much amount of medical waste is generated. Tremendous waste are generated through PP. As the largest work working group in healthcare and the largest user group for equipments and consumables, nurses are powerful agents of changes. Hence, nurses are well positioned and, inf and can influence daily practices of healthcare systems and can lead to energy saving, reduce waste, optimize resources, and have a positive impact on climate change. Moreover, moreover by committing to lowering the carbon footprint of our hospitals. Environmentally concerned nurses are getting together worldwide. Imagine all the nurses are joining together to meet the health and climate challenges. For example, Nurses from Healthcare Without Harm is an organization and another nursing association such as American Nurses Association and International Council of Nurses highlights the importance of nursing in assisting with mitigation and adaptation strategies and developing climate-related national policies and action plans. So I told how nurses have a role. So now the question is how, now the question is how it should be done. So nurses need to be prepared for a new additional professional to act in a world facing climate change and contribute to sustainable healthcare. So I, urge to the nursing schools to include in the curriculum, change and modify the curriculum and include the sustainability and environmental aspects of climate change in, in the curriculum. Nurses can rekindle climate action if proper investment is made in the nursing profession by government, world leaders, healthcare management and educators. Nurses are important performers, stakeholders and shareholders in the work towards sustainability. However, nurses anticipate more instruction, training, and knowledge in this subject. They have to be given more training, knowledge about this. Nurses need to understand the connection between climate change and health and how the health sector can respond. Dear friends, practicing sustainable health care allows us to be on the research work. We experience more sense of purpose, direction, energy, and fulfillment. We exhibit deeper resilience to the shocks of life and feeling part of the huge and growing global movement for positive change can help us to cope up with worries and fears about the climate crisis because you are doing something about it. Dear friends, let me conclude by telling you, you will be there always to touch life of others or life will touch you. Nurses, you are going to be there with a lot of people when they are born, and you are going to be there when a lot of people, when they are going, when they die. I persuade to exercise your position and tra training to address the need of the time, the global climate change, and link it with the changing health situation. And the most vulnerable sectors are the elderly and the kids, and also the women. So we have to take care about the climate change and its impact. So you urgently need to lead the fight against the climate change and advocate for the solutions. So with this, stay blessed, stay inspired by nature, spread love, humanity, and peace. Much love. May God bless you all. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, sir, for a very interesting lecture. If any of the participants have any queries or any discussion that you would like to uh, have, please put it forward in the chat box so you can unmute yourself and uh, ask the questions. Uh, here again, I'm yes, on. Uh, yes, sir. It's a very uh, vibrant lecture with regard to environmental thing. Actually, uh, Ma'am, I didn't go for with the technical aspect because yes, sir. Yes, sir. people yes. are from different backgrounds. So yes, just sir. I yes, wanted sir. to. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. But uh, here also, yeah, uh, uh, that is environment friendly. Our university, they are uh, taking up a lot of uh, input in this. We have the multiple discipline of engineering and as well medical, health sciences and arts and science law. Everything is here. And we all focus the, to save the environment, how to um, uh, take up that sustainable development goal and everything. And such Bharat, a lot many things are incorporated and our nursing also is more vibrantly involved in all kind of such activities in connection with NSS and such Bharat activities, apart from the sustainable goal development also. And we, we are interested even in taking up research in this angle also uh, through community. actually what happens from the nursing the they use the all the disposable yes. objects yes, uh, so i cannot um, say against that because yes, it's sir. easy and it is user friendly but the yes. thing is that it ends into some places where it is not recycled or yes, not yes. managed very well for yes. example in calicut medical college i have seen the waste is being just like a mountain key yes, yes. And, yes. The, and especially from the clinical waste it is mostly of toxic hazardous and everything infectious yes, and it is stored like that in the open ground yes. and and uh, you can imagine it's again creating a disease so sometimes i uh, fail to understand. Maybe is this a business? Maybe more people get sick and come again back to the hospital. Yes, <laughs> it's a cyclic circular economy. <laughs> Wrong type of circular economy. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, elaborate. But in a nutshell, you have given all the kind of things how to keep our environment safe uh, for the future. So uh, it is a vital thank thing thank for you. everyone. Yeah. The, thank thank you. you so much, sir, for your... Thank you. Good elaborations and thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I'm, I'm honored. Touch. I'm honored. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. So, any questions from nurses directly <laughs> who are practicing? I am here, Sister Dr. Victoria. Yes, sister, um, I do the appreciation regarding your lecture, you and moreover, your appreciation regarding the nurses. Hmm. But as you were telling, today we experience a lot of environmental changes, which in turn causes many problems, health problems to the community. Correct. At the same time, here I am from Guntur, Andhra Pradesh, St. Joseph College of Nursing, where we yeah. have GNM, BSc, post BSc, MSc courses. We are also from GNM students onwards, we motivate them to conduct research programs. Then they are also are interested to uh, sister, may I interpret? interpret? Yes. Actually, all over the world, India and everywhere, they are going with a lot of researchers. You know, hundreds of papers are being published. I also tell them most. Paper published, they keep on publishing and doing research. But something useful for the society, they should come up with the innovations and start. And produce it. That is the main aim. So hundreds of papers are published, thousands of papers. So the thing is that some innovation and that should be applicable to the society and the protect the well-being of humans. So we am are. I right? Also, am I right? Yes, sir. we are also trying to publish our research articles, whichever we have done in the nursing magazines, etc. But at present, even in our Catholic Church is promoting. That is JPIC, that is Justice, Peace in connection with the creation, where everyone is motivated, everyone is asked to maintain eco-friendly atmosphere, which in turn helps us to create a healthy 
and harmonious environment where whether students or people whoever is working are able to experience a healthy atmosphere and also can enjoy the good health of the each individual and also the community where this eco-friendly atmosphere is created. So we also, in the community programs, we motivate the communities that is go green to cultivate um, family vegetable gardens and also to plant small trees or which in turn... Uh, uh, sister, sister, I got disconnected. I could not hear a lot of things from you. No, yeah. yeah. As for the Catholic Church, yeah. even Pope and all the bishops, priests, everyone is motivating to have a JPIC, that is Justice, Peace in the Integration with the Creation. So all the Catholic in institutions also are trying to maintain eco-friendly atmosphere in all our institutions. And we also motivate the students, the importance of eco-friendly nature, wherever our institutions are existing. And in turn, we also experience that yeah, harmonious environment where everyone feels that is a healthy environment and good health in turn. So as our students are going to different community settings for their community programs, we also try to motivate the community people to maintain eco-friendly atmosphere in the communities and also to plant various trees which in turn produce more of oxygen and remove the uh, carbon dioxide and where children also can experience or learn motivated to create the healthy environment or the eco-friendly environment so to some extent to reduce the um, unhealthy situations or proper disposing the waste and uh, to also to reduce the climate change. Since all the colleges, they want to develop a curriculum related to the sustainability application for the nursing practices for yes. higher education. So I am there to help you all to develop the curriculum that can be taught to the nursing students and at the undergraduate and postgraduate and even the doctorate and postdoctorate students. Yes, this is we being in the educational institutions, we, we should be a instrumental to motivate the students. In turn, students as they reach the communities, they also can be an instrumental to create an eco-friendly atmosphere wherever we are living. Thank you. Let's keep connected. Any other questions from anybody? Or, or time is out? No, sir. If there are any questions, any discussion, we are happy to have them. Schools, nursing schools, education institutes. But now, because I'm asking, because I wanted to impart my services for the sake of humanity, not for as a business purpose, okay? <laughs> but for the sake of humanity. If any educational institution to develop a curriculum, course, program related to sustainability, climate change, environmental aspect, waste management, toxicity. Hmm? Actually, our Indian Nursing Council itself it, uh, has given and we have already uh, incorporated. Uh, yeah, I saw, I saw, but I sir. saw that, but uh, I, uh, I am I'm not very much satisfied yeah, with that. Yes, sir, but it is there. Hmm. To some extent, hmm. they were uh, uh, they, they made a they, they made a model and is distributing to everyone, yes, engineers yes, and medical college and everything. But uh, it should be tailored to that institute. It means nursing yes, institute. Sir. It should be doc medical doctors, 
engineering okay. aspect. Eh? So it should be trained. Tailored. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, to some extent, but we have incorporated in our syllabus also to take Custom up uh, yeah, that customized, thing that, uh, customized for all the students also to, uh, during their learning period itself through community perspective. They are uh, enhancing with the, this kind of knowledge and other things, sir. Because yes, they can absolutely. come up with, they can yes. come up with a mask, they can yes. come up with yes, a gloves, yes, with a disposable gloves yeah. or yes, reusable gloves. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Even state government, they are also emphasizing uh, to segregate all kind of waste and other things. Yeah, yeah, right. And everything, different, uh, uh, even in hospitals, uh, different kinds of uh, colored bins are available. Oh, colored bins. Are everything we are following, sir. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's aggregated hospital as well. And a uh, oh, lot great. of many things it is uh, happening here. Yes. Thank you, great. sir. Great. Biodegradation and the biomedical waste. Yes, yes, sir. Mm. Ah, biomedical ah. waste and hazardous waste, radiation, the radiation also with the radioactive waste. Uh, everything, sir. That too, uh, with uh, multi, uh, more than 1600 uh, bedded medical college hospital, did they have oh, their oh. own uh, NABH accreditation? Uh, now they are moving for international accreditation as well. Oh, great. So we are uh, fo uh, focusing and nursing is also involved in that. So we are uh, disseminating all kind of uh, knowledge and exhibits and uh, along with the medical professionals. And we are also uh, doing adhering in the extended activity of community health, NSS activity, such Bharat, a lot many things with regard to this kind we are uh, disseminating, sir. Thank you, sir. Oh, that's great, ma'am. And uh, let's keep connected and you will be getting my email ID and contact and definitely, I also will try sir. to get definitely, yours definitely. from Sushmita. I think Sushmita is worried about time. Uh, yeah, that's what she is calling me to join in, to join in other call. But I am so uh, much interested in uh, you are uh, taking up your interest and then you are uh, just uh, emphasizing. Yeah, yeah, I am very much. It's a good interaction. Right? It's yeah, a fruitful yeah. interaction. Man. Yeah, that's yeah. what, So sir. I appreciate you also. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Sorry. Yeah, because we are giving lecture, it should be productive no? in the, yeah, on the yeah. ground. Definitely. Huh? Otherwise, just more. give lecture and leave and uh, that's yes, not so enough. That's what, we are happy for that, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We will keep in touch, sir. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Okay, Sushmita. Thanks, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your very uh, interesting lecture and a very uh, fruitful discussion. Thank you, uh, Kanyamal ma'am, as well. Uh, and also, we see a lot of participants panicking, so I think we have to address. Uh, uh, we're going to the next technical session. Thank you, sir, for taking the time out to okay. uh, share so your with, knowledge of with, with, your, with your permission, may I leave? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you Thank so you. much, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, participants. Uh, okay, so we'll be starting the technical session, the paper presentation session in just a while. Uh, so uh, please uh, pay uh, attention to the following announcements. Uh, so there will be three halls where the presentation happening. Uh, okay. uh, please mute yourself. Uh, if you are not presenting, kindly mute yourself. That is That will probably be the first uh, uh, kind request. Uh, second of all, there are uh, three halls where the paper presentations will happen. All the uh, three halls will be there in the same particular link. So if you find, uh, if your presentation is in Hall B or Hall C, you can check your allocation in the agenda that was shared with you. If it says Hall B or Hall C, please click on the breakout rooms option and you can join the Hall B or Hall C respectively. If your presentation is in the main hall, you can just remain here. This is where the uh, main hall presentations will take place. So please uh, wait here if your presentation is in the main hall. If it is in Hall B or Hall C, either you will be allocated or you can just click on the breakout rooms option and you can select the respective hall. If you're joining on your phone, the breakout room option will be there on the top left uh, in four boxes. Uh, if you're joining in a computer uh, where you have your option to mute, uh, stop video, in that same particular row, you will have the option for breakout rooms. And uh, we'll, the presentations will be going on according to the agenda. And uh, the time limit, you may be aware, but I would like to just emphasize again. Back. Uh, that for oral presentations, the time limit is 8 minutes for a presentation and 2 minutes for discussion following that. And poster presentations, there would be 4 minutes for your presentation followed by 1 minute of discussion. 
and uh, we have a lot of presentations lined up for today so we kindly request all the participants to definitely adhere to the time limit uh, because you would have to stop at the at the at the time mark of 8 so if you have any difficulty with sharing your screen or finding the breakout room please let me know so we'll be able to help you accordingly okay sir we'll send you the link Okay, dear ma'am, can I ask one question? Dear yes, ma please, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Tell me. Hi. Uh, in the screen, uh, I, I have some difficulty in operating because it's my first time. So, uh, how do we uh, get the hall? Well, can we present here in the main hall? Uh, just give me. Uh, okay. Uh, your presentation is in the main hall. You are Linda Lal Tanpuri, right? Yeah, yes, madam. Yeah. It is in the same platform, right? Yes. So you can just okay, stay here and you. you can share your screen when your presentation is on. Sure, sure, present. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. And this is main hall, right? Yes, correct. This is main hall. Okay, okay. Uh, there is no separate link for any of the breakout rooms. So it is only uh, options Hall B and Hall C. If you click on the breakout rooms option, you can find your particular hall. You can click on it and you can go. It is the same link. It's going to be the same link for tomorrow as well and for all the technical sessions. So uh, and also we have allotted all the participants. So if you can just accept the request, you will directly go into the particular room. Can you please uh, check that and let me know if it works now because I'm checking uh, every participant is allotted. Like if you're in hall B, your, the request is sent. So you just have to accept uh, and then you can go. So there are a lot of people who are not assigned, uh, who have not joined. So just make sure uh, you have accepted the request. And if you're a listener delegate, you are uh, free to join any of the halls and listen to any of the presentations that you prefer. And uh, again, as a general notice to all the participants, make sure you're on mute when you're not presenting. If you leave and come back also, your mute, your, your mute would be on, so make sure to turn it off.
Um, so, Jam, ma'am, can we start the session? Uh, can we start the technical session? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. I can hear. You. Uh, no, I mean, uh, we just wait for the session chair's response. As soon as uh, she's available, we can start the session. Okay. Good afternoon. Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. This is Sita here. Ah, yes, ma'am. Uh, we can see you and hear you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, can we start with the technical sessions now? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Oh, okay, great. Uh, so uh, I welcome you all to the scientific session here in the main hall. I would like to first welcome our session chair, Dr. Suja Shamil Ji, Principal Dr. Malayla Ramaya College of Nursing, Nellore, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for accepting, accepting to be the session chair. Uh, on that note, I would also like to invite all the participants. And uh, I invite the first participant, Dr. Smitha PM, for her poster presentation. Uh, ma'am, my slide is visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 ma'am, is visible. Just a minute. Is it in slideshow or? Uh... It's not. Please it's put it slideshow. on slideshow. Please put it yeah. on slideshow. Now it's in slideshow. Yeah. Slide yeah, all right, all right. Now it's all right? Yeah, all right. Okay. So let me start with my presentation then. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Smita Madhavan. I'm working as a professor, Department of Mental Health Nursing, Narana College of Nursing, Andhra Pradesh, India. Title of my presentation is Effectiveness of Cognitive Behavior Therapy on Surgical Menopause Women a randomized control trial. As we all know that uh, surgical menopause means it's an invasive emergency procedure and uh, both the uterus as well as the female gonads are removed. That is called oophorectomy. Surgical menopause means uh, it's because of this reason. What is the main characteristics happening is estrogen and progesterone level will come down suddenly. Because of that reason, many problems, the surgical menopause women are suffering like a physical problems, psychological, emotional and social problems. Here I have chosen you know, anxiety that is uh, unfortunately anxiety is the major problem which uh, anxiety as well as depression also is there. Anxiety is the major problem the women are facing. And uh, when we come to the significance of the study, you can uh, we can see in India nowadays it is increasing like as per one recent study uh, it is showing that in US, it is 6 out of 1,000 population. Japan, it is 1 out of 1,000 population. India, it is 17 out of 1,000 population. You can see the um, number of uh, uh, cases increase in India. And uh, there are so many interventions are available for surgical menopause symptoms. But the problem here is most of the interventions are uh, like partially operative. And uh, so many side effects are there for many of the interventions. So one of the best option uh, or intervention which we can use it for surgical menopause women is cognitive behavior therapy. When the woman is practicing uh, CBT, that is cognitive behavior therapy, uh, a person can uh, be more rational and also they can learn to control their thoughts and change self-belief, help to harm and uh, relax. So this is the reason the CBT is uh, chosen for uh, this particular uh, uh, cases. And the objectives of the study is to identify the level of anxiety among surgical menopause women, to assess the efficacy of cognitive behavior therapy on level of anxiety among women, and to find the association between the level of anxiety among surgical menopause women with their selected sociodemographic variable. And the design chosen for this study was randomized control trail, RCT. Two experimental design was used, 230 surgical menopause women, and out of 26 villages, four villages. Both is chosen by using simple random sampling method, and a computer-generated random um, a number method was used in simple random method, again. And women at age group of 25 to 55 years, free from severe mental disorder, and reside in semi-urban area was included in the study. Severe medical condition, surgical menopause, um, uh, because 
because of cancer and women under hormone therapy uh, treatment was excluded from the study and the study period was only nine months period of time and the permission has taken from the authority as well as the consent from participants is taken big anxiety scale was used for this before starting with the main study a pilot study was conducted and uh, it was showing high reliability that is 0.85 and the pre-test was conducted for one month for experimental and control group. And uh, that was uh, experimental and control group was divided as 115, 115. And again, this experimental group is uh, divided as six participant groups. And uh, we have given two months of um, uh, intervention for uh, CBT intervention, like psychoeducation, formulation, cognition, emotion, behavior, connection, behavior modification, cognitive restructuring, and last prevention. These are all the intervention which is comes under the CBT, which is given for two months. And direct and telephonic um, uh, monitoring was there for the participants. And post test was done for the experimental group simultaneously once they completed the two months of uh, intervention. And post test for control group uh, con conducted after completing all the session for two weeks. The final data was tabulated and analyzed. A descriptive and inferential statistics was used for this. When we see the uh, findings of the study, we can see here in pre-test in experimental group, it was 39.21, the mean score is showing, and the anxiety level is decreased when it is coming to the post-test, that is 22.56. And in control group, you can see here pre-test 38.33% 38, 38 and 37.61 in post-test. There was no much difference you can see here in um, control group. And the anxiety, when it is coming to the association, we can see some very rare socio-demographic variables like age, parity, and comorbid illness. Only these three variables were showing association in experimental group. And control group, none of the variables was significant. And uh, this uh, uh, CBT is nowadays in an evidence-based treatment. It comes under the evidence-based treatment. And there is a huge reduction of uh, anxiety level we can see in this uh, study. And for going through surgical menopause, CBT is a very good promising treatment option and uh, research uh, it is uh, finally it can be concluded like cbt is a safe effective and cost effective uh, intervention for reducing the anxiety level the woman who is undergone with surgical menopause thank you so much that's all with my study and thank you very much for giving this opportunity uh, to present my scientific post presentation in global nursing contest 2023 and uh, express my gratitude to um, to the organizers of PSFNP, Society for Nursing Practices also. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Sujan, ma'am, if you have any questions for the presenter, uh, yeah. please go ahead. Yes. Smita, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Your study was really good. But uh, one thing I was to ask is, we have, we, have, we have specified it as surgical menopause. So yes, we have done a study on women with surgical menopause. So okay, could you please yes, explain the specific selection criteria? So is there any specific post-operative days? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The women who undergone surgical menopause uh, after five days, once they discharge from the hospital because it is conducted in the villages, four villages were okay. selected out of 26 villages through simple random sampling method, ma'am, after five days. Once they have oh, gone back, this, yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. That was my question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Very well presented. Thank you, ma'am. I invite the next presenter, Ms. Linda Latanpui, for her e poster. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I will try to share. Share him. Okay. Okay, uh, my whiteboard, uh, my poster is yeah, getting ready. I will try my best. I'm given four minutes and I will try to finish within the set period. Uh, uh, can my screen be can yes, we can see a poster. Yeah, we can see okay, a poster. Thank you. I'll continue. I haven't seen, so anyway, thank you. So I'll continue. Uh, the authors are my madam, uh, Dr. Anita Bide and myself. I am a PhD scholar in Haryana, uh, SGT University. And uh, the study that I'm uh, presenting, my study is regarding uh, lung cancer. A study to assess the knowledge of male patients of 
male Benicin ward at Civil Hospital Lunglei, Mizoram, regarding lung cancer with a view to prepare an educational booklet. And why I choose this uh, lung cancer is that uh, every year we have uh, seen many cases and uh, this lung cancer in India ranks uh, the second uh, most uh, common uh, among the male uh, cancer cases. So at present, we have around in India, 14,61,427 uh, cases per year. So it is uh, having a very high rate. And I, uh, I've been working as a, a tutor in nursing school, uh, GNM nursing school. So uh, every year I've been teaching uh, this uh, research, uh, re uh, research uh, subject. So uh, whenever I whenever I do any study, I included my uh, students. So uh, I selected a bit uh, easy easy study for them. So that is my about uh, introduction also. So regarding the methods that I use, approach is the uh, descriptive mm -hmm. survey approach, and design is non-experimental design. The settings was done in uh, civil hospital Lunglei, that is the second headquarter in Mizoram and uh, it is a 300 bedded uh, hospital and uh, uh, the participants we take 100 male patients uh, who who are attending uh, who are the patients of male medicine ward and also who come to the uh, outpatient department in the um, in the medicine ward uh, in the medicine department and uh, Linda, excuse me. Yes, yes, ma'am. No? Your process yes. is not uh, visible. It's not clear, no? Okay. I will make it bigger. Can you see, yeah. madam? Okay, okay. Okay, sorry. So is it visible now, madam? It's visible, but it's not uh, I mean zoom in, no? please zoom in. It's very yeah, small. I, I zoom in. Yes, please guide me because I have been zooming. Sorry. Now it is better. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm using a whiteboard. I hope it is. Uh, it will become uh, visible. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, let me continue. And uh, I, uh, we have been using a structured knowledge questionnaire, personal data, and uh, social demographic questionnaire was used. And for the analysis, We've been using descriptive statistics, percentages, averages, ra uh, range. And uh, regarding the results, and uh, when we assess the level of knowledge of male patients was that 20% of the clients or patients have adequate knowledge regarding the knowledge questionnaire. And uh, another score is 60% of them, of the respondents, have moderate knowledge regarding uh, lung cancer, knowledge of lung cancer. And 20% of the respondents have immediate knowledge, uh, sorry, inadequate knowledge uh, scores regarding the uh, lung cancer. And the second objective uh, I also want to include is where is in the section where in the area-wise knowledge square, uh, no knowledge score is the highest. So the highest score was uh, found in the area of management and prevention knowledge of lung cancer. It is the highest score we get in uh, the percentage of 76, 76.25%. Then for the conclusion, I, I will conclude that the respondents, 60% of them uh, have moderate knowledge regarding lung cancer. So I think I've been using up my time. And if there is any question, uh, please continue, dear madam, if there is any question. Your study is over. Yes, madam. Because... Yes, yeah. madam, because I, I am being given, yeah, for four minutes, so I'm using up my time, oh. madam. Can you please explain the result of your study? You didn't say the result of your study? Yes, yes. Uh, madam, uh, the result of my study, I've been... I have been given uh, because I have summed up uh, regarding, uh, I have two objectives. My first objective was to assess the level of, uh, the, the existing level of knowledge of male patients, okay? Then the second objective was to assess the area-wise area level of knowledge scores. 
the area was taken like uh, for the knowledge questionnaire. No, no, I the just area... asked what was your finding? What was the finding of your study? I didn't ask about the objectives. Can you please okay. explain the finding? Average finding I will point? give, madam. Average finding, yes, yes, sure. Average finding is that uh, overall their knowledge score uh, percentage wise is 66.66 percentage with mean eight and uh, score is eight. Uh, range level score is eight. That is the average uh, score that we have regarding the uh, whole, uh, regarding uh, not area wise, but the whole of the knowledge uh, score regarding lung cancer of the male patients, madam. Okay, okay, Ms. I can also say the, regarding the area wise, but uh, yeah, yeah, according to your question, madam, that is the average score. Okay, Ms. Linda, thank you and all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Madam, can I? You only did study regarding the pre test, post test. You didn't uh, give any interventions or the, no, no, madam. Uh, the post test. Yes, ma'am. Uh, as I, as I, I have said, I am including my students, madam, uh, to expose them. Uh, so for them, uh, uh, it is easy used... to understand. So non-experimental study, madam, non-experimental. Only used to pretest. Uh, I have not. Yes, yes. It is like a pretest, madam, because uh, I, my study is a non-experimental study only with pretest, existing level of knowledge score I'm assessing. You didn't compare with the demographic variables? No, no, not here, madam, not here. In in my other studies I've done, but in this study I have not compared. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. But if it will be more effective, if you might have used pre-test and post-test with uh, some interventions. Yes, sure, madam. Very uh, soon I will be doing. Very soon, madam. Thank you. Thank you. I, very soon I will be doing. Thank you, ma'am. I invite the next presenter, Ms. Priya Singh, for the oral presentation. Ma yes, ma'am. I'm present here. Okay. Ma'am, is my presentation visible? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Priya Singh from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, Dehradun, India. So, my topic for this presentation is formulation and evaluations of the nemocelloid loaded nanosponges for cologne drug delivery. Especially, cologne delivery offers a distance advantage for the treatment of a cologne disease. Since the colon is the farthest part of the gastrointestinal tract, it is very difficult to target a doses forms to the specific site. Nanosponges are the porous nanocarrier with a particle size less than 1000 nanometer and have a capability especially to entrap both hydrophilic and hydrophobic drugs. The poses are ability to circulate throughout the body and upon reaching the target site, they actually adhere to the organ surface and gradually release the drug in a controlled and a predictable manner over an extended period of a time. Unlike other selective COX-2 inhibitor, nemocylide stands out due to its unique protective against protective ev uh, effect against the nurses induced the ulcer. Moreover, while other selective COX-2 inhibitor increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, nemocylide does not pose significant cardiotoxicity. Nanosponses are highly cross-linked porous polymeric nanomaterial oh, yeah. with the excellent bioadhesive bio property, enabling them to adhere to the organ surface and effectively then gradually release the entrapped drug throughout the specific site. These are the materials used in the preparation of the nanosponses and these are the equipments used in a formulation and evaluations of the nanosponses. These are the methods these are the methods used. These are the methods used in the preparation and evaluation. Oh, 
lenses are here to identify the pigments of the we use the uv visible spectrum and to uh, okay. to and also to find the slide is not moving ma'am it's just in the same slide can you just check that that's in still in the title slide only ma'am let me Is it okay, ma'am? We can see your slide, but can you try moving to the next press, uh, next slide and uh, the next slide? I'll see if it's moving. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe you can click the uh, slide. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Now we can see the tabular column and the formulation slide. Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, then I'm continuing from here. So for the identification, uh, for the uh, evaluations, for the formulation and the evaluation of a nano sponges, these are the methodology we use for the determination of the purity of the drug. We uses the UV visible spectroscopy uh, techniques and also determine the melting point of the pure drug. For the analytical method, we plotted a calibration plot of the nemosulide loaded uh, calibration plot of the pure drug in the different solvent. Reformulation study was also performed by checking their physical characteristic and FTIR study. For the formulations, we selected the immersion solvent diffusion method, and evaluation parameters was like percentage yield, particle size determination, zeta potential, compatibility study, and percentage entrapment efficiency, sulfur morphology, and in vitro drug release. First, for the identification of the purity of the drug. the drug was scanned the drug was scanned in the various solvent and the maximum absorbance of the drug was determined the lambda max of the drug in the each solvent was compared with the standard and it was found to be identical which by which we come to the conclusion that drug was in the pure formed this these are the observed value in the uv spectroscopy and second to uh, determine the purity of the drug we also check the melting point of that pure drug the drug was found to be approximately similar to the referred value from this also we come to the uh, conclusion that the drug was in the pure form like the pre formulation study was carried out the physical characteristic of the drug was determined and it was found to be slightly yellow in color and was odorless ftir study in the ftir study the characteristic pick in the ftir study of the pure nemosulide drug was compared with the standard value and found to be similar the calibration plot was prepared in the different in the different solvent and these are the straight line equations and correlation coefficient obtained during the plotation of the calibration these are the plot in the different solvent media now the preparation of the nemosulide loaded nano sponges the nemosulide loaded nano sponges was prepared by the immersion solvent diffusion method in this method two phases was prepared first organic phase and second aqueous phase in organic phase drug and a polymer was dissolved in the dry chloromethane which is the sol which is the organic solvent and second phase was prepared by dissolving the polyvinyl alcohol into the 100 ml of a distilled water the aqueous phase was placed on the magnetic stirrer at the 1500 rpm during the addition of the organic phase and then stirred for the 8 hour after complete removal of the organic phase the dispersion was centrifuged at 12000 rpm at 25 degrees celsius for 15 minutes the pellets of the nano sponges loaded uh, loaded nano sponges were washed several times with the distilled water to avoid the absorption of the polyvinylin alcohol on the surface of the nano sponges the nano sponges were then dry at the 40 degrees celsius and placed in the desiccator for the further evaluations these are the quantity of and of the drug and excipients used in the preparation of the nano sponges in this table we can see all the other excipients including api is at the constant uh, at the constant quantity but the polymer for the quantity of the polymer was deferred this was the formulations obtained this pictures are from the while this picture was from while preparing the nano sponges first images shows the immersion before the centrifugations 
and the second image shows after the centrifugation in this we can also observe the pellets here and the third image here shows after the drying and the fourth image shows the powder form of the nanosponges here for the evaluations of the nanosponges we perform the particle size uh, percentage yield entrapment efficiency and particle size determination in this three parameters we observe that the highest the lowest formulation f1 uh, it was observed that the low uh, it, it was observed that the lowest for the formulation f1 and the highest formulation f4 was observed by this we came to the conclusion that by increasing the concentration of the polymer the percentage yield percentage entrapment efficiency and the particle size also increases next we also determined the zeta potential of the formulations the zeta potential of the optimized formulation f4 was found to be minus 16 plus minus 1.2 millivolt thus value indicate the formulation f4 was stable these are the reported values now dsc study was also performed the dsc thermo the dsc thermogram of the optimized formulation f4 do not slow so here and uh, do not display any melting peak here this absence the absence could be possibly to contribute on the conversion of the crystalline nemoslide into the amorphous state and its molecular dispersion will within the polymer matrix the observation is strongly suggests that the complete encapsulation of a drug into the polymer next the surface morphology the scanning electron microscopy of the optimized formulation was performed and the nemoslide loaded nanosponge shows the spherical morphology with the pores on the surface here we in this picture we can see we, uh, we can see the spherical shape of the nanosponges with some pores on the surfaces next we also did a in vitro drug release study the in vitro drug release study of the optimized formulation was examined in the different in the three different ph as we have to see the release of the drug into the colon that is the 1.2 0.1 normal hcl for 2 hours and in ph 6.8 phosphate buffer for 2 hours and further into the ph 7.4 phosphate buffer for 8 hours the rate of the nemoslide drug release also depend on the polymer. So, F4 carries showed the sustained release pattern here. Sustained release pattern here that is the 75, 73, that is the 73.4 percent of the nemoslide was released within the 12 hour. Whereas, in the case of the pure nemoslide drug, 77 percent of a drug was released within the four or six hours only. This shows the sustained, sustained release pattern. In this table, this table shows the data of the drug release study of the optimized nemosolide here, F4, and the pure drug. In this table, we can see the 77.6% of the drug was released within the 6 hour only, whereas the formulation shows the release pattern up to 73, 73 up to 12 hour. We come to the the conclusion is that the nemosolide loaded nanosponges was prepared and evaluated successfully. Nemosolide loaded nanosponges was prepared using the immersion solvent diffusion method, using the Utrazid L100 as a polymer to release the drug to the cologne. The particle size within the range between the 289 to 289 to the spherical safe particle having a porous on the surface the dsa thermogram of the optimized formulation f4 do not display any melting pick of the nemoslide this observation strongly suggests the complete encapsulation of a drug into the polymer in in the in vitro drug release optimized formulation f4 exhibit a sustained release pattern that was then sustained up to the 12 hours this exhibits the suggestion of the potential for achieving the drug delivery to the cologne. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, if there are any questions from the session chair, uh, Dr. Anusha uh, from Dr. Malala College. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning, ma'am. 
that was a good session, ma'am. I congratulate you. And it was very fine explanation. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. We can move to another uh, presentations, I think so, ma'am. Yes, okay, ma'am, sure. Uh, thank, for the, you. thank you, Ms. Priya Singh. For the next uh, presentation, I invite Ms. Uh, Yamini Sati for her oral presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Ms. Yamini, are you there? Ah, yes, ma'am. Please share your screen. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yamini Siti, and I'm from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University. And my topic is preparation and evaluation of those alumni at CL, Nordic Kaiserson Algae, this land is here for Gutoma. Here are the contents, introduction, aim and objective, rationale, polymer profile, drug profile, material, equipment, material, results, and discussion and conclusion. Here are the uh, introduction. Uh, glaucoma is a chronic eye condition which causes damage to the optic nerve. Uh, and optic nerve is uh, used for transmitting visual signals from eye to the brain. And glaucoma is caused due to the intraocular eye. 80 million people worldwide affected by the glaucoma and the number may increase to over 111 millions by 2040. And uh, my formulation is nanogel. Uh, nanogel is a nanostructured material. It is a 3D network uh, and uh, cross link polymer chain particles and uh, the size range between 1 to 1000 nanometer. And um, nanogels are the versatile and tunable in nature. They have high surface area and high porosity and ability to encapsulate uh, drug in it. And uh, it is very useful in the drug delivery and tissue engineering sensors and environmental remediation. And the object, uh, objectives of the uh, research is to prepare nanoparticles of dorsalamide HCL, incorporation of prepared nanoparticles in gel, and uh, study ex vivo transcorneal permeability and the impact of nanoformulation on solubility from prepared formulation. And nanogels are de designed to release the drug over an extended period of time that uh, can help to maintain a constant therapeutic concentration of the drug in the eye. This sustained release can reduce the need of drug administration of eye drops and improvement for drug uh, patient compliance. Dorsolamide hydrochloride has been used to lower the topical intraocular pressure. And it is especially important in patients for whom the in uh, home, uh, the beta blockers are contraindicated or inadequate. Uh, due to its uh, small particle size, they can easily permeate through the cornea. And uh, usually the size of uh, nanoparticles uh, that are delivered in ocular is one to 100 nanometers. And the typical particle size range uh, 10 to 200 nanometer, although some um, smaller and larger particle based on the delivery properties and therapeutic goals. Now, these are some literature reviews and uh, <laughs> these are the chemicals used in the research. And this is the drug profile, dosolamide hydrochloride. And uh, this is the polymer profile, chitosan is used as a polymer and the sodium alginate. And the method used in the preparation is uh, ionic gelation method in which uh, sodium alginate and uh, chitosan is used as a polymer. This is the method. And the result and discussion, this is the pre-formulation study which uh, in which uh, preparation of standard plot in pH 7.4 buffer is uh, used. And these are the absorbents. And this is the UV scan of the prepared uh, hydrochloride uh, dorsolamide HCL in pH 7.4 buffer. And this is the FTR analysis of drug to check the purity and uh, to check the, its uh, originality. This is the melting point of the drug, uh, which is found to be 263. And uh, this is the UV visible absorbance of drug in uh, STF, simulated tear fluid. The, because uh, this is delivered in the eye. 
and this is the FTS spectra of chitosan polymer. And this is the FTS spectra of sodium alginate. These are the main peaks that are observed and the uh, standard, uh, they are uh, compared with the standard wave number. And this is, these are the formulation F1, F2, F3 and F5 formulation in which uh, different quantity of the polymers and uh, polymers and cross linker is added. This is the magnetic stirrer used for the preparation of the nanogel and uh, they are the drug loaded particles formulation. And this is the characterization, particle size measurement, entrapment efficiency, FTIR, zeta potential in vitro drug release, pH measurement, and viscosity measurement. Uh, these are the result of particle size, PDI, zeta potential. And these, these are the vital parts of the formulation of nanogel, which is delivered in the ocular uh, delivery. And the average particle size are found to be found to be 365 uh, for F1. And in this, uh, F3 is found to be uh, good because its particle size is 97.30 uh, and its PDI is 0 0.258 and average average zeta potential was found to be minus 22.27. And the entrapment efficiency of F2, F3 and F5 formulation was found to be 69.7, percent and F4, F5, 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 51.5. Here is the F3 is found to be good in entrapment. So here is the FTR spectra of physical mixture in which uh, polymers and drug is added. And this is the formulation, uh, drug loaded formulation, nanoparticles. FTR spectra. And uh, this is the in vitro drug release of dorzolamide and formulation uh, F3, uh, which is released in seven hours, 93%. And this is the ex vivo permeation study, study, which is done in the goat eye by using France diffusion cell. And this is the percentage drug release in ex vivo, which is 82.09% in eight hours. And this is the size and PDI of the nanoparticles, which is found to be 82.07. And this is the zeta potential, which is found to be minus 2, 3.9. Uh, negative charge on the uh, nanoparticle was due to the presence of sodium alginate uh, because it is an ionic in nature and uh, have mucoidacid properties for nanoparticles. This is the pH measurement of the uh, uh, nanoparticles. Uh, in different concentration of carbopol, which is used as a gel matrix uh, for the nano preparation, which is found to be 6.6 uh, 6 to 7 uh, in the range of 6, uh, 6 to 7. And this is the viscosity in different concentration of uh, gel carbopol uh, at different uh, RPM. And the, here is the conclusion, which is successful, uh, which is concluded that the dorsolamide hydrochloride uh, nanogels were uh, successfully prepared using chitosan and sodium alginate nanoparticles. And uh, ex vivo's transcorneal permeation study revealed that the formulation F3 showed slower and sustained permeation of drug, which is 82% as compared to fast and rapid release of dorsolamide hydrochloride drug. Thus, the formulation showed a good precorneal retention property, which lead to improvement in the bioavailability of dorsolamide hydrochloride, which is good for glucoma treatment. Thank you so much. Please make sure that you are on mute if you are not presenting so that it will not cause any uh, disturbance for the other participants. Uh, session chair, if we have any questions for the presenter, please go ahead. Yes, Ms. Yamini. Yes, ma'am. As your study is about preparation and evaluation of dosalamide hydrochloride loaded with hydrosana. Yeah, ma'am. So already dosalamide hydrochloride, um, it, is a, it is crude. Yeah, ma'am. 
So, uh, may I know what the, what innovative uh, procedure you have done here? To, uh, uh, I am using natural polymers that is chitosan and uh, sodium alginate with uh, less side effects and uh, they have mucoadhesive property which, is, which may lead to uh, sustained release profile for a drug and uh, the uh, drug remain for uh, longer time and it is, it is useful for patient compliance and for patients. Uh, who have side effects of uh, other drugs. Okay, so how do you uh, how do you suggest using this drug? No, because you have done on uh, both, both side, right? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, are you sure that it doesn't make any complications on uh, human beings which is used on them? Yeah, ma'am, the result uh, showed the good uh, deliver uh, of drug in the goat eye. I think it may be good for the patients for glaucoma. Okay, so could you please explain about your uh, data collection or uh, the methodology? What is your adopted for the videos? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, sorry, ma'am. I can't hear you. The ethical considerations, no? So, to whom? Uh... We have legally procedure with this because it is a true experimental study. Ma'am, your voice is not clear. Uh, I can't hear you. So because it is a true experimental study. Am I, am I audible now? Yeah, ma'am. You're audible, ma'am. We are able to hear you. Yeah, I mean, see, am, I, am, I, am I audible? Uh, yeah, ma'am. You are audible. Yes, ma'am. You, you have done a true experimental study, right? Yeah, so I just like to want to know about the legal uh, legal procedures here under uh, I I am using what I uh, which is I got it from Butchered House uh, and uh, with the help of uh, college student I am I have done this study. See, I'm going to ask me about the. Ethical, ethical committee opinions and ethical uh, committee considerations. I just want to know because it's a two uh, experimental no, study. So that's it. No, ma'am. I'm, uh, I'm not using any animals for the study, but uh, I'm using goat eye uh, for this. I am not, uh, uh, I have not uh, any um, permission for the using goat eye. I have not taken any permission from goat eye. So it, it doesn't sound ethically good, right? If you're not getting prior permission from uh, any of the higher authorities. So it's okay, fine. Your trial is encouraged and appreciated. But yeah. uh, if it would be done in ethical and uh, in proper channel, it would be better. I will do this. After some time. I will do ma'am, annual study after some time. Okay, you are planning to do a study at the office. Yeah, ma'am. No? Yeah, ma'am. Okay, all the best. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Yamini. For the next presentation, I invite uh, Renu and Deepak. Ms. Renu and Mr. Deepak, are you there? Ms. Renu and Deepak from Faculty of Nursing, SGT University, Gurugram, India. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Renu from SGT University, uh, Ops and Gynae Department of, uh, from nurse, uh, Nursing. Um, and can we able to see my screen? Uh, no, I'm not able to see your screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see your PPT now. Please start your presentation. You can see your PPT. You can put it on slideshow and please start.
Masirin mo ayun. Masirin mo, your time is running. So, it's better if you start your presentation quickly. Uh, ma'am, we cannot hear you, Renu, ma'am. I think you are muted. We can see your slide. So if you can just uh, unmute yourself. Yes, please accept uh, the unmute request. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, please share your screen and present. Um, well, my study is a quasi-experimental study to assess the effect of childbirth preparedness program on intrapartum coping behavior among primary gavida mothers in SDT Hospital of Gurugram. Uh, and the objective of the study is first one to assess the effect of childbirth preparedness program on intrapartum coping behavior among primary gavida mothers. Second one is to find out the association between the effect of childbirth preparedness program on intrapartum coping behavior with selected demographic variables. Uh, introduction of the study, uh, pregnancy and childbirth are the usually, uh, unlike any other experience in the world for the woman, there is a usually a generalized fear for giving birth, especially in Nali Paris. Uh, uh, during the third trimester, preg uh, pregnant women endure a variety of physical and psychological difficulties that may make it difficult for them to deal with and adequate prepare for delivery. In the construct, uh, con, uh, construct of pregnancy, coping effort may uh, affect birth outcome by uh, serving to minimize, uh, minimize or prevent negative emotional behavior, cognitive and psychological responses to uh, stressors. Coping is a uh, constantly changing set of cogn uh, cognitive and uh, behavior strategy meant to deal with the demand of particular situation that are assessed as stressful. Lowering labor, uh, labor pain tolerance and worse past postpartum adjustment are both associated with the childbirth anxiety. And the need for the study is to, uh, usually primary guide mothers are anxious or stressed due to the labor or delivery process in, uh, in the view of lack of knowledge regarding how to deal with the stress related to the labor. Childbirth preparedness improves the interpartum coping strategy in primary guide mothers. A plan, a birth plan or emergency preparedness plan includes side notification to the following, like uh, knowledge of the key danger signs, desired places of birth, preferred birth attendant, location of the closest appropriate healthcare facilities, fund for birth related and emergency exp expenses, a birth companion, transport to a health uh, facility for the birth, transport in, in the case of obstetric emergencies and the identification of uh, Compatible blood donor in case of emergency. Increased birth preparedness awareness can definitely help reduce infant and maternal mortality uh, or uh, morbidity rates. So there is a need to generate more evidence to support the use of birth preparedness program. And the hypothesis of uh, of the study is uh, first one uh, alternate hypothesis. There, uh, there will be significant difference between interpartum coping behavior of primary guide mothers of ex uh, experimental and control group at 0.05 level of significance. Second one, uh, there will be significant association between the intrapartum coping behavior and selected variables at 0.05 level of significance. And the assumptions of the study, uh, childbirth preparedness may improve the intrapartum coping strategy in primary gavda mothers. And the limitation of the study, uh, study is limited to primary gavda mothers uh, who are booked at the SDT hospital only, pre-booked cases. And the uh, review of literature, first one, uh, uh, this study is in uh, uh, 2021. Title of the study, to assess knowledge regarding birth preparedness among primary gavda mother in a selected hospital of a metropolitan city. And the met uh, methodology they applied for uh, exploratory research design, sample size is 50. Primary gavda mother are selected by using known uh, 
probability sampling technique data collection is done by the structured uh, interview technique and the result shows that out of all the subject 56% has good knowledge and whereas 38 and 6% of the subject have average and poor knowledge respectively conclusion out of all the subject majority had good knowledge second one uh, this is a study conducted in the, uh, 2020 title is study to assess the effect of childbirth education on interpartum coping behavior of primary care mother woman in a selected maternity center of a uh, tertiary level hospital in a pune methodology uh, pros prospective quasi experimental study design and the uh, sample size is 60 divided into two groups 30 included in the intervention group and 30 in the control group data collection is done by using self developed interpart uh, interpartum behavioral observational checklist and the result shows that significant uh, reduction level of significance 0.001 in episiotomy rates use of analgesics and improvement in the coping behavior found among the experimental group conclusion shows that the positive eff uh, effects of the childbirth education on interpartum coping behave behavior of pr primary paris women were found and the present study study research methodology research approach uh, quantitative research approach research design is a quasi experimental no equivalent post test only control group design population is the primary care mothers and sample pre book term cases in sdt hospital of gurugram uh, and the sampling technique is non probability purposive sampling technique and sample size is 60 30 in experimental group and 30 in control group target population is the primary care mothers 38 weeks of the gestation and the accessible population primary care mother booked at sdt hospital of gurugram a uh, research setting is the sdt hospital of gurugram and the demographic variable age group education religious occupation income type of family and the area of residence information related to interpartum coping behavior any this uh, training counseling or any source of the information obstetric history etc and the variables of the study is the independent variable childbirth preparedness program dependent variable uh, ma'am sorry to interrupt you you have one more minute to wrap up your presentation ma'am Uh, dependent interpartum coping behavior among primary care mothers and the inclusion criteria uh, include the primary care mothers with without any antenatal complication pre book cases who are willing to participate and that uh, who are available at the time of the data collection uh, exclusive criteria multi gravid mothers mother with c section tools for the data collection is in the section a demographic variables and the section b Uh, standardized labor coping scale was used to assess interpartum coping behavior among primary care mothers in uh, according to the co labor coping scale school, uh, score was considered as 0 to 3 not coping 4 to 5 coping 6 to 10 not cop uh, coping well and the validity and reliability the validity the validity was established of demographic variable and the protocol for labor and reliability was needed uh, not needed because in this study standard labor coping scale is used and permission is taking taken from concerned authority the child birth uh, associations and the method of data collection assigning uh, subject in the two group experimental and control group uh, intervention is given in the experimental and intervention is not given in the control group and assessment of the interpartum coping behavior in both and the comparison of the findings ethical consideration ethical permission uh, was taken from the uh, institution ethical committee formal permission was obtained from hospital and concerned authority to co conduct the study participant enrolled using purposive sampling technique informed consent was taken from the participants and uh, data analysis and interpretation section uh, a demographic variable distribution among primary care mothers who was uh, who was contributed in the study and the section b standard labor coping scale was used to assess the interpartum coping behavior among primary care mothers in the sdt hospital and the result shows that uh, uh, distribution of the study participant according to the socio demographic variables in the age group uh, maximum number is a uh, 19 uh, 19 in the frequency and uh, uh, in the experimental group is a 16 53.33% uh, and education education level 16 maximum and the 17 in the experimental group Uh, same as the in uh, husband education level 16 in control group 21 in the experimental group 
release uh, in the release release in maximum in the 27 in the control group and 26 in the experimental group occupation 22 ma'am your 10 minutes uh, slot itself is over ma'am uh, um, there will not be any time for discussion you have to uh, wrap it up really ma'am ma'am i just need 2 minutes more actually ma'am the 10 actually the presentation is only for 8 minutes for the 10 minutes slot itself is over ma'am so please uh, keeping others also in mind please i request you to wrap it up as soon as you can Okay, ma'am. Uh, please, uh, if you can go to the conclusion and wrap up the presentation, that will be really good, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Um, the efficiency of the childbirth preparedness program on interpartum coping behavior among primary gravid mothers in SDT hospital. program was uh, investigated in the study according to this the finding of the study child birth preparedness program was effective in improving interpartum coping behavior among primary gravid mothers it will help to prevent complication and maximize anxiety in primary gravid mothers through imparting education regarding child birth preparedness program among primary gravid mothers these are the references thank you Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Doctor Sucha, Doctor Anusha, sir, are there any questions, ma'am? Oh, ma'am, she just presented. Will maximize the anxiety. It will minimize the anxiety. Yes, ma'am. She has Hello. written correctly. It will minimize the anxiety, but she has presented as a maximize anxiety. Okay, Miss uh, Miss Renu. Yes, ma'am. How do you define intrapartum coping behavior? Ma'am, uh, how we deal with uh, during the labor? Yes. Excuse me, Miss Renu. Please come again. Yes, ma'am. How do you define intrapartum coping behavior? You said you are going to assess the child preparedness on intrapartum coping behavior, right? Yes, ma'am. So, what would be the behavior, intrapartum coping behavior? You think what it would be? Okay, thank you, Reno. All the best. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Presiden. Uh, I next invite Miss Komal and Mr. Deepak. A kind request again to all the participants to please adhere to the time limit given to you. Oral presentation is eight minutes for presentation. And two minutes for discussion. So, um, you, uh, when you know that time is running out, please try to uh, wrap it up. Miss Komal and Deepak, if you are there, we can go for your presentation. Okay, I think they are not there. We can go to the next. Miss Vaishali, are you available for your presentation now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, please uh, share your screen. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself Vishali, and I am from SBS University, Dehradun, India. And uh, today is my topic on formulation and evaluation of inclusion complex of promethazine hydrochloride with cyclodextrin. So the cyclodextrin is an oligosaccharide polymer unit, which uh, is. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you have your presentation, or it's just a, a speech kind? Because we are not able to see your screen. Ma'am, I am uh, share my screen already. Uh, uh, session chairs, are you able to see the screen uh, that Dr. Um, Swaishali has shared? I am not able to see. Maybe it's an error on my end. No, ma'am, we are not able to see. I'm not able to see that. Okay, okay. Okay, now uh, I think you have shared it. Okay. Okay. Please, please go ahead. 
so the uh, cyclodextrin is a uh, oligosaccharide polymer unit uh, they are of three types of cyclodextrin alpha beta and gamma this is the mechanism of alpha uh, cyclodextrin uh, this is the host body uh, of the cyclodextrin and the guest which is the drug and uh, uh, the drug is encapsulated inside the cavity of uh, cyclodextrin and uh, form the inclusion complex the application of the inclusion complex to increase the solubility of poor soluble drugs enhancement of drug viability maintenance uh, the drug stability and useful in taste masking next is the mechanism of taste masking first is the uh, cyclodextrin enwraps the bad, uh, bad tasting uh, molecule and the formation of inclusion complex second is the uh, cyclodextrin interact with the ga uh, gatekeeper proteins of the taste buds and paralyzing them uh, there is the method of uh, preparing the inclusion complex different types of methods kneading method co precipitation method solvent evaporation method spray drying method and co grinding method here is the uh, kneading method for the formulation of uh, inclusion complex first is the paste formulation of uh, paste formation of 1 ratio 1 molar inclusion complex in the motor uh, and pestle then dry the complex paste in oven at 40 to 48 degrees celsius and then the dry pellets of the inclusion complex uh, grind in motor pestle for uh, forming the fine powder there is the characterization technique for uh, inclusion complex and the assessment of uh, taste masking as a structural evaluation first is the molecular docking for the prediction of the confirmation of uh, inclusion complex and these three are the chemical tests first is the fourier uh, transform infrared spectroscopy second is the thermal analysis differential sc scanning calorimetry and third is the xrd studies these are the assessment for the taste masking first is the structural evaluation and the in vitro and in vivo evaluation in the structural evaluation there is a two types of uh, test first is the chemical test ftir and the physical test which consists dsc and pxrd in vivo and in vitro evaluation the drug release test in in vitro and in vivo uh, the uh, electronic tongue test and the clinical trials or first is the characterization of drug promethazine hydrochloride and the gamma cyclodextrin and the structural taste masking assessment by the uh, molecular docking the software uh, the auto dock 4.2 software is used for the production of uh, for, uh, formation of inclusion complex the 3d structure of drug and the cyclodextrin downloaded in pub, uh, from pubchem and protein data bank and uh, both are visualized in by the discovery studio visualizer where the uh, water molecules and the head atom re uh, removed here we can see the uh, interaction between the drug and the cyclodextrin and the drug is in, uh, entrapped inside the cavity of cyclodextrin which is leads to uh, formation of inclusion complex and also masks the taste of bitter taste of drug here we can see the binary inclusion complex of uh, promethazine hydrochloride and uh, gamma cyclodextrin first is the central alignment of uh, drug into the uh, sphere of uh, gamma cyclodextrin and the second is the top view this is the chemical test which confirm the uh, entrapment of or the formation of uh, inclusion complex of promethazine inside the cavity of gamma cyclodextrin first is the ftir results here the first graph of drug and the second graph uh, of gamma cyclodextrin here we can easily uh, seen that the uh, one ratio one promethazine hydrochloride and uh, gamma cyclodextrin inclusion complex form because the peaks of uh, drug were uh, diminished 
the second test is dsc here we can see the melting point of drug at 237 degrees celsius and the in the second graph we can see wow. the gamma cyclodextrin melting point in the third uh, in which the uh, inclusion complex is formed here we can see no uh, peak arise in the uh, of a drug that it leads to formation of inclusion complex the last a powder X-ray diffraction. Uh, the first graph of uh, the crystalline nature of drug and the crystalline nature of uh, gamma cyclodextrin. The last graph, uh, third graph of uh, here we can see the disappearance of drug uh, crystalline peak in XRD confirms the result that the formation of inclusion complex and also the bitter taste of medicine was masked. Conclusion and future direction. The uh, promethazine hydrochloride is highly uh, bitter in taste, which was masked by the inclusion complex formation, which also predict by the uh, molecular docking. And uh, confirmation of inclusion complex by the FTIR, DSC, and XRD results. So we can uh, say that the experimental work can be used in future to improve the taste of uh, the bitter drugs and uh, oral dispersal and fast dissolving and rapid dissolving tablets can be prepared and marketed. And the developed uh, methods are very simple and reproducible. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Over to the session chairs for any questions. Specially, yes, ma'am. It was a good trial you have made. So, yes, well done, and all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, presenter. And move on to the next session. Okay, ma'am. I invite the next presenter, Ms. Vincy Thomas from People's University, Madhya Pradesh, India. Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Hi, the screen uh, visible? Uh, it was visible, now it is uh, only blank. Something back we saw the first slide. And, uh, is the screen visible now? Uh, no, it's not visible, only the blank screen is visible. I'm not able to see the slide. Yes, ma'am, you can see your slide. And is it visible now? Yes, yes, ma'am, it's visible. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, all. I am Bincy Thomas from People. University Bhopal. Uh, today I am here to shed light on the pressing and increasing prevalent issues that is reshaping the healthcare landscape of India. The diabetes expanding burden of diabetes in India demands our immediate attention and concern effort. So 
uh, diabetes, a chronic metabolic disorder, has been on rise in India, and it is no longer a mere health concern. It has evolved into a complex socio-economic issue. Not only is the prevalence of diabetes increasing, but it is also bringing with it a host of related health problems, including kidney and eye issues. These complications not only affect the quality of life for those with diabetes, but also contribute to higher Ms. morbidity Binsi? and mortality. Miss Binsi, Binsi is shadow. Ma'am, it's not visible. Your screen is not visible. No, no slides. Uh, no. One minute. Put it on slide share, please. I put it on slide. I think at that time the screen is not visible. Okay. Uh, because uh, earlier also, ma'am said that uh, it's not visible. When I am putting on the screen show, it is not visible. Uh, like this, when I am uh, opening, it is visible. Please carry on. Go ahead. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. These complications not only affect the quality of life for those with diabetes, but also contribute to higher morbidity and mortality rates, casting a shadow over nation's economy. As per the statistics, by 2030, thousand million people with diabetes in India uh, the WHO project, the diabetes the seventh leading cause of death by 2013 in India. The government has launched various policies and initiatives aimed at controlling and preventing the diabetes, a significant proportion of our population, especially those in rural areas, remains largely unaware of the disease and its implications. While India currently faces officials with six Healthcare bus probably per 10,000 people has reported. The self-management of diabetes is the process of developing of knowledge or awareness by leading or to survive with the complex nature of diabetes in social contact. The nursing students' professionals do play an important role in providing health education to the public. Um, Bensi, ma'am, are you there? Miss Bensi, are you there? Bensi, George. Okay, I think there was a uh, technical error from her side. Uh, she's not available in the meeting anymore. If Mrs. Uh, if Mrs. S. Vanilla and uh, Dr. G. Kalei Silvi from School of Allied Health Sciences, Vinay Commission University, is available, we can go ahead with the presentation. I think it's not difficult. Sorry, ma'am. Oh, okay, Bensi, you're back. Okay, yeah. Please, please continue. The public statement of my study is a pilot study to assess the effectiveness of role of diabetes self-management educational program in improving self-care behavior knowledge among adults with type 2 diabetes Excuse from me, a sector with a company. Excuse me. Uh, it's Ms. Bensi only, ma'am. She's back, so she's continuing, ma'am. Okay, okay. Ms. Bensi Thomas. The objectives of my study is to assess the greatest level of knowledge and behavior regarding the role of diabetes self-management education among adults with type 2 diabetes of experimental and control group to assess the greatest level of knowledge and behavior regarding the role of diabetes self-management education among adults with type 2 diabetes of experimental group to assess the greatest level of knowledge and behavior uh, regarding the role of diabetes self-management education among Type 2 diabetes of control group to evaluate the effectiveness of role of diabetes self management educational among adults with type 2 diabetes and experiment group to find out the association between post test level of knowledge and behavior of adults.
assumptions uh, uh, population will have some knowledge regarding the management of diabetes and reducing the blood sugar level diabetes self management education program will foster the knowledge of type 2 diabetes patients for effective care diabetes self management education program will combat the complications the real limitation patients were diagnosed with diabetes and taking treatment for the same uh, diagnosis the patients who are present at the home during the period of data collection who are willing to participate in the study who are able to understand and respond to the questions knowledge and behavior of patients will be assessed with the help of diabetes self management Uh, okay, ma'am. I think again we lost uh, Miss Princey. Vanilla, ma'am, if you are available, please go ahead with the presentation. Yeah, yes, ma'am, please go ahead. My oh, this is one you are there. Yes. Uh, okay. These are my pictures. Picture. Uh, okay, okay, ma'am. By the way, you just have like about three or four minutes, so I would uh, suggest that if you can go to the main part of your. Yes. The methodology of my study is evaluative research. The research design is to be experimental design with control group. The research setting is rural community area. The population is adult with type two diabetes. Sampling techniques, simple rounding uh, techniques, and sample size for my pilot study was fifty. And uh, for main study, with the help of uh, the sam uh, power analysis, it was that in experimental group, hundred and ten uh, students uh, patients per group will be there. The variables, independent variable and dependent variable. independent diabetes self management educational program and dependent variable were knowledge and behavior criteria inclusive and exclusive criteria inclusive criteria patients who have type 2 diabetes mellitus between age 20 and about 65 and those who are residing in huzur and uh, the those who are ready uh, and giving the consent for participation exclusive criteria patients who professional qualified in healthcare services juvenile gestational diabetes type 2 diabetes mellitus patients uh, who refuse to uh, who refuse to give their consent patients who are not uh, in, uh, who are in admitted in the hospital with serious complications the tool used was uh, structured demographic questionnaire and two standardized tools were used that is diabetes self management questionnaire and diabetes knowledge questionnaire the scoring criteria the diabetes self management questionnaire were divided into four sub skills glucose management dietary control physical activity healthcare and it has been uh, given the rating scale uh, from very much uh, to apply to me then scoring criteria knowledge scoring criteria uh, the 24 items were there and uh, uh, poor average good and excellent scores were given the data collection one month period during the one month period the data was collected Uh, from twenty uh, five experimental and control group from different areas, the purpose of the study was to collect data and administer training program for the posters. Informed consent was taken from the each participants on the first day. Pre test was given, and then uh, at the same uh, time, manage uh, it self ed management education program was given to the patient. The post test was conducted after uh, two weeks, uh, and uh, it was collected. Uh, the data was collected using computer assisted personal interview methods. Uh, total twenty uh, five to thirty minutes uh, was taken for individual training sections. Data analysis was done with the help of SPS. The tool validity was done, and it was found that the both the tools were reliable for the study. The data analysis was. I'm just one more minute you have, so try to please. Data that. analysis was done with the help of descriptive and inferential statistics. The uh, the uh, based on the objectives, it was divided into four sections: frequency and percentage distribution of demographic variables. Uh, section two: Analysis and existing knowledge of knowledge and behavior of experimental and control group. Section three: Comparing the post-test knowledge and behavior score of experimental and control group. And in fourth session: Association of pre-test knowledge and demographic data. 
So these are the uh, calculations, statistics we have got for demographic variables and frequency percentage of experimental and control group. And in pre-experimental, it was found that the knowledge level of uh, patients were less. And by the post-test, it was found that the knowledge level was increased with the help of role of self-management educational program. And with the help of uh, the teachings, the behavior was also increased in the post-test. Uh, so better self-care uh, was able to give, uh, patient were able to take on the basis of which the bl blood glucose level was maintained to be um, maintained. So nursing applications, these are the nursing applications. We can do uh, these studies and conclude. Thank you. The post is well. Uh, Miss are you there? Okay. Okay, uh, Vanilla, ma'am, are you are you there? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, can you please start your presentation? Yes, ma'am. Ma Just a minute, ma'am. I'll share yes, the screen. I think Miss Bensi, ma'am, again got disconnected, and uh, time is also up, so we can keep going. Yes, ma'am. My screen is visible, ma'am. Uh, not yet, ma'am. Tired, ma'am. Miss Vinci, ma'am's presentation is over. Uh, no, ma'am. Actually, midway she got disconnected, ma'am. Again, uh, she's okay. not available. Now. Okay. Uh, she's trying to reconnect, it seems, ma'am. So, uh, okay. but still, so the we are starting with. Now, next, uh, Mrs. S. Vanilla and G. Kalesar, Dr. G. Kalesar. Okay, okay. Okay. Ma'am, my screen is visible, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am, it's visible, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Mrs. S. Venila, Assistant Professor, Department of Optometry, School of Allied Health Sciences, Vinaya Mission Research Foundation, deemed it to be university. And my topic is refractive error among Puducherry Road Transport Corporation drivers. And aim of my studies to determine the frequency of refractive error and color blindness among heavy vehicle transport drivers from Pondicherry Road Transport Corporation drivers. One minute. Materials and methods. This cross-sectional study was conducted between July 2022 to September 2022, November month.
the number of registered heavy drivers to the P uh, Pondicherry Road Transport Corporation Professional Drivers Association is 850 to 900. A total of 120 male drivers were randomly selected from the heavy vehicle bus drivers. And the procedures, we visited the drivers after getting on the appointment of Pondicherry Road Transport Corporation branch manager and brief conversation with the study of participants about the aim and scope of the study. A complete ophthalmologic and optometric examination was performed and individual visual acuity retinoscope to perform the objective method of uh, refractive error, ophthalmoscope and the examination of the posterior segment to, to the second step. A standard snell and chart was used the assessment of visual acuity, which was viewed at a distance of six meter and externally externally illuminated and we have used the materials trial box it is the uh, trial box is nothing but it contains the trial lenses uh, it is helpful to the measure the refractive error distance vision chart to check the visual acuity uh, we use the standard Snell lens vision chart, near vision chart to check uh, to check the near vision correction at the distance of 33 centimeter, and color vision we have used uh, uh, Ishihara's color vision chart at the testing at this distance of 75 centimeter. Retinoscopy we have uh, done. It is helpful to objective measure uh, measure measure of refractive errors. It's our eligible criteria, inclusion, exclusion uh, criteria. At the, we selected age group uh, 27 to 60 years. Uh, male, limited age, about, uh, sorry, below 60 years. Systemic illness also we noted. Diabetic mellitus like hypertension. Exclusion criteria, concentration of on driving fitness for people with the temporary cognitive impairment or other medical issues, concern about impact on patient's quality of life. Uh, these are all my results. Distribution of refractive errors in uh, Pondicherry Road Transport Corporation drivers. In the study group, the drivers were diagnosed with refractive error for distance in one eye, 17 drivers, 14 year, uh, 14 percentage. And in the other eyes, 12 drivers, 10 percent hypermetropia was reported to 27, 22 percentage drivers in both eye astigmatism. In one eye was uh, 39 drivers, 32 percentage. In the other eye, were 40 drivers, 33 percentage. Is uh, this table to number of drivers? Age group, this uh, bar diagram was shows to the uh, number of age group of drivers. This table distribution refractive errors, this figure also shows to the distribution of refractive errors. In this study group, the drivers were diagnosed each eye separately. So, uh, uh, some patients having uni unilateral myopia and some patients having other hypermetropia. All above 40 years uh, drivers having uh, presbyopic errors also. And we'll give the separate eye uh, corrections for uh, refractive errors. Next, go for discussion. Yeah. Visual performance of heavy vehicle drivers is a key of safe driving. Many studies have reported the association between visual acuities and accidents. This age group makes up the majority of the workforce because of the difficulty and stress of the task. Older people tend to stop uh, driving after a few years. The prevalence of disease that affect visual acuity in professional drivers. According to the reports, refractive errors were the primary causes of in younger drivers and correction with the glasses was possible in the majority of cases. Recent research on the strength of the relationship between useful field of view performance and driving ability in older adults has relevance that it in effective predicator in incidents, crashes and can be used to the screen at risk older ages. 
many health professional thereby feel uncertain of the legal and ethical steps to take when confront the with patient whose eyesight compromised the ability to drive in our study to refract error was more frequently reported among older drivers high risk and physically demanding occupations such as bus vehicle drivers are generally less relatively younger and stronger men who can drive a long hours long hours and manage vehicle maintenance in the developing world in our study was found 65 percentage of drivers were suffering from refractive errors of any kind of 31 percentage were with the normal vision 14 drivers of were suffering from near sightedness that means myopic which means they feel difficulty in seeing far object from our result it is confirmed that uh, out of 120 drivers 25 percent drivers have faced accidents they frequently of drivers who had faced a road traffic accident was also very high and was associated with a high frequency of drivers suffering from refractive errors out of this the majority face difficulty in in driving because of visual problem out of 120 only 69 percent take precaution of their eyes 70 percent drivers were recommended for spectacles by the doctors and only 50 percentage uh, 52 percentage of drivers use spectacle during driving Current research confirmed earlier result that the bus drivers are still susceptible, so help problems as a result of their work. Bus drivers no face added pressure due to an increase in other workplace stresses, including traffic and passenger violence during the past few decades. It's an it's anticipated by the strengthening this human aspect of the position if that effectiveness of the mode of transport transportation will be improved for both passengers and bus drivers limitation of uh, study current research confirm earlier results of that bus driver the still susceptible to health problem as the result of their work the conclusion of our studies in the study we attempted to address the significance of visual acuity in driving a significant number of drivers do not have optimal visual acuity drivers refractive errors may geoparadise traffic safety drivers should be scheduled for regular examination to detect further visual acuity impairment a bus driver needs to have good vision many components of visual function are important when driving Many motorists frequently operate their vehicle while having the eyesight problem. In the study region, more frequently through the eye exams are needed for all drivers offering eye examination facilities close to their large cities transportation, transportation hubs. Could be one way to get around the problem of people not using the service that are afforded by eye care. These are all my reference. This photo shows to the uh, me and my fourth year students that the photo is the team of optometrists and ophthalmologists team. We were examined the uh, Pondicherry Road Transport Corporation office. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Session chest, do we have any question for uh, uh, Vanilla ma'am? Vanilla ma'am? Yes ma'am. Thank you for your information. We'll be very cautious while traveling in Puducherry. Yes ma'am. So it was a good study. Yes ma'am. Thank you ma'am. We'll try to uh, apply this in your uh, road transport office by sure, implementing also because this, this must be taken more uh, uh, Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Very. Uh, uh, they need of the hour. Yes, so ma'am. Try yes, to implement this. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, next, I, uh, I think uh, Bincy Nam is back. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll close can... my mic. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think Bincy Nam, if you're there, we can complete your presentation. 
Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I would request you to complete it in two minutes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, the conclusion of my study is the self-management education program was effective in increasing the knowledge and behavior among type 2 diabetes patients that enhance the knowledge among the diabetes patient can be utilized for promoting the lifestyle and early intervention can be planned to prevent early and late sequential of the syndromes. So these are my bibliographies. Uh, and thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for giving me the opportunity and presenting again. As I am here in rural area, the network issue is there. Okay, ma'am. It is understandable, ma'am. Thank you so much. Over to the session chairs for any queries. Vinci, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. After many struggles, you have completed your study at last. Uh, how many? All the best, ma'am. Ma'am, I cannot get to ma'am. You can move to the next session. Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma Thank you, Ms. Pinsi. <clears throat> now, the next presentation is by Mrs. S. Venila and Dr. G. Kale Selvi. Again, from the School of Allied Health Sciences, Vinay Commission, University, yes, India. Yes, ma'am. Right. One minute. Yes, ma okay, ma'am. Vanilla ma'am, are you there? Yes ma'am, yes ma'am, sharing ma'am. Okay, okay, fine, okay ma'am. My screen is visible ma'am? No ma'am, not yet. Now, ma'am. Now I can see the file explorer page, ma'am, not the PowerPoint. The downloads folder is open. We can't sit there in other participants there in Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Chat is visible, ma'am. Chat is visible. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.
good afternoon to all again i am my name is mahapani uh, my topic is ocular findings among fishermen my aim of uh, study is the main aim of the study is to determine the uh, ocular findings and ocular problems for fisherman community my studies background was the fisherman have been identified as a high the sunlight is the natural source of light the human eye is exposed daily to an ultraviolet radiation it contains uv rays which are invisible uv light is an electromagnetic radiation shorter than that of visible light but longer than the x rays it contains three types of uh, uv radiations uva uvb uvc the front surface of the eye absorbs 99 percentage of uh, the uv radiation on the surface of the eye this uv damage predisposes to cancerous growth as well as non cancerous growth like pterygium cataracts and pingula uh, these are all the possible chronic effects of uv exposures and can ultimately lead to the blindness this is the our materials and methods the cross sectional studies was carried out the approval uh, from the community of uh, approval the kuni made is the name of the village fisherman community is most of the living in this village uh, in the area is present in tamil nadu the sites were selected on the basis of workers in sea water being invited for their free health examination eye health examination 150 participants were included in the studies based on the samples estimation after sorry, uh, after initial rest of five minutes, visual acuity was taken using Snellen chart. Retinoscopy was done by uh, to measure the objective method of refractive error. And Snellen chart, as usual, we check the distance visual acuity. Near vision chart, we check the near vision acuity using for the distance of 30 cent, uh, 33 centimeter. On the basis of the data, the type of cataract, pterygium, refractive error were separated. The defective patients were asked to come our uh, hospitals for their procedure. The collected data will be recorded for further statistical analysis. This is our result. Study participants were screened of the presence of cataract, pterygium, and ocular disease during this uh, health eye health camp in the at Kunimed village. One for one fifty participants were diagnosed out of this. Cataract, 21 percent. Cataract, uh, pterygium, refractive error based on that uh, percentage. Uh, total number of selected patients around 150. 86 main, 64 female. I mean, this pitch tabular uh, table and pie charts also show this the uh, gender distributions. This is the age group. This table two and this pie chart shows to the age group of the fishermen. Mm -hmm. 40 to 45 age groups, 107 patients, and percentage is 71.33 percentage. And age group 56 to 70 years, 37 patients, 24.66 percentage. At the age of above 70, say 71 to 85, six percent only. This is the this table and pie chart shows to the uh, number of uh, affected causes and the number of patients affected in this uh, particular eye disease. Like uh, Kelesian, Kelesian is nothing but uh, it is one of the lid diseases. Uh, it's an inflammation of uh, chronic inflammation of eyelid margin. Uh, it's affected number of patients, two patients, and uh, presbyopic presbyopia is the physiological conditions. Uh, 12 percentage and allergic conjunctivitis due to affected the seawater, some uh, sand, wood allergies, 
this patients are affected three only mature cataract cataract were most of affected cataract uh, mature cataract immature cataract so totally 30 number of patients are affected pterygium is major 34 patients are affected pterygium and cataracts also may be uh, sorry mainly affected due to uh, uv radiations refractive error number of patients are affected 54 Pseudophakia, that means uh, operated cataract after op operated eye is pseudophakia. This uh, uh, number of patients is 15. This pie chart also shows in the same. Discussion. Sunlight is the natural source of light. The human eye is exposed daily to ultraviolet radiation, UVR. UV light is an electromagnetic radiation shorter than that of visible light, but longer than X-rays. It contains three types of, already before we'll discuss, UV rays, namely UVA, UVB, and UVC. The front of surface of the eye absorb 99% of UV radiations. On the surface of the eye, this UV damage predispose to cancer growth, as well as non-cancerous growth like pterygium, cataract, and pingula. These are all possible chronic effects of UV radiations. These are all uh, UV radiation exposure can ultimately lead to the blindness. The prevalence of pterygium was 40% is response age 40 to 49 years. And those who had work experience between 15 years and 24 years for the seaside, this was Higher than another study found the prevalence of measures are not appropriately implemented. This group of population will have serious consequences and many have some kind of blindness in the coming years. About half of the uh, study participants who self-reported vision problem were blinded. 22.2 and hard, poor visions, 36% and those had prior history of the operation were blind due to improper maintaining the pre-operative post-operative care. This shows that the contribution of operable operable by disease like cataractase and lesion to their causes of blindness. The prevalence of blindness and moderate visual impairment was uh, 7% in 23% respectively compared to blindness. Prevalence of 8% and cataract in 16.5% 16, 16 in UV exposure survey in India. Fisherman used to go uh, into the sea in early morning and evening, 4 o'clock. Both the time, the angle of the incident light approximately equal to 45 degrees. And conclusions. Therefore, the uh, project in uh, studies conclude that the percentage of cataract and pterygium is the considerably on the higher side among fishermen most people most of people are not aware of the effect of uv radiation on the eye in may uh, villages in many villages so by organizing some camps and awareness program this effect uh, will prevented among the illiterate and fishermen people are instructed to follow the protection of method the eliminate the effect of uv effective ocular protection from uvr can be achieved using hats uh, well-fitting sunglasses, UV blocking contact lenses. Many natural sources protect UV rays that fall on the human body. The majority part, a majority of part goes to the tree. So grow more trees also be better. These are all my reference. This picture shows uh, uh, me and my team of optom and ophthalmological team. Uh, thanks to the our thanks to our team to help the uh, studies to well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Suja, ma'am, are there any questions for her? Uh, yes. Is Vanilla, ma'am, is presented? Yes, ma'am. Huh? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah, I am only. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Okay, so very well presented, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, you so the much. Next session, ma yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Ma Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, for the next presentation, I would like to invite Dr. Aruna G.
डॉक्टर अरुणा आई एम आर यू देयर या आई एम देयर ओके ओके मैम प्लीज गो अहेड Good afternoon, my dear. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Coming to my statement of the problem, a study to assess the knowledge and respectable maintenance care among nursing students working at Narayana Medical College Hospital, Nello, Andhra Pradesh. Coming to introduction, maintenance health is important for the women during pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period, and maintenance health care services, which includes all these three areas. Globally, approximately 140 million births are caused every year. The majority of these national births with no identified risk factors, but only patients. Complications either for themselves or their babies at the onset of labor. Disrespectful and abusive care of women during their pregnancies has been shown to be a barrier for women assessing care services for actual care and delivery. The journey was toward respectful maternity care began in the late 1940s with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Coming to meet the study, every day approximately 800 women die from the preventable causes. Aruna, yeah. Aruna, your voice is not clear. Uh, no, please okay, put your slides on slideshow. Now is it okay, ma'am? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, coming to the need for study, every day approximately eight hundred million die, uh, million women die from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. And ninety nine percent of all maternal deaths occur in developing countries. The expectable maternity care compares respect for women's basic human rights that includes respect for women's autonomy, dignity, freedoms, choices, and preferences, including companionship during maternity care. According to the Indian Scenario Seven studies in India, that most women were not given the care in culturally appropriate way by the care providers. A study conducted in Andhra Pradesh that reported that disrespect and abuse of women during childbirth act as deterrent for the woman and her family to opt the institutional delivery. The government of India has stressed promoting respectful maternity care and cognitive development of baby under the Lakshya program in Andhra Pradesh. And coming to the objectives to assess the knowledge of respectful maternity care among nursing students and find out the association between the level of knowledge and respectful maternity care among nursing students with their selected social demographic variables. Uh, coming to the operational definitions, assessment uh, determining the information usually to a measurable factor. Knowledge. It is a family or uh, familiarity or awareness of understanding of someone or something. Respectful maternity care is an approach centered on an individual based on principles of ethics and respect of human rights and promotes practices that recognize women's preferences. Nursing and nurses who are working in the field are very intensely professional. Coming to us, the nursing students have to learn respectful maternity care. And daily patients, nursing students working at Postal Narayana Medical College Hospital, India. The data collection period was only four weeks. Coming to the methodology, here the research approach was quantitative. Is the approach was utilized to evaluate the uh, knowledge on respectable maternity care. And the descriptive study design was used. My target population was nursing students, and the accessible population nursing students working in Narayana Medical College Hospital. Setting of the study was uh, in uh, obstetrical ward and gynecology labor ward. My sampling size was 100 nursing students. Sampling technique was not probably the conventional sampling technique. And inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria under that inclusion, only female nursing students was taken uh, who are willing to participate in the study and who knows very well of the English and Telugu language. And coming to exclusion criteria, nursing students working in ICU excluded from the study. And Variables, research variables, the demographic variables, and uh, in research variables, knowledge of the nursing students and respectable maternity care, demographic variables such as age, relation, type of the family, residence, etc., and description of the tool. Part one deals with the social demographic, and part two it consists of twenty five structured questions to assess the knowledge and respectable maternity care among nursing students. And coming to the data collection. 
after getting the permission from concerned authority of uh, medical superintendent and nursing superintendent of the Narayan Medical College Hospital, the main study was conducted from 21 September 22 to uh, 28th uh, October 22, uh, nearly one month at Narayan Medical College Hospital. Nursing students who are willing to participate in the study were included in the study. Written consent was taken from the study participants after giving explaining about the study need, objectives, and procedures, ensuring the confidentiality of the study. And nursing students who have finished their duty were approached by data collection after involving them as study participants. The structured question was used to them fill up. It, it took take, uh, it's take time 30 to 45 minutes to fill that uh, all questions. And daily 8 to 10 students was taken. Then the data collection process was completed once the desired sample was achieved. During the session, the questions raised by the student nurses were answered. Then coming to the data analysis, uh, here I used a descriptive statistic analysis and inferential statistics. Under the descriptive statistical analysis, mean standard deviation and then inferential statistics, chi square. Uh, this uh, statistical method of that descriptive statistics, uh, mean standard deviation of the social demographic variables, and the chi square knowledge of the uh, sorry association between the knowledge of nursing students regarding the spectrum and frequency percentage distribution based on the levels of knowledge and experience in Latinamerica. Here, only the 64% of the uh, students have uh, knowledge on C grade. And then mean and standard deviation was 13.04 and mean. And standard deviation was 4.04 uh, knowledge and experience in Latinamerica among nursing students. Uh, overall, the findings in the same overall findings uh, on the nursing students. Uh, here, None of them acquired A plus grade, and 2% acquired A grade, and 13% acquired B plus grade, and 14% had B grade, 64% had C grade, and only the 7% had D grade. Coming to the mean and standard deviation knowledge levels, had 13.04, and uh, standard deviation was 4.01 regarding the information of the sexual maturity case. Coming to the conclusion, the result shows that participants had improved knowledge and experience in the medical Hence, they should be taken by healthcare providers to disseminate knowledge and experience in the medical to widespread awareness programs as to connect to the media. And uh, uh, all the healthcare education institutions should utilize the resources and potential of students' community in educating the public about the medical medical and the accessibility of its services for the optimum use of services. And here, main challenges, what are the challenges to promote the sexual logistic constraints for ensuring privacy, alternative birthing positions, and poor attitude of some healthcare providers, and inadequate staff, unbearable workloads, and non-cooperation from the women, partners, and self knowledge. So these are all the challenges we are uh, across that means we can able to provide all the services to the uh, mothers, mothers and newborn babies. This is my references. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Sujama, uh, there are any questions for yes. her, please. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Arana. Thank you, ma'am. Very well presented. And all the best, Arana. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We can go on uh, to uh, a presentation that was left uh, from the beginning. Uh, I invite Ms. Tomal and Deepa from Faculty of Nursing, SGT University, Kurugram, India. <coughs> Ms. Komal, Mr. Deepa. Congress. Any states mean to research? Ms. Kumar. Hello. Uh, yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Ma'am, actually, my laptop is not working. I don't know how to share a slide. Um, okay, ma'am. If your PPT is ready, in the Zoom, you will find an option called share screen. Here, the mute start video participants. Share screen option will be there. 
Once you open the PPT, come to Zoom and select the share screen option. Did you find the option, ma'am? Ma'am, I'm searching. Um... Ma'am, I didn't find. Uh, in the Zoom, can you see an option to mute and start uh, start uh, video, ma'am? Video uh, mute options, can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, in that row itself, can you see an option for participant security? Yes, ma'am, participant, ma'am. Okay, uh, next to that, uh, there is an option for share screen. Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. I can select see that. that. Yeah. Okay. Select that, ma'am. In that, you will see a PPT window. Microsoft SharePoint. Um, I can see that. Mm, okay. Wherever you have your PPT open, ma'am, whichever, whether it's uh, Microsoft PowerPoint or whichever you have opened your PowerPoint, in that uh, you have to select that screen, ma'am. Have you opened your PowerPoint window? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then select that option, ma'am. Share screen and select that. Okay, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I think we are running out of time. Can you please contact Ms. Sushmita from SFNP to see what can be done for your presentation? Uh, okay, so it uh, brings us to the end of the first session of the presentations. The left out presentations may be uh, scheduled to a different session. I want to take this time to thank our session chair, Dr. Suja Shamil Ma'am, for uh, sharing her thoughts on all the presentations and for, her, for uh, creating such an engaging interaction with the participants. Thank you so much, Ma'am, and also Dr. Anusha Ma'am, who had helped us as session chair. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. On that note, uh, uh, ma'am, uh, uh, since Komal ma'am could not join, we have to wrap the session up. Uh, so I want to once again thank you, uh, ma'am, Dr. Suja Shamil, ma'am, for uh, being a session chair and for creating such an engaging interaction session. And also Dr. Anusha, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we will wrap this session and uh, in the session two will commence in just a few minutes for the next set of presentations. Uh, so please uh, stay in this room. The session two with the next set of presentations will begin shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. It was our honor, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Uh, for further presentations, we have to wait in this group only? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All the main hall presentations are happening here only. So the next session, we will start in one or two minutes. So okay, the first sure. presenter will be Ms. Priyanka Joshi and then Ms. Shivani Verma, then Ms. Shalu, and then uh, Subra Srimani and uh, so on according to the agenda. So in just a minute, we will start, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Lula Kanta, ma'am, can we start with the next session, ma'am? Lula Kanta, ma'am, are you there? Am I audible, ma'am? Yula ma'am, am I audible? Uh, Ma'am, I'm here. Can I go ahead? I'm sorry, hi. Hello, can you please repeat that? Can I present now? Uh, no, sorry. Um, uh, we are still waiting for the session. I think she has some technical issue on her side. So once we have her ready, we'll start the session. And we'll be going in the order of the agenda. So I think, ma'am, yours is the seventh presentation. So, um, after the sixth presentation, we'll be having yours.
Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. I can hear you, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, ma'am. Am I audible? Audible, ma'am. I'm here. You can start the session. Oh, okay, okay, perfect. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, a very good afternoon for all the participants and uh, session chair. I welcome you all to the scientific session two uh, of the Global Nursing Congress. I invite our session chair, uh, Professor Mrs. Bula Ganga, Principal Jawahar Bharti Institute of Medical Sciences, College of Nursing, Nellore, Andhra Pradesh. Ma'am, thank you for accepting our invitation to be a session chair, ma'am. Uh, mm -hmm. We may, uh, with your permission, I'm uh, calling the first presenter, Ms. Priyanka Joshi from HMB Uttarakhand Medical University, India. Yes, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Priyanka, are you available? All the information are available. Are you available? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Priyanka, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, please. Please begin your presentation. Let's start my presentation, ma'am. Yes, please. Uh, Priyanka, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just give me one minute. Uh, I just want to make a quick. Uh, announcement about the time limit uh, which i'm sure it was already communicated to all the participants the presentations uh, that is the oral presentation will go on for eight minutes and uh, followed by two minutes of discussion for poster presentation the time allotted is four minutes plus one minute for discussion i request all the participants to please adhere to the time limit uh, so that uh, the smooth execution of the conference will be there and also please make sure if you're not presenting keep your mics on mute uh, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Priyanka, please continue. May I start, ma'am? Yes, please. Ma'am, slide is visible? Yes, it's visible. Yes. Good afternoon to all. I'm a PhD scholar from Machini Medical University, Dehradun, Uttarakhand. Today I'm presenting a systematic review on transformation of menstruation in India. Now, as we know that the millions of the girls, women, transgender, males, and non-binary persons of the reproductive age have menstruation, an important measure for the monitoring progress toward the menstrual health nationally and the world widely is a menstrual awareness before the menarche. Lack of the knowledge regarding the menstruation may lead to risky hygiene practice, which is turned to increase the risk of the infection diseases. The continued existence of the several societal culture and the religious restriction on the menstrual hygiene practice significantly hampered the menstrual hygiene management, especially among the adolescent girls. The girls have a variety of difficulties and the hurdles at home, school, and the work area. They are frequently uniform of the unprepared of their period. A program to promote the good menstrual hygiene among the rural adults and females between the age of the 10 to 19 has been started by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Between 2010 to 19, the numbers of programs like Rajiv Gandhi's scheme of the empowerment of adolescent girls, Namami Gange program, Sachi Bharat, Sachi Vidyale, Rastri Kishori Swastha Kalyanam, Water Sanitation and Hygiene, these many programs are introduced to increase the awareness regarding the menstrual hygiene among the girls and the women. The need of the study. The study of the menstrual hygiene management in India has widely a scant amount of the data regarding the perception and debut. No significant effort to have been made to document the peer review for the menstrual awareness in the various settings in order to better Managed menstrual hygiene, it is therefore to help to direction continuously research into these links between the theory and the practices. So, the purpose of this review was to assess the present state of menstrual health among the adolescent girls throughout this transient period from 2000 to 2020, when the public and the commercial organizations were taking more effort to improve the menstrual hygiene management, thereby identify the area that still required to improvement. 
in the methodology this is designed this descriptive systematic review setting is electronic research such as the pubmed ncbi ambes clinical key and the gorns library the population is the present study population comprises of all the public english literature related to the menstrual health among the dorsens girls the sample is the english literature including those which were published from 2000 to 2020 related to the topic of knowledge and the practice regarding the menstrual hygiene mhm facility in the school mhm restriction and the stigma perception about the menstruation education support for the adolescent girls regarding the mhm in india the search term were used separately and the combination using the boolean operator like the and and or the reference list of the include study was hand searched and screened inclusion criteria in the review study area the study exclusively done in any region of the india publication condition article published in the peer review journal only the type of the study any type of the study design reporting menstruation health the language is only english publication was considered study participant adolescent girls age group between 12 to 19 year the search focus on the menstrual health management study duration is study published from the 2000 to 2020 exclusion criteria the those study were excluded if they were letter editor commercial meta analysis any systematic review conference book paper thesis dissertation and the case report conferences which are unrelated to the topic and did not satisfy the review purpose the literature was not available in the form of the full text journal duplicate article and the last the study were unrelated to the topic or did not satisfy the review purpose or the data unavailable study and the article were not be assessed yes ma'am now the selection of the studies and the data extraction the researcher independently screen the title and abstract for their eligibility the full text was then revised to confirm an eligibility criteria match using a pre designed data extraction form researcher independently extracted the following data study including in the present systematic review the study characteristic including the name of the primary publication publication year the state where the study are conducted study design sample aim method and instrument study assigned the adolescent knowledge practice perception social stigma about the menstrual hygiene management as well the mhm facility in a school level of adolescent girls this is the prisma flow diagram of the study selection in that the total number of the study are selected in 2019 study and remove the 600 study because of duplication then remaining study is 1419 in that 819 article were excluded due to of the lack of access now the total full text journal is 600 out of the 600 331 are excluded based on the inclusion exclusion criteria of my review then remaining is 269 article out of 269 article 200 article also excluded because they having a lack of information regarding the mhm and the sample criteria will not be met then at last 69 article are um, present in the thesis out of 69 16 article are excluded after the calculating assessing the quality of the review article then the total number of the sample is 53 the quality assessment i will assess these many review through the new castor utava scale was adopted as a quality assessment tool for the selected study and was used to assess the quality of the each study the study with at least 5 star out of the 10 were considered a good quality the anos tool quality assessment relevant that only two study receive a quality score 5 while the 26 had the 7 score and the 25 study had got a 8 score after rating a several research were called this qualify because they receive a less than 3 star grade of the quality result of the study total 28 state of the india in my study 19 state are included total number of the sample is 53 in a 53 article six article from the karnataka eight from the maharashtra six from the delhi five from the west bengal four from the haryana four from the up three from the tamil nadu three from gujarat three from rajasthan two from the uttarakhand two from mp 
टू फ्रॉम जम्मू कश्मीर टू फ्रॉम बिहार टू फ्रॉम छत्तीसगढ़ टू फ्रॉम वन फ्रॉम तेलंगाना पाण्डिचेरी उड़ीसा हैदराबाद एंड आसम सो दीज मैनी स्टडीज मीन दीज मैनी एरिया आर इन्वॉल्विंग इन माई स्टडी इन द फर्स्ट मैंस्ट्रल हेल्थ अवेयरनेस अकॉर्डिंग टू द रिव्यू द हाइस्ट परसेंटेज ऑफ द नॉलेज रिगार्डिंग द मैंस्ट्रल हेल्थ इन कर्नाटका द परसेंटेज वॉज नाइंटी नाइन पॉइंट सिक्स परसेंट एंड द लीस्ट परसेंटेज नॉलेज ऑफ द नॉलेज रिगार्डिंग द मैंस्ट्रल हेल्थ अमंग द डॉल्स गर्ल्स in the maharashtra the percentage was 16% more than half of the adolescent girls were aware about the menarche before it occurred the mother was the first most common and the first source of the information among the adolescent girls with the percentage is 89.6% while the friend were the second most common source of the information with the percentage is 85% the knowledge regarding the menstrual health from the 2000 to 2001 were raised from the 10% to 50% the issue with the menstrual health in india are the interconnected and the resemble a chain of the command the cycle is the passed down from the mother to their daughter yet the menstruation is still forward upon in some location india still need to start the addressing the menstrual awareness now in the term of the practice the menstrual absorbent material was changed during this time especially among the dolls girls but there were a few school with a which are providing the insulation facility which are actually stated by the state or central government uh, stated by the eighth study thus the dolls continue to dispose their menstrual absorbent material in the general waste just been planned area down toilet even on the school property adolescents learn from their peer when the beginning of the period and even when the face with the issue they are only share with them which lead to the continue practice over a time in the social and cultural restriction the taboos restriction during the menstruation was prevalent among the 39 studies out of 53 studies the most prevalent restriction is the religious factor that is 90 to 100% food restriction is 3 to 66.4% stated by 17 study six study stated restriction to entering in the kitchen the person is 89% playing or any kind of the exercise activity during the menstruation restricted by the 10 studies and the bath restriction was mentioned in the 16 study the percentage was 0.30 to 98% the other common restriction was the modified sleeping schedule choosing not to attend the school and the social restriction so high right, school restriction their prevalence ranges 5 to 30% perception towards the menstruation of the adolescent girl approximately 28 study examined how the adolescent girl felt about their period in that seven study found 77.7% of the population believed that their period made them unclean the adolescent girls feel comfortable asking about the menstruation among the teacher the percentage was 40% more than half of the study population view of menstruation as a normal physiological function a few 25% of the study observed that the female adolescent believed that the menstruation was an illness and the curse of god the percentage was vary from the 2% to 30% other the menstruation such as a disease scared and the guilt fear recorded the 10% of the study population according to this study more than 50% of the population believed that menstruation is a natural physiological process now in the mhm facility available in the school mhm and the was facility available in the school setting reported by the 10 study out of 10 studies six studies ma'am i'm sorry to interrupt you uh, but your internet's uh, time limit is over ma'am please try to uh, wrap it in one minute okay okay ma'am the six study reported the toilet facility was commonly available in the school 20 to 100% ability of the water in the school that is 90% and the pad changing facility available in the school is 77% the teacher was supported to the adolescent girl 26.3% education regarding the mhm is 34 to 90% school administration permitting to in a school is 3.7 to 25% and the less study was reported about the mhm and the was facility the limitation of this review is this study has a conduct in india and the focus on the menstrual hygiene management practice in the india's various religions rather than the one culture practices and the conclusion the majority of the girls are switched from the using the cord uh, cord flag and the we must be improve the capacity of the teacher and the frontline staff capacity to boost the sanitary items supply to use the disposable chain to better coordination oversight we have to enhance the mhm as the federal and the state level 
this assessment offered the suggestion of the promoting mhm raising the awareness enhancing the peer review education for adolescents skills enhancing the public health practices in the india so these are the references of my review thank you thank you ma'am if there are any questions from the session chair ma'am please take them hello hello ya yeah, priyanka joshi yes ma'am yeah straight away i want to ask you one question apart from all these percentages and what are the ratings you have given in this what mm -hmm. exactly you found when you are doing your research project uh, sorry ma'am i don't understood like in part what is the what is your observation when you are doing this research my mm -hmm. observation yes. ma'am actually according to my review we are spreading the awareness regarding the menstrual hygiene still the women having or the still that also still having a uh, means uh, knowledge regarding the menstruation and the practices of the menstruation the thing is that they don't know what is the actually measurement how they have to manage their menstruation they know what is menstruation they know what is the practices they have to apply in the menstruation but due to the some resource means the lack of the resource persons and the lack of resources things as well as they don't know how to diffuse the menstrual waste ma management it is a major okay, problem especially yeah, yeah, in the rural areas okay okay thank you you have presented these all in your uh, main slides but you have given transformation of menstrual health no so in this while you are doing this research what is the transformation you have observed in this transformation okay all the best and presentation ma'am actually transformation is practices are changed knowledge are increased ability okay. through the government they are providing the ability also increased but the thing is the few areas are covered still the few okay. areas are remaining to cover up this uh, means uh, to manage them mhm okay okay good good presentation okay thank you thank you so much ms priyanka for your presentation i invite the next presenter ms shivani varma from hnd uttarakhand medical university india thank you sir Vishwani, are you ready? I will just explain the meaning. Ha. Screen shot in the. Vishwani, your time is running out. So, if you are available, I request you to start your presentation. Uh, Bula, ma'am. Uh, from the previous session, there was one presenter called uh, Miss Komal. They passed. She was unable to present during the last session because of a technical issue. Uh, so, if possible, like she still her PPT uh, is not uh, she's not able to pre present it. But is it okay if she can present the paper now without the PPT, ma'am? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Miss Komal, are you available? You can complete your presentation without the PPT. Yes, no, I am available, ma'am. Okay, okay, great. So, Miss Komal will present on a study to assess the attitude, practice gap, and perceived barriers to learning evidence-based evidence practices. Okay, yes, please go ahead, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Wait for one minute, ma'am. Ma'am, I am. 
चार्ट में रखते मैम डिड यू आई गेस मैम आई कैन सी अप ओह यस आई कैन कैन सी अप एपीडी Study to assess the attitude, practice care, and perceived barrier regarding evidence-based practices in midwifery among nurses working in maternity units or selected hospital of Delhi NCR. My study objectives are: first, to assess the attitude regarding evidence-based practices in midwifery among nurses working in maternity unit. Second objective. to assess the practice gap regarding evidence based practices in midwifery among nurses working in maternity unit third to assess the perceived barriers regarding evidence based practices in midwifery among nurses working in maternity unit fourth to assess the association of attitude and practice gap in selected with selected socio demographic variable introduction evidence based practices integrated the clinical expertise the latest and best available research evidence as well as the patient unique values and circumstances this form of practice is essential for nursing as well as the nursing profession as it offers a wide variety of benefits it helps the nurses to build their own body of knowledge minimize the gap between the nursing education research and practice standards nursing practices uh to improve clinical patients outcome improve the quality of healthcare and decrease health cost need for study evidence based healthcare contribution to improvement of health quality and inform healthcare decision making uh, the provision of timely high quality evidence is always required to fulfill ever changes need and expectations of healthcare personnel there is a need to study the health staff attitude towards evidence based practices and existing barriers and practice gap in order to provide insight on way to deal with these barriers and develop educational program helping to close the gap between research and practice my uh, study hypothesis are uh, uh, there is there will be significant association between attitude practice gap and perceived barriers regarding evidence based practice in midwifery among nurses working in maternity units with their socio demographic variables null hypothesis there will be no significant association there will be no association between attitude practice and perceived barriers regarding evidence based practices in midwifery among nurses working in maternity unit with their socio demographic variable at 0.0 level of significance assumption uh nurses who are working working in maternity facilities have mixed feeling about the application of evidence based practices in midwifery there is limited use of evidence based practices in maternity unit among nurses there are some perceived barriers to implementation of evidence based practices the limitation of the study this study is limited to nurses working in maternity units of selected hospital of delhi ncr research method Uh, research approach mixed method research technique research de design mixed method research design population staff nurse this working maternity unit target population staff work staff nurses working in maternity unit accessible population nurses working in maternity unit research setting this study is conducted in maternity unit selected hospital of delhi ncr demographic variable age gender maternal status education level work experience unit type designation attending training about evidence based practices based practices independent variables uh, including criteria the studies uh, the present study include include the who were working in maternity units who are willing to participate in this study 
who are able during the time of data collection who are able to read and write exclusive criteria total nurses who are working on leave staff nurses who are not present at the time of the study data tool for data collection demographic variable first uh, section b uh, the likert scale for attitude section c checklist for practice gap and section d interview method for perceived barriers validity and reliability validity of tool was done by five uh, nursing expert and two doctors the reliability of the tool was established by try out six samples the test retest method uh, ethical consideration the ethical permission was taken from the institutional committee distribution of socio demographic variables uh, variables gender maximum percentage in females marital status maximum uh, staff nurses are unmarried educational status maximum staff nurses are bsc nursing experience uh, maximum staff nurses having less than 5 year experience unit maximum staff nurses working in obstetric unit distribution of item analysis for attitude of subject attitude of subject according to the attitude Ma'am, wait for one minute, ma'am. I am so sure. Uh, Komal ma'am, what, what seems to be the issue? Okay, I think there was some technical issue she had to uh, leave the room. Uh, Ms. Shivani Verma, are you ready? Ms. Shivani Verma? Yes ma'am, I am ready. Oh. Okay, great. Please share your screen. It is visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, it's visible. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, myself, Shivani Verma, at a PhD scholar uh, at HNB UMU. So my title of the study is a pilot studies to assess the health seeking behavior is determinants and challenges in utilizing healthcare services among adults in selected community areas of Dehradun, Uttarakhand. So introduction, as we all know that major population of India is an adult. According to Indian demographic profile, majority of Indian population lies between 25 to 54 years of age. Even if the group is very active, but due to some factors are not able to afford quality of care from healthcare sector, thus lead to chronic illness. And need for the study is that uh, the major illness such as diabetes, hypertension, arthritis, asthma, tuberculosis are more, more prevalent in the state of Uttarakhand. As we all know that all the above mentioned disease are preventable, but due to some negative behavior or lack of health seeking behavior, uh, the prevalence of disease has been increased. The objective is to assess the determine objective of the study is to determine the health seeking behavior of adult population toward healthcare services to explore the determinants of healthcare health seeking behavior to identify third one is to identify the challenges in utilizing healthcare services research approach is quantitative uh, sorry it is quantitative research approach research design is descriptive research design population is adult population of uttarakhand uh, sample adult population of the selected community areas and the sample size is 38. Uh, sampling technique is multi-stage sampling technique were used. Sampling criteria, 
the study uh, inclusion criteria is the participants who were between the age group of 18 to 60 years of age and able to read and write hindi willing to participate in this study and adults who were residing in the uh, uh, residing in the uh, dehradun exclusion criteria is a person who uh, a person with a health history of mental illness a person who is not available at the time of data collection were excluded from the study assumptions uh, the study assumed that demographic variable can play a key role in health seeking behavior regarding health uh, seeking healthcare services second is knowledge regarding various healthcare services can influence the health seeking behavior third one is to uh, is that past experiences with disease and the behavior of health care professional can influence the health seeking behavior the research tools were used in this study first one demographic data second is self assessment tools we divide into three part third one is uh, health seeking assessment behavior uh, performer and the last one is factor affecting health seeking behavior tool well to ensure the validity of the tool it was given to seven experts and after this uh, after this the modification uh, has been done based on the suggestion the reliability of tool was calculated the first uh, two self 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 assessment tools were calculated reliability was 0.74 second health for health seeking behavior assessment tool the reliability was 0.78 and factor and third one the factor affecting uh, seeking health care seeking uh, behavior tool the reliability was 0.76 the testing was done before collection before the data collection Uh, now come to the data analysis part the first one is a description of the demographic characteristics uh, which shows that majority of the participants were between uh, the age group of 18 to 30 years uh, 63% uh, 0.2 participants were male nearly half of the participants were uh, unmarried 36.8 participants were having a highest level of education qualification 63% 0.2% were hindu and uh, pri private employees contribute to 36.8% area of residence was uh, mostly belong to urban area that is 44.7% and they have their own house that is 63.2% uh, 36.8 uh, participants uh, were having a family income between 10000 1 to uh, 20000 and 42.1 uh, participants were having a uh, joint uh, family belong to joint family 50% of the participants were having 3 to 4 person in the family family uh, most of the participants nearly 60% of the participants utilized government healthcare facilities and among them 57.9% of the participants were uh, rated as uh, health as a good now to come to the section b description of self assessment of the uh, study participants in this uh, frequency and percentage distribution of study participants depicting self assessment at the primary level so in the primary level uh, it is divided into mainly eight component the first component was respiration in this uh, uh, data was collected in yes or no it is a percentage in this 39 majority and uh, in this 39.5% of the participants feel difficulty while doing exercise Uh, uh, nearly half of the participants were drink water when they feel thirst. Very good, yes, sir. Okay, sir. Let me try. I am happy to be very good, yes, sir. Okay, let's come back. Yes, ma'am. Pardon, ma'am. I am. I am not able to. That was nothing. It was just some dis uh, disturbance. Please go ahead. So in the um, nutrition. Uh, Forty-seven. Uh, uh, nearly half of the participants take do not take evening is, uh, snacks, and thirty-nine point five skip their uh, their uh, food uh, fruits intake. Uh, in activity, in rest, thirty-six point eight of the participants were felt difficulty while maintaining the desirable postures. In hygiene and elimination, fifty-seven point nine. percent of the participants do not uh, eliminate uh, having a uh, problem in eliminated uh, bowel at least once a day in hazard prevention 21.1 participants uh, do not keep their environment safe and uh, in social development 28.9 of the participants uh, do not able to express their fe uh, feelings uh, this is a uh, table which is depicting table Uh, depending uh, at the secondary level, whenever they 
uh, feel sick, but they do in this 68.5% of the partic participants check their, uh, they check their health status regularly. 80 majority of the participants uh, feel happy or positive toward their health. 53.5 were not able to feel adjusted to uh, their job. Uh, this is the third uh, table in this, uh, the table depicting the health deviation at the tertiary level means 86.8 uh, of the participants uh, uh, visit, consult to the doctor whenever they feel change in their, they, uh, in their health condition. 26.3 of the participants do not, still do not perform uh, uh, their self-assessment uh, uh, at home. 23.7 uh, participants feel anxious. Uh, here's a pie chart depicting the healthcare seeking behavior. Uh, the first one is healthcare, healthcare seeking uh, behavior for the self. 92.1% uh, of the participants seek healthcare services for themselves and 94.7 participants seek healthcare services for their family members too. In this, uh, the uh, uh, healthcare uh, majority of the population that is 28.9% uh, seek healthcare services for geriatric and uh, majority 32.2% uh, seek healthcare services for their infant age group. The first choice of treatment was home remedies, which contribute to 36.8%, uh, and the least goes to traditional healer, that is 7.9%. The purpose to visit healthcare, so healthcare centers was uh, majority of the person, uh, participants uh, visit healthcare services to relieve their sign and symptoms. So here's a description of the factors affecting. The first one is time taken. Uh, so they reach by their 52, 52.6 participants have less than uh, 30 minutes of the time. And uh, uh, Ms. Shivani, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your eight minutes slot is about to get over. Can you try to wrap up the presentation in one minute? Okay, ma'am. So here the major finding, the result of the shows uh, so that majority of the participants were uh, 50% of the participants were married and between the age group of 18 to 30 years of age. Over 57.9% of the people claim uh, to be good health. More than 90% of the participants seek healthcare services for, uh, for uh, both themselves and their family members when it comes to the healthcare seeking behavior. The majority of the participants prefers to be home rem remedies. It contributes to the 36.6%. Conclusion of the study that Health seeking behavior addresses any health related concern. It includes actions such as preventive measures like seeking health professional medical advices, adhering to the recommendation treatments, factor influencing healthcare seeking behavior, a previous exposure, distance from home, choice towards the treatment, etc., influence the one's healthcare seeking behavior. Therefore, understanding these factors is crucial for the public health interventions and the promotion of the uh, health behavior. These are the references. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Over to the session chair. Shivani Vamma, all the best. Nothing to ask. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll go to the next, next Thank person. You. Okay, ma'am. Sure, ma Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next presenter, I invite Ms. Shalu from Faculty of Nursing, SGT University, Gurugram, India. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, is it uh, visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. We can see your screen. We can hear you. Can we start? Yes, please, please start. So, good afternoon, one and all. So, myself, Shalu. I'm a PhD scholar and assistant professor at Faculty of Nursing, PhD University. So, my today's topic, I'm going to present uh, one review I have did. So it is basically on the emerging need of simulation in futuristic nursing profession in Indian scenario. So in that, I'm having an introduction. Like as you all know, ki nowadays it is a very important in the futuristic, especially in the nursing profession. Simulation is a very emerging need to making them the students well competent and skillful. So this is the nowadays the, in or in future, it is a very required thing which we acquired in our profession especially in the healthcare professions so in that the simulation is a teaching learning method that replicates the real world scenario in a controlled environment it can range from simple role playing exercising to high tech simulation involving the advanced medical virtual reality and computer based scenarios 
This technique minimizes error in increasing the satisfaction of the students from the educational process and enhancing their self confidence, self esteem, and comfort in the skills performance. Now the students are familiar with the successive steps required to acquire a skill, perfect their technique, and reach the optimal clinical outcome. Simulation based education and learning become interactive and experiential. The main benefit being the consolidation of skills acquired and knowledge to be taught is very effective if we have used the simulation methodology. Then simulation is used for the various purposes. Like nowadays, initially simulation was in the trend in the India also, but it is also in the aviation industries. But nowadays it will be implementing in the healthcare industries. So it is having a various use and way for various purposes we are using the simulation nowadays. Like it is very prior near is education, which will help in making them the experiential as well as reflective learning to make them critically think, to make them clinical skills competent, confident. And they are majorly they will provide the, in the safe learning environment we are doing the simulation method. Second, it will also help in the skill enhancement. Like we all know through the simulation, they have to do the proper hands-on practice in the simulation. So automatically their skills will be enhanced. Then clinical reasoning. When we are performing the simulation in the team, so ultimately the students will enhance their critical thinking, their clinical reasoning, why they are doing this. They are, they are identifying the prioritization of the task. Then team working and communication. It will also enhance their team working and among the team, how was the communication? Then emergency preparedness. When the simulation of emergency situation, we are running in our simulation centers. So it will help them, the nurses, they will be well prepared for the unplanned emergencies and mostly for the planned things. So it will also help in the emergency situation. Then cultural competencies, because in the simulation, the students will be learning the overall aspect so it will also including or entertaining the cultural competencies. The students will learn how to give the care with the cultural diversity. That is also including the assessment part. The students will be well managed through the simulation, the evaluating the clinical. Uh, we have connected with some. Uh, we Hello. are also there, but I don't know which room we are in. Ma'am, can I continue? Yes, sorry. Yes, sorry. Okay. So, and next, after assessment, the simulation is very useful and effective for the research and innovations because nowadays, like we are, this workshop is also for the advanced health techniques and advanced health things uh, in the current scenario. So, yes, of course, simulation is more involving in the research and innovations to give the new face to the healthcare uh, professions for the learning things. So, that is also helpful for the research and new innovations. Then why we are thinking that the simulation is needed for the futuristic nursing profession? So like we have already discussed what was the main uses for the simulation. Other than this, we will be focusing on like so many further new things will be also focused. So that's why we are focusing that we should inculcate the simulation methodology in our futuristic nursing. Like some already we discussed, for example, enhanced clinical skill, it will help realistic scenario. Yes, this is the main benefit of the simulation ki we will create a, as a real situation in one uh, artificial environment we are representing artificial environment but as real as we can create we should create and in that scenario the students will learn the maximum because they are feeling they will never emerge into that situation and they are providing the actual care like they are doing in the actual with the real patients and the clinical so that was a very helpful for learning in the in the simulation environment in team collaboration already we discussed we also uh, they will also enhancing the effectiveness of interdisciplinary collaborative team and providing the good quality of care to the patients risk free learning risk free learning is again it is a very important because in the simulation students are learning with the errors because here we are we don't have a real patients we are making the patients to act like a real right in the real scenario but they should not perform or we are using the high fidelity mannequins which we, which are not a real human beings but they act like a real human beings in that the students perform how much they can perform and with the errors they will learn every time they commit some some errors and we will just discuss during debriefing after simulation and they will learn after, with the errors so it is a risk-free learning we should not harm any real patients 
then continuous learning simulation is also helpful to making the continuous learning through the hands on experience to making the uh, skills updation and it will be also helping in the advancement and standardization of the skills then assessment and competencies again similar when the students are learning through the simulation again they will be well competent because it's a totally hands on the student get the opportunity to perform by themselves they have to perform everything they have to take their decision making skills so everything will make them the competent then cultural sensitivities already we discussed we have the student should also know how we have to deal with the which type of cultures it should be very effective and it should be very helpful if the students deal the patient centered care with their cultural sensitivity then resource optimization resource optimization is like a simulation can elevate the pressure on the actual clinical setting so they can utilize the simulation for the practice and teaching in the as we can do in the clinical settings but nowadays patient won't allow to perform the things on their self so it will help if we are having a simulations then we can make them more competent instead of doing the procedures directly on the patients then ethical dilemmas so ethical dilemmas is also can expose the nurses we can create the simulation scenarios to creating the ethical dilemma and how they my students will dealing with those ethical dilemmas and how they will taking the proper decision making what was the best thing what was the best legal thing to perform in that particular situation so these all things for the their safer side they can learn with the experience so that is experiential learning is very good happening in the simulation and as well as we are also focusing the reflective learning when we are doing the debriefing so remote learning is also so that is a growth online education simulation can be integrated into a remote learning environments and the various nurses part in the overall country it is a high quality training and education method in which we can make our students well competent so that's why it is very much needed to run the simulation in the futuristic nursing professions as well as for the other healthcare professions so these are some pictures we are running the simulations so we have this is the picture of the hybrid we are doing the hybrid simulation in that we have taken one standardized patient with the task trainer and manually they are conducting the delivery so we are having a, some different roles nurses are there relatives birth companions are there so they are performing the simulation then another glimpse of some pictures of the simulation like in that one we are making one hybrid patient like uh, with the, along with the standardized patient he is in the upper one picture is it is a standardized patient i have making them as a actor to uh, create type specific scenario and here they all are learning if the such cases will be coming in the clinicals and how we have to be manage the thing so it is with the only with the standardized patient and in the lower picture it will be showing it is a like have with the low fertility mannequins which we are not able to speak nothing will be do so if from that also how we can run that simulation effectively and how my students and nurses can learn more in the more better way then some evidence shows we have conducted some reviews on the literature ki how the simulation is effective or not so we have identified some some simulation studies will be happening in the india so gradually one study is the dinakar r rai is conducted on the simulation based education and its role in the learning so what they have seen in this recent they have seen ki the recent curriculum by the national medical commission has made it obliged to provide communication procedural skill training using simulation for undergraduate medical students it anticipate this approach will extend the post graduate students as well as it advancement the widespread implementation of simulation based education in healthcare sector in india face several challenges of course for the in india it is a very new and current trend so so many challenges is also there we will discuss it in the further ppt so this uh, this uh, current review will set the current state of simulation based education in india healthcare profession to promote its adoption and integration while ensuring the originality in the content so it, it, they have shown ki it is a very good for the learning purpose of the students as well as for the adult learners but we are facing some challenges to implement this so we have to just adopt some strategies to make them implement in the broader way second study will be conducted in on 2021 so it this says the simulation constitute a teaching method and a strategy for learning understanding theoretical knowledge and skill in the nursing medical field the implementation of simulation student to practice their clinical and decision making skills for some significant issues they may face in their daily work so simulation is also effective
Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Just a reminder about the time limit, ma'am. The eight million, the eight minute time limit is over. So if you can try to edit it. Okay. One uh, okay. I'll wind up it fast, ma'am. So they show ki it will be the sense of security will be so much enhanced if they are using the simulation and they are also reducing the gap between the theory and practice of the simulation. So some points, some several factors need to be considered if we are establishing the, if we are doing the simulation in our Indian current scenario. So first is investment in the infrastructure. So that is very much needed to focus on this point and faculty development because so many uh, in India, there is a, so many centers and one center we are also having in our university that is a national reference simulation center. So we should require a faculty development. So the trained faculty is very much important if somebody is establishing the center. So that is very important thing because this is a methodology. So the trained person should be there. Curriculum integration. So that we know already the INC has incorporated the simulation in the new syllabus and uh, IC, uh, medical commission is also implementing. Then assessment standards. We have to be make some standards which is which will be universally standardized. So we have to be over focused on elevating nursing skills through the simulation based, standardized simulation based. Then research is also we have to be focused. More researches we need to be conduct. Then benefits of simulation, if we implement the simulation in nursing profession, so how it will benefit? So many benefits we already discussed. So again, it will be doing the safe learning environment without risking the patient. Repetition practices will be there, low density, high frequency, small skills they can practice many times, so it will help them. Boost confidence, competence, critical thinking, reasoning, communication, they will enhance team building. Ma'am, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, uh, but it would be nice if you can move to the conclusion. Ma'am, the 10 minutes slot itself is over. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, so, the conclusion for this study is the conclusion the integration of simulation in the futuristic nursing profession in the Indian scenario holds the immense potential to enhance the quality of nursing education. Improve patient care and contribute contribution to all our enhancement of the healthcare in the country. But although we are facing so many of challenges, so it's a task again. We have to be take it more forward. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. 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 Over to the session, Shyam. Yeah, Mishalu, yeah, all the best. Nothing to ask. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Shalom. Uh, for the next presentation, I invite Ms. Uh, Supra Srimani. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm here. Yes, please go ahead. May I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. You're audible, ma'am. Can you hear me? No, I'm sharing. Okay. Mm -hmm. One minute. Uh, ma'am, uh, do you want a minute or two to fix the issue, ma'am? We can go to the next presentation and come back to yours. In the meantime, you can uh, check your uh, presentation and sharing, ma'am. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Uh, if Ms. Gleji uh, Direction Korean is available, we can go ahead with her presentation. Ms. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. If you're available, can we have your presentation now? 
ओके मैम यस मैम यस ओके प्लीज Is the slide visible, ma'am? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Viola, ma'am. Good afternoon, all the dear participants. Uh, and shall I start with the presentation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm Miss Lijer Rachel Kurian, working in Caritas College of Nursing, Kerala, India, as assistant professor. The statement of the problem is a study to find the relationship between. perception of empowerment and academic satisfaction among nursing students of a selected nursing college cotium introduction of the study nursing is a field with a growing demand for professionals offering job security and career opportunities empowering nursing students involves providing them with necessary tools resources and support to succeed in their educational journey and future nursing careers while there are several prospects and opportunities for nursing students they also face certain challenges to empower nursing students it is crucial to address these challenges and provide support through mentorship programs academic resources clinical guidance and self care initiatives by creating a supportive and nurturing environment nursing students can thrive in their education and be prepared to meet the demands of their future nursing careers need and significance of the study empowering nursing students is important as it ensures the development of a skilled and competent nursing workforce enhances patient care outcomes fosters research and innovation cultivates future nursing leaders advocates for the profession and supports personal growth and well being a cross sectional study was conducted for 170 students in nursing college at university of sulaimani to identify their satisfaction with the nursing program a non probability purpose sampling technique was applied and the research study showed that more than half of the study participants were barely satisfied exploring the relationship between the perception of empowerment and academic satisfaction among undergraduate nursing students is crucial for enhancing student well-being informing educational interventions tailoring supportive environments strengthening curriculum and development and ultimately improving patient care the study holds significant value for educators institutions and policy makers seeking to enhance the educational experience and outcomes of the undergraduate nursing students the objectives to assess the perception of empowerment among nursing students of a selected nursing college cotium to determine the relationship between the perception of empower, empowerment and academic satisfaction among nursing students and to find association between selected demographic variables and perception of empowerment among nursing students of a selected nursing college cotium review of literature a descriptive correlation study was conducted to assess the nursing students perception of empowerment and academic satisfaction among 164 undergraduate nursing students of universities of jordan multi stage sampling technique was used and the data was collected using uh, two scales the study result showed moderate perception of empowerment with a mean score of 79 and strong correlation between student perception of empowerment and academic satisfaction at all sub scales the study concluded that more efforts should focus on clinical training clinical placement and diversity of te teaching strategies to match the educational environment or requirement to reduce the theory practice gap methods and procedures the research design used was a descriptive correlational study design the study setting was it was conducted among the undergraduate bs nursing students of the selected nursing college cotium and the sampling technique adopted was non probability convenience sampling technique which was used for sample se selection and the sample size was 140 inclusion criteria was undergraduate nursing students who belong to 20 21 and 2022 admissions and the students who study bs nursing program and who are willing to participate exclusion criteria was who belonged to admissions before 2021 and those who are studying post basic bs nursing program the tool used were three tools the first tool was socio demographic characteristic questionnaire which includes age in years gender religion place of residence type of family birth order current habituation support system reason for choosing the course higher secondary board of education and percentage of marks obtained in higher secondary education The second tool was learner empowerment scale. The learner empowerment scale was developed by Freimer, Shulman, and Hauser in the year 1994 to assess the intrapersonal students' empowerment. The instrument is composed of 30 items included under four subscales. 
The re responses to all the scales are indicated using a five point Likert scale. The theoretical range is 30 to 150, and it was classified as 30 to 70 as mild perception, 71 to 110 as moderate, and 111 to 150 as high perception level. The scale had an overall correlation coefficient of 0.95. The second, the third tool used was nursing student satisfaction scale, and this was developed by Dr. Aditya K. Mohammed in the year 20. 2019 to measure the student's academic satisfaction. The final score of the uh, scale ranged between 33 and 99, and it was classified as 33 to 54 as unsatisfied, 55 to 77 as barely satisfied, and 78 to 99 score was considered as satisfied. Cronbach's alpha coefficient of the entire scale is 0.96, which indicates the excellent reliability of this instrument. Data collection and procedures. Data collection was done through Google Forms. The permission to conduct the study among the undergraduate students was taken from principal of the institution. Permission from the tool developer was obtained and the questionnaire in the Google Form links was shared to the respective WhatsApp groups of the BS nursing students of both the admission batches. The data was collected after explaining the purpose of the study and getting informed consent from the participants. The analysis was done using SPSS. The findings and interpretation, the distribution of samples based on their socio-demographic uh, variables showed out of 140 samples, 57.1% were in the age group of 20 years, 94.3% were male, females, 79.3% were Christians, 68.6% resided in rural area, 45.7% were first child, 79.3% were hostlers, 96.4% considered family as a support system, 69.3% chose nursing course due to job stability, 94.3% studied in higher secondary education board, and 91.4% scored between 91 to 100% mark in their plus two. The frequency and percentage of samples perception of empowerment showed that the out of 140 samples, 58.5 percentage had a score of between 111 to 150, which showed high perception. The frequency and percentage of samples academic satisfaction showed that out of 140 samples, 53.4 percentage were satisfied with their academics. Correlation between the perception of empowerment and academic satisfaction among undergraduate nursing students showed an R value of 0 0.360, which shows a weak positive correlation, and the result was highly significant. The association between nursing students' perception of empowerment and selected demographical variables showed that in age, religion, place of residence, type of family, birth order, reasons for choosing the course and percentage of marks obtained in plus two, the null hypothesis was rejected as the calculated chi-score value was statistically significant when compared to the table value. Hence, there was significant association between perception of empowerment and those variables at 0 0.05 level of significance. Recommendations of the study. Further studies can be done to explore and explain nursing students' self-perception and empowerment. Qualitative studies can be done to reveal the detailed meaning of the nursing students' empowerment and academic satisfaction. Moving to the conclusion of the study, the study concluded that undergraduate nursing students' perception of empowerment is high. Nursing students' empowerment requires extensive collaboration between the healthcare settings and educational institutions to facilitate appropriate learning opportunities in the clinical learning environment and ensure that educational requirements for each course are effectively met. Here is a reference of the study. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank uh, the organizers who gave us an opportunity to do the paper presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Over to the session sheet. Yeah, Lisi Rachel, you said uh, your uh, project is research is relationship between perception of empowerment and academic satisfaction. Yes, ma'am. Do you find any uh, nursing students which are unsatisfied with their education? Yeah, ma'am. Actually, our uh, we got a barely satisfied uh, result with that. So. Uh, we try to improve the satisfaction because now we are following the semester system because they have only limited time. Because of that, the satisfaction level was uh, limited. So we are trying to- And what uh, is your delimitations of your study? Uh, the delimitation is uh, we have not included the students who uh, belong to year course, year batch, only semester students were selected. And uh, actually I had got a direct study uh, with the samples 170 but I have used only 140 samples. That is, I am considering one of the delimitation. 
ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल द बेस्ट थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू मैम आई वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट डॉक्टर उमा साफे फ्रॉम एडमेलिक एसआर यूनिवर्सिटी फैकल्टी ऑफ मेडिसिन एंड फार्मेसी टांजियर मुरोको डॉक्टर उमा साफे या आई एम हेलो आह यस हेलो I can hear you, Miss uh, Safi. Thank you. Uh, I can start. Yes, please. Okay. Screen is visible. Yes, this is Okay, thank you. Uh, dear esteemed colleagues and honorable guests, I'm Dr. Safa from University Abdul Malik Saidi in Morocco. Uh, I'm privileged to present a vital topic that affects healthcare workers worldwide who work with violence towards healthcare workers, a call for action. Well, the safety and well being of healthcare professionals are paramount, and addressing workplace violence is an urgent necessity. As healthcare workers, we dedicate our lives to the care and well-being of our patients. But in doing so, we must also ensure our own safety and dignity. Well, in my presentation, we will explore the pervasive issue of workplace violence, its impact on healthcare workers. Together, we will discuss the need for action at all levels of governance. Workplace violence in healthcare settings is growing concern, impacting the well-being of healthcare workers. In this presentation, we will develop, delve deeper into this critical issue, exploring its various dimensions, its uh, prevalence, and its implication for the healthcare, healthcare workers. Uh, the very individuals dedicated to provide care and saving lives are increasingly becoming victims of violence while in duty. This violence not only jeopardizes this physical and psychological well-being, but also affects the quality of care they can offer to patients. Well, workplace violence is a complex and multifaceted issue that demands a clear definition for better understanding and prevention. Workplace violence is defined as the intentional application of physical and psychological force to harm individuals in the workplace. This harm can manifest in various forms, including physical attacks, traits, intimidation, verbal abuse, and uh, psychological harassment. Uh, physical violence in the healthcare workplace can involve acts such as physical assault, hating, kicking, or even the use of weapons, causing an immediate risk to the safety of, uh, of healthcare workers. Psychological violence, on the other hand, encompasses behaviors like verbal abuse, emulation, traits, and bullying, which can have long lasting and profound effects on the mental and emotional well-being of healthcare workers. Workplace violence is no longer limited to conflict zones. It has infiltrated everyday workplace settings. This alarming transformation has significant implication for the safety and well-being of healthcare workers around the world in the past, life threatening physical ag aggressions was predominantly associated with war and conflict environment. However, the landscape of violence has evolved, and healthcare facilities, which should be sanctuaries of healing, are now becoming battlegrounds for healthcare workers. The prevalence of workplace violence in healthcare settings is both shocking. And deeply concerning, international statistics provide a clear picture of the scale of this problem, facing the urgent need for action and change. Approximately one in two healthcare workers worldwide has encountered workplace violence. The statistics reveal that workplace violence is not a rare occurrence. It's a pervasive issue affecting healthcare professionals on a global scale. To 38% of healthcare workers have experienced physical violence in their careers. Physical violence against healthcare workers is a disturbing reality that cannot be ignored. Uh, the statistics should serve as a wake up call for healthcare organizations 
policymakers and the public, they demand a comprehensive and concerted effort to ensure the safety and well-being of hackers workers. Okay, risk factors to for workplace violence. Understanding the risk factors associated with workplace violence is crucial for implementing effective prevention strategies. Workplace violence in healthcare settings can be attributed to a combination of factors related to both patients and healthcare personnel. Uh, research has shown that the that male patients are more likely to engage in violent behaviors in healthcare settings. Patients who are under the influence of drugs or alcohol are at an elevated risk of engaging in uh, violent behavior. Patients with a history of violence or aggression are more prone to repeat such behaviors. Um, Healthcare personal related risk factors, age, well, younger healthcare workers, particularly those under the age of 14, may be more vulnerable to workplace violence. Paradoxically, both limited and extensive experience can be risk factors, just as passion, gender is a risk factor to healthcare personnel. High levels of anxiety among healthcare workers can make them more sus susceptible to violent incidents. It's uh, essential to recognize that these risk factors are not exhaustive and the interplay of various factors can contribute to workplace violence. Well, a positive safety climate is not just a nicety, it's fundamental requirement for the well-being and safety of healthcare personnel in healthcare settings where high stress situation and intense emotions are commonplace, fostering a culture of safety is essential for several reasons. Protection of health care workers, enhanced team communication, uh, reduced stress and extra retention and job satisfaction, and preventive me uh, measures. A positive uh, safety climate is not just about creating a comfortable work environment, it's about safeguarding the physical and mental health of healthcare personnel. It's a strategical imperative that in con contributes to both the well-being of the workforce and the quality of patient, uh, of patient care. Despite the prevalence of workplace violence in healthcare settings, a staggering statistics reveals a significant challenge. Nearly 70% of healthcare workers are unable to anticipate the onset of workplace violence. Addressing the challenge of anticipation is a critical aspect of violence prevention in healthcare. This can be achieved through measures such as improving training, on rec uh, recognizing early warning things, fostering a culture of reporting and sharing experiences and implementing technologies and security measures that enhance situational awareness. In light of the pervasive issue of workplace violence against healthcare workers, it's imperative to implement a range of comprehensive recommendations to address this problem effectively. Uh, prepare uh, um, health, health uh, workers to integrate violence prevention in education and training, uh, protect them to enforce existing laws and employment prevention strategy, establishes monitoring and reporting systems, engage the public, media and communities, improve sensitivity, sensitivity and coordinated companies, Straighten civil society and international public health organizations. This, rec this uh, recommendation, recommendations, when systematically implemented, can contribute to a safer and more supportive work environment for healthcare workers, ultimately improving the quality of patient care. Workplace violence against healthcare workers should be recognized as a priority. Combat worker-based violence against healthcare workers effectively, it's crucial to emphasize the need for action at all levels of governance. This includes addressing gender-based and rationalized forms of violence, 
uh, on the global scale, international public health organization and entities like the European Union should take a leadership role in addressing workplace violence against health workers. They can coordinate efforts, establishing guidelines and advocate for a comprehensive strategy to protect healthcare workers worldwide. The phases should also be placed in, uh, in addressing gender-based and uh, rationalized forms of violence within healthcare systems. Well, in conclusion, the, the urgency of addressing workplace violence against healthcare workers cannot be overstated. This critical issue threatens the well-being and safety of the very individuals who dedicate their lives to caring for others. The statistics are alarming, with approximately one in two healthcare, healthcare workers worldwide encountering workplace violence and up to 38% percent experiencing physical violence during this this uh, careers addressing workplace violence against healthcare workers should be a priority at all levels of governance including local and global initiatives with particular attention to gender based and racist forms of violence we must recognize that uh, that uh, treat workplace violence at the public health crisis that is by taking collective actions and implementing this recommendation we can create a safer environment for healthcare workers and improve the quality of care they provide, ultimately benefiting us all. Uh, thank you for your attention. This will be your And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Safi. Over to the session, Shema. Yeah. As I said that you have so many people who are uh, violence in the workplace, uh, do you find out any remedies for that? Means, do you have taken any actions when you, when you are doing your research? Can you be able to hear me? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Doctor Safi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, can, oh, yes. you, can you repeat, yes. please, uh, the uh, question? You said you you towards healthcare workers, right? Yeah, while yeah. you're doing your research, do you got any people like that? What do you have to take action towards them? Uh, in fact, it's a bibliographic uh, research. The file study in Morocco is still in no, progress. not about the... This is one thing. Your research, okay, you have done, you have given percentages and you have given the numbers. So, you, you, while you're doing your research, you will be getting some of the people which will complain th their workplaces violence, right? What you have taken an action? Did you get them to any authorities or you have done anything to your researchers? Um, I don't understand the, your question. Okay, okay, no problem. Ne we'll go to next one. Thank you, thank you. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Asafi. Uh, Ms. Uh, Subra Srimani, ma'am, if you're available, uh, if you're ready for your presentation, we can go ahead with yours, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please share your screen. Ma'am, ma may I start? Yes, ma'am. Please start, ma'am. Good afternoon, respected chairperson and all. Thanks to organizing committee for giving me opportunity to present the paper on such a prestigious platform. Myself, Subhra Srimani. Faculty of National Institute for Locomotor Disability, Kolkata, West Bengal. I am presenting scientific paper. Title of my paper is Sensitization on Disability and Rehabilitation Across Health Workforce, a Need-Based Approach. Inclusive development is a right path towards the sustainable development. It is the time for health for all. One billion population, world population are disabled. And in India, 2.21% of total populations are disabled. Among them, 69% uh, percent are residing in the rural area and 31 in the urban area. Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, Government of India, started many such projects like DDRC 
project, SIPTA project scheme, and com community based rehabilitation CBR project. Recently, 2021, they, they have started that uh, cross disability early intervention centers. Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, started Rastiya Wal Shastha Karyakram, RBSK, in nine, 2013. But still, PWD are struggling with unmet needs. Auxiliary nurse midwives, ANM, and accredited social health activists, ASHA, perform a pivotal role in implementing community-based health program, especially early identification and early intervention. But they have faced great challenges in implementing community-based rehabilitation. With this view, a project was undertaken to explore a knowledge gap regarding disability and rehabilitation issue among nursing personnel working at com rural community, followed by need-based continuing education at National Institute for Locomotive Disability, Kolkata, West Bengal. Purpose of the project was understanding knowledge related to disability re and rehabilitation among grassroots level workers, that is ANM and ASHA worker, and designing need-based continuum education program on disability and rehabilitation for grassroots level workers. Objective of the study was to assess the knowledge regarding disability and rehabilitation issue among the ANM and ASHA who are working at rural area to explore the felt need of PWDs as expressed by ANMs and ASHA to design and validate the need-based continuum education program module to validate the module through implementing short-term training program and feedback. Research methodology was uh, methodology uh, research approach mixed method approach was adopted and descriptive survey design was taken and variables was knowledge on uh, disability and rehabilitation. Research setting was fourth block of Bugli district, West Bengal, India, especially Jangipara, Tarkeshwar, Mogra, and Bolagar uh, BPSC under Hubli district and uh, population was population um, uh, of the uh, uh, ANM staffs and ASHA worker and sample size was 240 participants. Tool was structured knowledge questionnaires on disability and rehabilitation. And the action to implement this uh, project, action uh, three-folded action was taken. In first phase, descriptive study and focus group discussion was done. And um, uh, after that uh, second phase, the designing and validation of the module content by expert members, and third phase, that planning and implementation of short uh, short term training program through Cisco OEX on virtual mode, and pre test post test evaluation and feedback was done through Google Permit. Result of the first phase, uh, table one depict that out of two forty participants, there were twenty participants of each category of staff from each place of the study. And uh, table two depicts that two out of 240 participants, there was 80 participants of each category of the staff. And uh, this table three depicted that the mean uh, percentage of a uh, score obtained by the participant was 52.56 and SD was 11.07 and median, uh, median was uh, 52 uh, with the range of 12 to 80%. And the percent of score obtained by most of the participants, that is 34.6 percent, was between 40 to uh, 49 uh, percentage of scores. However, 86.7 percent of the participants have scored between 40 to 69 percent uh, of percentage of score, which was significantly higher at the level of 0 0.001. Thus, 42.1 percent of them scored less than 50 percent of total score and 31.33 30, percent of them scored um, greater than or equal 60 percent of total score. And, uh, analysis of the variance, it is um, showed that there was significant difference in mean percentage of score of the participants of three category and um, that is uh, uh, post hoc test shows that the mean percentage of first ANM was significantly higher than the ASHA worker uh, at the level of 0 0.018 and the mean percentage of second ANM was significantly higher than that of the ASHA worker. But there was no significant difference in mean percentage of first ANM and second ANM. 
this was the focus group discussion among the three groups uh, um, uh, the researchers have done this uh, qualitative focus group study and the qualitative in a study indicate that analysis indicate that there is various health related need of the pwds but anm are not much confident and competent to carry out their roles there is no formal record system keeping system at sub center level and research and uh, this uh, focus group discussion was a uh, uh, transcript was uh, analyzed in this four, five, nine uh, headings and especially that health uh, need uh, health related needs they told admit that they uh, um, they we are the worker we are in close touch with the household and uh, we are aware of the cases but we are not confident and about giving specific need based care and in giving advice to the persons with disability as well as counseling the caregiver and follow up and rehabilitation service they admitted that they do not have the proper knowledge and appropriate information about follow up and rehabilitation most of the time they are not able to convince the families of the disabled person to come for regular follow up and rehabilitation and, uh, and the, uh, that uh, second phase after that uh, i have done and uh, mod module preparation and validation was done and uh, this was a um, module content is validated by 15 expert member from different discipline that is pmr pediatrician nursing and the uh, bmh uh, cmh of the um, uh, district and also phn and uh, the content uh, was designed in that uh, under this three heading that is disability and uh, its types rehabilitation and the records and reports and the final module title is uh, community based rehabilitation a community based training module on disability and rehabilitation for auxiliary nurse midwives nm and the, these are the uh, those are the expert member and in the phase 3 that is a training uh, program was uh, started on 3rd october 2020 uh, at uh, uh, through the Cisco OEX and 370 participants have registered pre-test um, uh, questionnaire sent to the participant and after that uh, Dr. Amel, uh, Ahmed Iqbal, Director of NILD and uh, the uh, District uh, Deputy CMOH and the DPHNO was addressed to the training program after uh, that, training was presented through the Cisco uh, Cisco uh, Webex uh, through the uh, Cisco Webex and uh, post-test questionnaire and feedback Google form was sent to the each participant. And uh, after that, uh, three uh, after the. Uh, after that, they have given the uh, um, uh, time for asking the questions and uh, the feedback was given by 107 participants and printed form of the module was handed over the all participants. And the result of the uh, say, say third phase was that is the, uh, it was uh, from the table five, it is depicted that mean percentage was uh, uh, higher than the Pre uh, of the post test is higher than the pre test uh, knowledge score and the domain according to domain uh, there was also um, seen that uh, from the table 6 that the post test score was um, higher than the pre test knowledge score and also the area wise um, uh, area wise also we have seen that the table uh, from the table 7 that uh, uh, every area their knowledge score increases in the post test section than the pre test section and improvement of the percentage of post test score uh, was um, as compared uh, that 73.8% uh, uh, participant was observed that uh, they they have improved their um, score which was significantly higher than that no improvement that is to 26.2 percent and also comparisons of the uh, t-test showed the mean percentage of post-test score are significantly higher than that of percentage of the pre-test score the significant improvement of knowledge was observed at post-test compared to the pre-test and also feedback was taken from the participants. Uh, there are 99 percent participants said that the topic was effective. 92 percent of um, uh, said that the uh, topic was appropriate for the for ANM. And uh, they have uh, given the um, um, given the answer that the maximum that is 80 percent participants said that they will able to do screening and follow up of the disabled persons uh, after getting this training program. 
that's the major findings of the and discussion of this uh, project that is about half of the participant that is um, had the uh, less than 50 percent of knowledge sports anm and asha both have little knowledge about screening identification of health related needs and appropriate referral of the pwds to uh, avail the local resources and there is no formal record keeping systems at sub center level so there is need to continue education among grassroots level worker which is supported by the um, uh, another study that is Ganesh Kumar S. et al. and the Hidaya Raj Devota De et al. It is source that uh, mean percentage of post intervention score was significantly higher than that of the post uh, percentage, uh, percentage of pre intervention score. ANM and ASHA both have good willingness to learn about disability and rehabilitation. They show interested, uh, showed the interest to update. Now they are said so that they can become so resourceful for the PWD. Thus, this program may be considered as an important tool in the field of disability and rehabilitation, which can be implemented in a large scale in community as an approach for disability limitation. Then study was continued um, uh, uh, that uh, study that uh, recommendation was continue education program on disability rehabilitation at a large scale maybe start in other state in uh, local language and home based rehabilitation skill training program for grassroots level worker uh, um, uh, and uh, follow up project in large scale can be conducted study limitation was there uh, manpower constant was there time constant also there only one year duration was given and uh, six months also extended uh, but it, it was too uh, less for the completion and long time was spent spend for, uh, was spending for the uh, stay, uh, permission uh, and from the uh, taking from the state government also and also there was a pandemic situation so due to covid pandemic situation plan was changed uh, and uh, that uh, make the decision to uh, uh, do is uh, direct to the uh, virtual mode and the conclusion, AM have increased uh, their knowledge after short-term training program on disability and rehabilitation. It will be excellent approach for disability limitation if the program is con continued in the community. AM's worker may play a pivotal role to educate the PWDs and their uh, mm -hmm. caregiver on how to take care of their health. Acknowledgement, the researcher want to acknowledge the department of... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, ma'am. We have already exceeded the time. Uh, if you don't mind, we can directly go to the questions if uh, Abula ma'am has any questions. Those are... Thank you for your presentation and good. Okay. Uh, ma'am, the next presentation is also by Ms. Subra Srimani and Ms. Uh, Rupa Sarkar. Rupa Sharkar will present the huh? Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for presenting. Thank you so much. I welcome uh, Ms. Rupa Sarkar. Good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Audible, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Yes, ma'am, but voice is a little disrupted, ma'am. Like it's not fully connected. <clears throat> Hello. Is this okay? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, the screen has stopped sharing, ma'am. And also a reminder to all the participants about the time limit. Uh, I request all the oral presenters to uh, concise your presentation to only eight minutes. So I will uh, remind you at seven minutes time so that you can be ready uh, to wrap up your presentation. Oral presentation is eight minutes. Paper poster presentation is four minutes. Uh, Rupa, ma'am, uh, can you share your screen? You're not able to see it. Uh, 
Hello. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I am going to present from Shudra Shri Nagar uh, PC. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Ah, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present over here. Uh, I am myself Rupa Shankar, final year MSc Nursing student of National Institute of Locomotive Disability, Divangjan okay. from Kolkata, and the. Uh, I am going to present my review paper and the title of which is Lifestyle Practice and Disability and Overview. Introduction. Uh, I would like to introduce um, from the um, starting as a lifestyle, not from the disability. I would like to start from the lifestyle. The way a person lives is called lifestyle. It is the sum of person's uh, habits, behavior and choices. Defining his or her life his lifestyle reflects our behavior, attitude, culture, and personality. Moreover, a person's lifestyle might affect his thoughts, work, social activities, and most importantly, his health. Activity in their families and their communities. About 15% of their world's population live with some form of disability, of whom 2-4% to experience significant difficulty in functioning. About 2.5%. 2% of India's population lives with some kind of physical or mental disability as per the National Statistics Office report on disability released in the last year. In recent decades, lifestyle as an important factor of health is more interested by the researchers, according to who 60% um, of the related factors to individual health and quality of life are correlated to lifestyle. The increasing Prevalence of chronic diseases has brought attention to the role that lifestyle factors play in a, disease, in a person's disease risk. Millions of people follow an unhealthy lifestyle. Hence, they encounter illness, disability, and even death. Having disability does not mean a person is not healthy or, not, or that he or she cannot be healthy. Being healthy means the same thing for all of us getting and staying well so we can lead full active lives. That means having the tools and information to make healthy choices and knowing how to prevent illness. People, uh, for people with disabilities, it also means the same thing that knowing that the health problems related to a disability can be treated. Lots of studies shown that people without uh, any form of disabilities have been followed or suboptimal lifestyle practices. So the person with disability who have many challenges in the life are not able to follow the optimal lifestyle practices. This in turn lead to more disability and more deterioration in health and well-being of the disabled person's life. Unhealthy diets, smoking, alcohol, drug abuse, poor sleep, abuse of technology, stress, and so on are the presentation of unhealthy lifestyle that they are used as dominant form of lifestyle. Lifestyle has a significant influence on physical and mental health of human being. Hence, the real relationship between the lifestyle and health should be highly considered. Uh, review, um, review paper formulated question. Before writing the review paper, the hypotheses were drawn before writing the review papers that are what lifestyle habit disabled people used to live their life? What are the effects of poor lifestyle practice on disability? And how does lifestyle modification reduces the risk factors of disability? Review paper focus points. Habits of lifestyle, um, in this paper, I only focus on two types of um, uh, focus points. That is, one is habits of lifestyle practices among the person with disabilities, and another one is impact of lifestyle modification on disability. The term, uh, for first one, the term habit denotes what a person does in a day-to-day -day life. Habits depend on the person's sociocultural, physical, economical, mental, and environmental condition, and also depends on person's education, knowledge as well as the individual needs. Moreover, a person's habits are flexible rather than static and tight. And for the last one, that is impact of lifestyle modification on disability. Lifestyle is a major factor for being healthy. Unhealthy lifestyle can be modified or changed by practicing healthy habits. Disabled persons faces many barriers in practicing habits due to their inability. Study evident that lifestyle modification intervention has effect on the health, well-being as well as reduce the risk factor. Uh, while I writing the, I used to writing the review paper. I already have reviewed uh, more than thirty paper, but due to time constraint, I have only included few of studies here. Uh, habits of lifestyle practice among the persons with disabilities. 
Many studies have explored that lifestyle practices cannot be generalized as they differ from person to person. As an example, can say people with disabilities have different lifestyle practice in respect to people without disabilities. The relation between stress and heart disease stroke is undeniable. Nowadays, stress become an important disease provoking factor for each and everyone's life. And in this area, disabled are most vulnerable group to be affected. It is observed that cardiovascular diseases in turn leads to many disabilities. So there is a relation between cardiovascular disease and disability. A questionnaire based survey was adopted for the data collection uh, regarding the implication of knowledge regarding the lifestyle and the self efficacy in the prevention of cardiovascular diseases. And um, that was uh, conducted by Akin Moladun of et al. on the year of 2022. And the study revealed that a total percentage of 45.3% of respondents accounts for low knowledge and the highest knowledge accounts for 19.13%. Study suggested that the risk factors can be checked if people follow a proper lifestyle, positive attitudes and nutrition education. And another study supported by comments that is another uh, conducted in Australia in the year of 2019 showed that the people with disabilities are more likely to be smoker, had more obesity problem and also had less likely to be physical activity than non-disabled adults. And another thing as a lifestyle indicator factor, cardiovascular disease play an important role in disability. On 2025, a study, uh, 2005, a study conducted by Izzati M regarding role of smoking on cardiovascular mortality revealed that smoking is a major cause of cardiovascular disease mortality. More than one in every 10 cardiovascular deaths in the world in the year of 2000 were attributable to smoking, demonstrating that it is an important preventable cause of cardiovascular mortality. I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, Ms. Rupa, you have two more minutes. So uh, I'm just requesting uh, to wrap up the presentation. Okay. Uh, regarding the impact of lifestyle modification on disability, a study evident that lifestyle modification intervention has effect on health, well-being, also reduce the risk factor of developing or encounter many communicable diseases as well as disability. Um, a study conducted on 2022 regarding the effectiveness of lifestyle intervention with lower limb amputee, that means disabled people, showed that lifestyle intervention had an effect on physical and psychological functioning of lower limb amputee patient as well as disabled person. For maintaining a sound health, physical activity plays a major role. Being physically active can improve health, manage weight, reduce the risk of disease, improve ability to daily living activity. Disabled people are more likely to encounter obesity, heart disease, stroke, practicing regular uh, physical activity can reduce the risk of those conditions. Re um, supporting my, uh, my comments, there was a study conducted by Paharam et al. on the year of 2014, suggested that mobility benefit from structured physical activity, that means an interventional program had effect on improving the condition of the disabled people and reducing the risk factor of disability. Similarly, as uh, smoking, physical activity, dietary habits also have an effect on health and well-being and like um, of disabled people. Supporting this uh, comment, there was a study conducted uh, on the, um, as a uh, cross-sectional court study conducted uh, regarding the lifestyle practices intervention. The um, study suggested that higher scoring health-related lifestyle group showed a significantly, there was a two group. One has the um, intervention group, one is control group. The interventive group or experimental group showed that higher score of lifestyle-related uh, purpose. That means quality of life was higher who, um, uh, who are used the lifestyle modification program than who do not use. Gap in literature. A lot of research work throughout the world as evident from the literature search has already been done and is also going to has enriched our knowledge on different aspects of healthy lifestyle practices and also revol uh, revolutionized modern management of disability. Along with the disease condition of disabled people, there is a lacking of research work related to lifestyle practice of disabled people. In Indian perspective, it was observed that there is a little study on lifestyle practice of disabled persons. Conclusion. Lifestyle is a means of sense of self and create cultural symbols that resonate the personality or personal identity. Lifestyle practice have a great impact on encountering disability and various non-communicable disease conditions. Disabled persons are little concerned about the impact of unhealthy lifestyle practices 
Interventions are related to the modification of unhealthy lifestyle practices have good effects on health and well-being of persons with disability. Author would like to suggest that there is a need of research work related to the lifestyle practices of disabled persons. These all are the references. And thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Rupa. Over to session chair. Thank you, ma'am. Nothing. Uh, all the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I would like to uh, take a permission to uh, invite two presenters who have missed their presentation in the previous session, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Uh, Giti George. Dr. Giti George, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, can you allow sharing to share the screen, ma'am, please? Yes, ma'am, you should be able to share screen. Ma'am? You can share your screen, ma'am. Ma'am, actually, I have some network issue, ma'am. So I can't able to. Uh, okay, so you cannot present now, is it? No, I'm, I, I am able to present, but uh, only the, the... Without the PowerPoint, okay. Uh, slide sharing will share, sir, ma'am. Ah, okay, ma'am, push it. Okay, okay. okay. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Good afternoon to all. Uh, myself, uh, Dr. G.T. George, uh, HOD Department of OBG, uh, Professor in PRS College of Nursing, Trivandra. My statement of the problem is preparedness towards post-menopausal life among rural women in community setting, Kerala. Introduction. Today, with increasing life expectancy and life uh, span, Women spend one third of their life uh, time after menopause. Menopause is a new biological state of adaptation process. The menopause is a transitional developmental period in women's life. In culture where high value is placed in youth, many women may see menopause as one third of uh, one uh, further sign of aging. The sign that attend uh, uh, by distressing symptoms that for uh, foreshadowing the age related uh, deteriorations in health and qualities of life. <laughs> The need of the study in Indian Menopausal Society 2008 uh, uh, census statement containing important statistics about the menopausal symptoms and recommendations to improve the healthcare for Indian women. Some women, uh, some of the IMS uh, research finding tells that the average age of the menopause is in India is 47.5 years and just slightly lower than the average age of 51 for North America and European America, uh, European women. Premature menopause is one of uh, one on the increase in India due to a mixture of environmental and genetic problems. Indian women in rural area, uh, 75 72 percentage of the populations and the urban areas of both are having uh, urogenic symptoms and gen uh, general body aches and pains. Objectives to, uh, the, to assess the preparedness of rural women towards the post menopause life, to associate the findings with selected demographic variables. Methodology. Uh, the research approach was quantitative. The research design, which is used for the study, is descriptive. The research setting is Palichal Panchayat, Trivandra. Population is rural women with 35 to 45 years who had uh, not attained menopause in Tiruvanduram district. Sample consisting of rural women from Palichal Panchayat, and the sample size will be 300. And the sampling techniques is consecutive sampling technique. The sampling criteria is inclusion criteria. Women with age group of 35 to 45 years. Women who are willing to participate in the study. Women who are not attained menopause. The exclusion criteria. The women who are attained menopause. The women who are having serious health problems. Women do not uh, give consent for data collection due to own reasons. The data collection techniques is description of the tool, section A consisting of demographic data, section B consisting of checklist, which consisting of 25 questions. And the result shows that uh, the preparedness towards the post-menopausal life uh, woman among 
rural women it will be 32.67 percentage have below average preparedness and 65.67 percentage have average preparedness and 1.66 percentage have a good health preparedness the so association we can able to find out in the post menopausal life uh, among the rural women in, with the education status in the discussion quantitative study approach was used to, to study to assess the preparedness towards post menopausal women in rural area the design for the study was descriptive comparative design uh, the target populations for the study were rural women with uh, 35 to 45 years of age for attained menopause the sample size was 300 and consecutive sampling techniques will be used so the tool consisting of two part which is the demographic data and uh, the uh, second tool will be checklist after collecting the data it will be analyzed by using uh, descriptive and inferential statistics the study findings was compared computed the data master scoring sheet was prepared and researcher first used to descriptive and inferential statistics for the data analysis and chi square is used to find out the association and the study concluded that the level of preparedness of post menopausal life in rural women uh, is uh, uh, 65.67 percentage are average preparedness so the preparedness level of post menopausal life in the rural women will be average that is uh, 65 to 67 percentage and there was a significant association we can able to get it in the uh, demographic variables such as education status occupation and marital status and the recommendations for the study education interventions to elevate menopausal symptoms health education program will help to improve the positive attitude towards menopause a qualitative study can be conducted to assess the quality of life among the menopausal women these are the references which i have used for conducting this study thank you thank you for my patience for this presentation thank you ma'am okay ma'am okay we can go to next person okay ma'am thank you ma'am okay. thank you thank you all thank you ma'am for the next presentation i invite dr sherin sara koshi sumera se dr sherin koshi yeah sherin also morning means uh, they are 12 to 2 session right ah uh, yes ma'am hello good evening ma'am from 12 to 2 yes, good evening, evening ma'am Uh, good evening ma'am you can see us live now my self sherin from kings college of nursing trivandrum and my statement comparative study to assess the awareness towards contraceptive use among rural and urban couples kerala family planning provides good health benefits besides women newborn baby communities and the families pregnancy time occasions as well as fast or too slow in women's lives and birth that are too close to to their birth have an impact impact on their prenatal care and improve their effects of poor birth weight need of the study the capacity of the women to preserve and use contraception successfully has a significant influence on their schooling and workforce engagement and on potential results for the jobs strength of their communities emotional stability and satisfaction the development of the children and the objectives of my study to assess awareness of contraceptive use in rural and urban couples to find out the association of awareness towards contraceptive use of rural couples with selected demographic variable find out the association of awareness towards contraceptive use of urban couples with demographic variable to compare the awareness towards contraceptive use among rural and urban couples and the methodology i have used is approach is quantitative approach design descriptive comparative design and setting is national health mission the panchayat under national health mission and under panchayat total 600 sample 300 rural couple and 300 urban couple and the sampling techniques consecutive sampling population rural and urban couples age 21 to 45 years residing in community areas kerala target population couples from community areas of trivandrum and the criteria include inclusion criteria the couples age 21 and 45 years of age and those who understand malayalam and english couples who choose to take part in the data collection those are person and exclusion those who are not uh, able to attend the data collection and couples aged under 21 years and over 45 years and the instruments i have used demographic variables occupation age sex age education living children type of family residence access to use of contraceptive source of knowledge age of last child presently using contraceptive preferred contraceptive method decision maker in the family 
preference of barrier method, preference of permanent method. And structured knowledge questionnaire, including 30 questions regarding contraception use, contraceptive use among oral and other people, and each having one score total 30. And the resulting score were ranged as adequate more if more than 75 percentage, moderately adequate for 50 to 75 percentage, and inadequate score for less than 50 percentage. And part three, structure is one of the states related to awareness towards contraceptive use. That is, I used checklist to assess the awareness towards contraceptive use among rural and urban couple. And the scoring one to five poor, six to ten average, and eleven to fifteen good awareness. And the results I have uh, described in regarding the demographic details of rural couple, demographic details of urban couple, and awareness of contraceptive use in rural and urban couples, and comparison of awareness between rural and urban couple, association of rural couple with the selected variables and urban couple with demographic variables. And here, the awareness of contraceptive use in rural couples. 52.67 percentage of the rural couples have average awareness regarding contraceptive use. And awareness in urban couples, 92 percentage of the urban, uh, people, urban couples have awareness. Here the comparison. Comparison of awareness among rural and urban couples. Here the urban couples have more awareness compared to rural couples. And the association, there is a significant association between awareness of contraception, of contraceptive use of rural couples with the education status. Those are educa more, more educated, they have more awareness regarding the contraceptive use. And conclusion, here the rural couples have less awareness and the urban couples have more awareness regarding the contraceptive use. And the, in comparison also, the urban couple had higher awareness compared to rural couple. Here, the null hypothesis is rejected. And the association also, there is a more significant association of rural couple with the education, occupation, and knowledge, uh, personally using method and temporary method and all. In significant association between awareness among urban couple, there are also education, occupation, and preferred method of contraception, permanent method of contraception. And the recommendation, voluntary family planning reduces the number of unintended pregnancies as well as maternal and neonatal death. When a woman has the ability to make choice about contraception, her children are much more likely to be healthier, better nourished. So promotion of family planning and ensuring access to preferred contraceptive methods for women and couples is essential to securing the well-being and autonomy of the women while supporting the health and development of communities. And that's our reference. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, over Thank to you. the session. Thank you, Dr. Sharin Shara. Thank and you, a nice presentation, and it is very short and sweet. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Uh, I invite the next presenter, Professor Jagadishwari S. and Dr. Neeta Bidhi. Professor Jagdishwari S. and Dr. Neeta Bidhi. Ms. Jagdishwari, yes, are you ready? Uh, we are not able to hear you, ma'am. Uh, we can see your first slide, but we are not able to hear you.
Okay, since we are not able to hear uh, her, we can give some time for her to fix the uh, issue. Uh, Ms. Jagdishwari, can you speak? Um, I'm not able to hear. I don't know if it is my issue. Esther, ma'am, is uh, Ms. Jagdishwari audible? Only I'm not able to hear? No, no. no. She's not audible, no? no. Okay, ma'am. Uh, Jagdishwari, ma'am, uh, I would like to give you some time so that you can fix the issue with the audio. Uh, in the meantime, if uh, Ms. K. Samantha Jyoti is available for presentation, we can go ahead with her. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. This is Samantha. Ah, good morning. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah. Please share. Uh, shall I start with sharing my screen, ma'am? Ah, yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Samata Jyoti, a scholar at SGT University. Um, the title of my study is The Association Between Students' Level of Emotional Intelligence and Their Psychological Well-Being. The problem statement being a study to assess the association between students' levels of emotional intelligence and their psychological well-being among the nursing students at selected institutions, Telangana. <laughs> Introduction to the, this topic. Um, um, as we know, em emotional intelligence, often known as the capacity to control one's mood and emotions, plays a vital role, a vital part in an individual's overall success in life. Every person has at some point in their life experienced emotions such as love, affection, spite, hate, and hate, as well as happiness, sadness, wrath, and fear. These are the kinds of experiences that are significant in life and have an effect on both the level of happiness experienced by people and their psychological well-being. If we are able to be aware of our emotions and be knowledgeable about management of its application, we will be successful. The ability to successfully engage with one's own mind in such a way that it results in productive productive activities, fulfilling relationships with other people, the capacity to adapt to changing circumstances, and the resilience to cope with adversity is essential to mental health. Mental health plays an un undeniable uh, important part in the development of cognitive abilities, communication, learning, emotional growth, adaptability, and self-esteem being in early life and continuing until death. These elements provide a hand to individual as a prepare as they prepared for their place in society. The need for the study to uh, conduct the study, the importance of emotional intelligence in the classroom cannot be overstated. Uh, although educators with the training acknowledgement uh, acknowledge the importance of the subject, they implemented the changes slowly. Universities and colleges may benefit from emotional intelligence produced guidelines since it carries a more methodological approach to the whole framework because it may help students to get closer to accomplishing national objectives, emotional intelligence, or to play a major, very major part in the educational system because our youngsters are going to be people who are uh, competent in the home career and community and because their psychological health is good um, because of the function and significance of emotional intelligence in this line of study it was investigated the association between the pupils emotional intelligence and their psychological uh, psycho um, psychological mental well-being the objective of the study the objective of the study was to examine the ex uh, association between uh, between the emotional intelligence and psychological well-being be, uh, among bs nursing students at chosen nursing institutions in hyderabad the review of literature it was um, presented on a under four subheadings, the literature uh, review related to emotional intelligence and components of emotional intelligence. So, uh, the components of emotional intelligence being self-regulation, uh, self-awareness, like uh, it depends upon uh, like, there are so many theories proposed by many other psychologists or some psychologists say that there are four four components some psychologists say that there are six components and some say that there are four five mm -hmm. so majorly what i have taken is uh like to re to represent uh, oh. the theory which was given by daniel uh, we consider this uh, self regulation self awareness self regulation uh, self-control, social uh, consciousness, and social skills. And this also includes empathy. Um, uh, to depict the review of literature, in short, uh, I have I have uh, tabulated hmm? that. 
मैम मैम शुड आई कंटिन्यू हेलो हेलो मैं क्लियर मैम या या यू कैन कंटिन्यू यस मैम सो द रिव्यू लिटरेचर इज डिपिक्टेड इन under these headings like author uh, year and study uh, and findings the major findings of the you know, of these studies that the the results reveal that the nursing students influencing stress psychological morbidity and educational institution strategies if they foster if they foster any programs based upon emotional intelligence can really make the students uh, resilience and they easily cope up with the stress they, which they go through in their uh, educational setup clinical setup and throughout their life also and uh, i'll just move with the next slide ma'am Uh, the conceptual model of the research study here the criteria var uh, variables are stu uh, student psychological well being and the predictive which which enhances the psychological well being well being as uh, this this are depicted under predictive variables they are self regulation self awareness self control social conscious and social skills here the gender was also taken uh, taken as moderating variables to understand whether there was any differences with the gender the hypothesis the major hypothesis h1 was there is an association between the student psychological health and emotional intelligence and all other uh, hypothesis like h1 h2 h3 h4 h5 h6 these are the relation to uh, this were depicted to represent the relationship between psychological well being and with each component of emotional intelligence like self regulation relation self control uh, self awareness self control social consciousness so, and psychological well be um, this uh, and social skills the research gap is despite of ex existing sci uh, scientific literature being on importance of psychological well being of nursing personnel for better patient care there is a gap in finding the association of components of ei for improving psychological well being the research question uh, this is under picos like picos no. the popul population the population being nursing students and they indicated to find the association between the level of emotional intelligence and the psychological well being among the nursing students the control there was no control group because it's only a correlation study outcome the expected outcome of the study is to find out the relationship of emotional intelligence in improving the psychological well being the study is correlational and it's not no it's a non experimental yeah the research methodology the research approach quantitative research uh, research design is correlational and the population is nursing and thank you uh, your 8 uh, minute uh, uh, presentation time is about to get over so i request you to wrap up the rest of the presentation in about a minute yeah ma'am thank you ma'am i'll try to do it ma'am only one minute um the data hai na pad the the data was collected from uh, 100 students of uh, from five five institutions so the total sample was 500 students out of which 251 was uh, 251 was male and 249 were females um a standardized a standardized tool was adopted to collect the data collection uh collection and uh, the emotional intelligence was assessed by sebria shrink which has got 33 items in it and it has got a, it is five point rated skill and uh, this um, psychological well being was uh, was Uh, assessed by using this mental health questionnaire which had 28 questions in there and these two uh, these two standardized tools were uh, administered to the students and this the, the data was collected and it was subjected for statistical analysis <coughs> um all the all, all the hypothesis were uh, uh, confirmed that to be significant out of which out of which the self control and social support was given the highest importance so that is a, st a student can improve their emotional intelligence when there is a self control uh, when they have when when the student had good self control and when there was good social support this would enhance their an uh, emotional intelligence thereby leading to improved psychological well being then the conclusions are it is evident through the acceptance of hypothesis that there is an association between the levels of emotional intelligence psychological well being and education ought to place a significant emphasis and um 
it, this this can lead to contribute their own uh, improving their standards of professional um, professional standards in person and also um, reach the national health objectives and also sustainable development goals then the recommendations are if if um, Based on the results, it is highly recommended that the nursing education institution should have orientation programs on emotional intelligence among the nursing students for their successful success and professional development. And uh, as far as the applications are concerned in nursing education, these uh, training programs can be initiated. Administration uh, plans can be, uh, um, can pl uh, training programs can be planned in, uh, in, periodic, in periodical intervals. And research, it, yeah, this, this, this type of studies can be done in a large scale and the standardized questionnaire can be developed for assessing in, uh, emotional intelligence further and experimental studies can also be done. It is vital to prepare for coordination and integration in order to improve students' emotional intelligence and psychological well-being. This is required in order to increase the students' mental health. In this model, all of the aspects that might have an effect, such as person's educational background, their family life, and various social institutions they are, uh, they are part of, are taken into account co concurrently. As a, as a result, it is advised that a training program be carried out, making use of workshops with all the members present. These are some of the references, but of course they are in la, uh, more number. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and being so patient, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, over to the session, chair. Samata Jyoti, uh, as your topic, what are the what is the plan of action you have gone through your research? Ma'am, I just wanted because the psychological well-being of the student, nursing student, was very important in rendering the care to the patient. Uh, I'm asking your plan of plan of action after your research. Yeah, the um the student student which comes uh, who uh, who enters into the training BSc nursing training, if they have an orientation program uh, on emotional intelligence. Talking on all the covering the all the components of emotional intelligence can really make them prepared for all type of adjustment, good communication, good leadership qualities, and to combat with the AI, artificial intelligence and to go on with the digital world also. Okay, there is no disturbances in middle of the years. Like up to four years, they'll be in the same institution and the same hostel, right? Yes. So how how they will be balanced? Means I'm asking, what is the thing you have given along with your research? So you come across so many people who have been with mental, emotional and imbalanced, right? So what is your plan of action? What you have done to them? The, the study was only to find out the association, ma'am. Furtherly, if uh, the research has to be carried out in a large scale for implementing, for doing the such interventions, exactly what you have asked is to be implemented now. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, if uh, Professor Jagdishwari... Yeah? Can you hear me, ma'am, now? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am. Ma Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am, I can see your screen. Okay. Good afternoon, Beulah, ma'am. Good afternoon, organizers and the presenters. I, Jagdishwari, PhD scholar from SGT University, Gurugram, and my guide is Dr. Neeta Binde from SGT University. Title of the study is Application of King's Theory of Goal Attainment in the Care of Patient with Stroke. Introduction. Stroke is the second leading cause of death globally. In India, it is also the second most common cause of death and about 60% of stroke victims face various degrees of disability, some lifelong and 30% cause deaths. This paper demonstrates the application of Emogen King's theory of goal attainment to improve the functional capacity and quality of stroke patients in reference to a case study. Objective, the objective was to use King's theory of goal attainment in the care of a patient with stroke to enhance communication, 
mutual goal setting and shared decision making between researcher, patient and the caregiver to increase the functional capacity and quality of stroke patients. Case presentation, a 54 year old male presented with a history of sudden onset of slurring of speech, right-sided weakness was brought to emergency PGS Glen Eagles Global Hospital, Bengaluru. On examination, patient was conscious, speech had poor comprehension, right-sided facial weakness, right upper limb power was two by five and right lower, lower limb power was three by five. Patient is a known case of hypertension since 10 years and diabetes since five years and on medication. CT brain showed acute infarct in left corona radiator. Emergency care and treatment was initiated. He was started on other supportive medications, NG feed and physiotherapy. The caregiver and patient were empowered with King's goal obtainment theory during the rehabilitation process in the hospital and home. The researcher educated the caregiver regarding ambulation, joint movements, active and passive exercises, performing basic daily activities like bathing, toileting, dressing, feeding the patient. And this is the modified King's goal attainment theory. King's conceptual system is complex and multifaceted. The goal attainment theory pursues objectives within the framework of three interacting systems, namely personal system, interpersonal system, and social system. The concept of personal system are self. So I have taken stroke patient as a personal system. Families, peers, friends, community will form the social system. And the interpersonal system includes interaction and communication between the researcher, patient, and the caregiver. And perfect communication leads to transaction. Researcher communicates appropriate information to the patient and the caregiver through an empowerment program. Mutual goal setting was set to increase the functional capacity and quality of life of stroke patient. In the care of patient, these are the findings. In the care of patient, utilizing Imogen King's goal attainment theory, after two weeks of care, Patient was able to move his right arm without assistance, ambulates with assistance, perform simple exercises, grooms himself and communicates few sentences. He was able to express his perception and understands the change in the role, responsibilities and accepts the change. Caregiver helped to reduce the role stress and strain at home. He participated in group interactions and able to establish therapeutic relationship. He considered his wife, children, and friends as a support system, and the patient was able to attain agreed transaction goals and satisfaction. Conclusion. The conclusion of this case study reiterated that application of King's theory is most appropriate in attaining the agreed transaction, achieving the goals, and to improve the functional capacity and enhance the quality of life of stroke patients because it is structured and organized to assist the caregiver and their patients. So recommendation, home-based empowerment program applying King's theory of goals attainment with caregiver's participation can be used to improve the functional capacity and quality of life of stroke patient. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. This is my presentation. Ma'am? Ma'am? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Over, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, I'm over to the session chat. Have any questions? We can move to the next presenter. Thank you, ma'am. I invite Ms. Uh, Varlakshmi. Yeah, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma Thank you yes, so much. I'm connecting. Okay. The slide is visible again. Jagadishwari, ma'am, slides. Okay. Yeah, I will move it, ma'am. You can share your screen now.
Are you able to share the screen, ma? Yeah, ma'am. I'm um, okay, ma'am. So I have to go to files now, ma'am, here? Uh, yes, ma'am. Wherever you save your PPT, you have to open the PPT and keep, and then share screen. Oh. Uh, ma'am, uh, while you try to figure it out, uh, can we go to the next presentation and come back, ma'am? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, if uh, Dr. and Navnita ma'am is available for uh, the presentation, I invite you, ma'am. Dr. M. Navnita? Yes, ma'am. I'll join, ma'am. Just a minute. I'll share. Oh, okay. Okay, ma'am. Sure. Ma'am, is Yes, ma'am. Screen is visible, ma'am. Okay, so can I start, ma'am? Uh, uh, no, it's not visible, ma'am. No, no ma'am. No, ma'am. No, Zoom is only coming, ma'am. Uh, I think you can open the P uh, PPT. Uh, it is open only, ma'am, or else I'll present without the PPT. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, if it's okay with it the session, okay? you can. Oh, okay, ma'am. So... Okay. So good evening to all of you, ma'am. Uh, so I would like to present my study on the factors affecting PCOD. I am Dr. Namnita from College of Nursing, PIMS, Pondicherry. So to introduce the topic, uh, polycystic ovarian disease is a common endocrine disorder, which is difficult to define because there is no single abnormality or diagnostic test that defines the syndrome. But uh, different studies have shown that lifestyle changes and food patterns are the causes of factors for the development of PCOD. So it is uh, very important for women to take care of their health and understand the, uh, these factors which are there. So that is why we did this study to identify the factors. So the methods, coming to the methods of the study, the research approach was quantitative approach, research design, case control design. Uh, setting was in three different areas. Uh, OPD of PIMS uh, College, private clinic and uh, hospital and community area of Mithyalpet. So population were women in reproductive age group of 18 to 45 years. Uh, sample of the study were women of uh, 18 to 45 years attending the three areas of uh, study. And we had 50 in each group and the samples were selected by purposive sampling technique. So the coming to the inclusion in criteria for the cases, it was 18 to 45 years. Diagnosed with PCOD by ultrasonography. 
for controls it was 80 hospital controls it was 18 to 45 years amenorrheic woman again diagnosed without pcod by ultrasonograph and the community controls are uh, 18 to 45 years with normal menstruation residing in the urban area and exclusion criteria we took all cardiovascular diseases mood disorders sleep apnea and not willing to participate in the study so the coming to the materials of the study the data was collected using semi structured questionnaire and uh, demographic variables and uh, the different uh, uh, variables or factors were identified so we had a semi structured interview and the uh, tool reliability was 0.73 uh, front back alpha value and ethical clearance was obtained from the institution review board and uh, from the heads of the institutions and the area heads and from the participants we took an informed consent so with this coming to the data collection we found in all the three groups majority of the participants are in the above 8 30 years and except in the community controls in other groups we found that most of the participants had completed schooling and for occupation because they were women they were all housewives most of them were housewives and so they did not have any income and majority of them were hindus in all the three groups and regarding food pattern Uh, we found that many majority were non vegetarian and except in community control the other two groups they were overweight and community controls they were normal weighted people and except in hospital controls we found that majority were living in nuclear families and then regarding the menarche most of them had attained in 14 to 17 years and only in community control many had children but in case in hospital control and hospital community controls we found that they did not have children sorry case in hospital control they did not have children most of them and then we also identified the prim mean parity and their details regarding that and then we collected history regarding the family history of pcod and we found that 86% of cases 84% of hospital control and 90% of community control had no history of family history of pcod and then coming to treatment only 80% in the hospital case 82% in hospital control and 80% in community control were undergoing treatment then 70% of them had irregular periods and 56% in the hospital cases had uh, pain during menstruation and uh, 12% only were taking medicine for uh, pain and home remedies 34% in the hospital cases were taking and then coming to the food items um 32% of the hospital cases 62% of hospital control and 22% of community control were taking milk and regarding the bakery items it was mostly from the cases uh, like a cake potato chips and uh, noodles popcorn but no one was taking pizza and burger and then regarding the hospital controls we found found that 15th again it was all very less who were taking except for bread they were taking more and in community controls also we found that no one was taking pizza burger or pasta noodles and all so that was a interesting finding of the study that many community people are not uh, taking uh, those uh, type of fast foods and then coming to biscuits which was also a cause of uh, pcod 20 of of the cases were taking biscuits one to four times a week and most of them were not doing any exercise so with this factors in mind we used a odds ratio to calculate and found that um between the hospital cases and hospital controls a uh, medical history of other than pcod a regular periods number of child and taking milk had a significant or value and for hospital cases and community controls education bmi marital status number of children and taking tea and not doing exercise had a, a significant value and then by doing the overall uh, calculations we found that Uh, that with no children, forty-one times I they were at risk of getting PCOD compared with people with children. So the limitation of the study, it was only answers by the people. So that is, um, they are eating of food and other things may not be a true answer. We we cannot tell that. And then coming to the implications of the study in nursing practice, we can give teaching to the people which we have started doing. for primary prevention of the disease and for nursing education we have been teaching students to identify people with pcod and uh, give the teaching regarding the lifestyle modifications and administrators have a major role uh, in uh, i don't mean teaching or uh, giving the uh, nurses under them to identify risk factors of uh, pcod and uh, give iec materials for them to overcome the problem and uh, various areas of uh, research can be done because people there are there were not much studies when we started doing this study
So this study concludes that risk factors can be identified by PCOD, and uh, around 41 uh, times it is high. O R of 41 times we found for not having children, and community health nurse can do preventive measures to overcome this. And as an acknowledgement, I thank the uh, co-authors of this paper, Dr. Anusia and Mrs. Arul Moli. Uh, thank you for your patient hearing, and thank you for the opportunity. Ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Over to the session chair. Doctor, uh, thank you for your presentation and good all the best. Thank you, ma'am. You could have shared your uh, screen shot means your uh, presentation PPT. It will be fine. But uh, yes, ma'am. But I couldn't. I couldn't do it. I'm sorry. It's okay. Ma Uh, on that note, I would like to invite the next speaker, Ms. Varlakshmi, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Um, I am here, but I am not able to connect uh, to these uh, uh, issues. Shall I start uh, without? Uh, okay, ma'am. I think uh, yeah, that's the only option we have. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I am K. Varlakshmi. PhD scholar of uh, Sri Padmavati Mahila Vishwavidyalaya Tirupati under the guidance of Dr. Sharada, professor of uh, Sri Venkatesh Sri uh, Padmavati Mahila Vishwavidyalaya. And my study is related to nutritional status, nutritional behavior, and lifestyle assessment of cancer survivors. So uh, here it is a uh, need based assessment which was done in phase one of my study of PhD. So here, introduction. coming to the introduction, cancer is a generic term for a large group of diseases that can affect any part of the world. Other terms used are malignant tumors and neoplasms. Cancer is a leading cause of death worldwide, accounting for nearly 10 million deaths in 2020, or nearly one in six deaths. Coming to the objectives of my study, to assess nutritional status of cancer survivors, to assess the nutritional behavior of cancer survivors, and to assess lifestyle of cancer survivors. Coming to the materials and methods, it is a cross-sectional hospital-based study carried out on 290 cancer survivors aged between 25 to 65 years, among which 118 men and 200, sorry, 172 were women suffering with various cancer diseases who are in first and second stages of cancer and who were attending oncology OPDs of a cancer hospital. A pre-structural questionnaire included demographic information and nutritional status, which consists of anthropometric measures, dietary assessment methods, and nutritional behavior assessment by food habits, frequency of food intake, dietary diversity score and lifestyle assessment uh, related to daily routine activities like exercises, yoga, meditation, and habits were collected. Coming to the analysis of my this information, the, the data, the distribution of respondents by their socio-demographic profile was done, and which consists of the majority of uh, the uh, Sample were females who were 59.3% and who were uh, aged majority 45.9% between uh, uh, 51 years and more. And coming to the domicile, they were 54.5% were from urban areas. And coming to the religious aspect, they were Hindus, 82.1% were Hindus among the sample, and the least were 5.2% Christians, and Muslims were 12.8%. Coming to the marital status, majority of the sample, 83.1% were married. And coming to the educational status of the sample, third majority, 34.5% had only high school studies. And coming to the occupation, uh, they were 57.6% uh, among the sample were daily wage earners. And coming to the monthly income of the total uh, family, and it is 65.5% were having 
10,000 10,000 rupees or less than 10, per month. Ty coming to the type of family, 61.4% of the uh, par participants were from nuclear family. And coming to the family science, the majority, 47.2% of the participants were having uh, three or less than three members in the family coming to the relationship of caretaker and majority 47.2 percent had uh, other than other family members than father mother wife husband other than these four people they were having other than these members they were attending and coming to the nutritional status assessment in the present study the nutritional status of the respondents was assessed through body mass index uh, assessment and coming to the distribution of the respondents by their body mass index here we have 52.1 percent of the, uh, the participants had normal uh, weight and 33.1 percent were obese and only 14.8 percent were underweight and coming to the distribution of cancer survivors by selected dietary nutri nutrient intake indicators this dietary intake was uh, studied by uh, collecting the data of 24 hours recall method and also oral supplements, nutri-cuticles intake and also water consumption. So here the, the table shows that there is dietary nutrient intake among the uh, women and uh, men, so which was analyzed and the selected nutrients like energy, protein, vitamin A and vitamin C, iron and folic acid. These nutritive values of the individuals calculated are below normal level based on the uh, ICMR uh, guidelines which were given 2021 and it is below the normal uh, daily intake. Coming to the Distribution of the respondents by selected indicators of nutritional behavior, as I explained earlier, there are the intake of water was majority of the uh, participants were consuming uh, more than two liters, that is 62.1% of the uh, participants were consuming more than two liters of the water. And the food habits coming to the food habits, majority 55.5% of the participants were non-vegetarian group. And coming to the number of meals consuming per day, majority, 70% of the participants were consuming uh, three or more, uh, sorry, less than three meals because might be because of their condition after uh, treatment. And coming to the distribution of the respondents by selected food likes and dislikes across the gender. So here they were uh, coming to the likes and dislikes. They were... Um, The results of chi-square in this table shows that uh, there was no significant association found between the food likes and dislikes of men and women for cereals, pulses, millets, nuts, oil seeds, vegetables, fruits, poultry, meat, seafoods, and beverages as p-value is greater than 0 0.05. In contrast, there was significant association found between gender and food likes and dislikes for milk and milk products at 0 0.05 levels of significance and for eggs it was 0 0.01 level of significance and for junk foods it was at uh, significant at 0 0.001 level of significance. Coming to the distribution of respondents by selected uh, sorry. Uh, ma'am, the time is running out, so it would yeah, be yeah. great if you distribution get that one. Yes, ma'am, I am completing. Distribution of the respondents by their DDS score, dietary diversity score per week and per day. The dietary diversity score was uh, found that there was no significant association between the uh, independent seven independent variables of cancer survivors and the uh, dietary diversity score per week and per day. But there was significant association found between the predictor variables, namely education, marital status, and monthly income, 
and relationship of caretaker at 0.01 level of significance was found respectively. And coming to the Coming to the uh, lifestyle of cancer survivors, the difference between the sample with regard to their unhealthy habits and socio-demographic independent variables was studied by using F ratio T test as shown in the table. But among the socio-demographic variables included in the study, only two variables, namely gender and marital status, had significant difference with regard to the unhealthy habits at 0.001 and 0.05 level of significance. There was no significant difference found between the unhealthy habits and remaining other nine independent variables which were included in the study. Coming to the conclusion of the study, uh, from this study, we have drawn the conclusion that among the sample, majority were under the age of uh, 50 years, sorry, more than 50 years. The mean dietary nutrient intake of the men and women were below normal, and there was no significant association found between seven independent variables of the cancer survivors and DDS, that is the dietary diver diversity score per week and per day. There was significant association found between the four predictor variables as marital status, monthly income, relationship of caretaker, and education at 0.001 level and 0.05 level of significance. So these findings indicate that they, these four variables may influence the nutritional status and nutritional behavior as well as the lifestyle of cancer survivors. So there is a very need to address the dietary diversity and dietary uh, intake and nutritional behavior of cancer survivors to improve their nutritional status, nutritional behavior, and also the lifestyle of cancer survivors. So thank you, madam. This is the end of my presentation. And, uh, uh, I'm sorry, ma'am, are you done, ma'am? Yeah, ma'am. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Over to the session, chair. Yeah, okay, but Lakshmi, good presentation and nothing to ask. All the best. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, ma'am. I next invite Ms. Salomi from Ramaya Institute of Nursing Education and Research. Yes, ma'am. I'm there. I'm sharing. Okay, ma'am. Ma'am, can you see? No, ma'am. Ma'am, PPT can be seen? PPT is not seen, uh, visible, ma'am. Only a uh, background banner is seen. Now, ma'am. Now, yes, ma'am. I can see. Shall I start, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Please go. Yes, ma'am. So, title of the sorry. Title of the study: Assessment of the food care self-efficacy and food care behavior among patients with diabetes mellitus. Sorry, ma'am. Assessment of food care self-efficacy and food care behavior among patients with diabetes mellitus. So, background of the study. According to the International Diabetic Federation, an estimated 537 million people worldwide had diabetes mellitus in 2021. And it is expected to rise to 643 million by 2030 and 783 million by 2045. And India is known as the diabetic capital of the world. So uncontrolled diabetes can lead to the food problems and food problem is one of the cause of disability among diabetics and food care is often neglected among the diabetic patient. 
So food, pra food practices have been identified as a risk factors and it uh, these risk factors can be prevented so that so we can prevent the diabetic food uh, problems. Diabetic food care is a simple and it's also a low cost and most effective nursing intervention which can reduce the rate of hemorrhage by 85%. So self-efficacy influences the food care uh, self-care behaviors among diabetic patients so that it can prevent the foot ulcers and amputation. So objective of this study is to assess the food care self-efficacy and food care behavior among the diabetic patients and to assess the relationship between food care self-efficacy and food care behavior to find the association between food care self-efficacy and food care behavior and select demographic variables. So methodology, research approach is quantitative approach research design, descriptive correlational design, and then study variable, food care self-efficacy and food care behavior. Demographic variables are age, gender, educational qualification, occupation, marital status, monthly family income, residential area, duration of diabetes, information received on food care, type of blood glucose control, and history of visiting podiatrist. Setting it is conducted in Ramaya hospitals, population patient with the diabetes, two diabetes milliliters and sample size is selected 150 and sample was selected using non-probability convenient sampling and inclusion criteria used in this study is type 2 diabetes milliliters patient above 18 years of age and those who are available at the time of data collection and willing to participate in the study and able to read and understand English and Canada. So exclusive criteria for this study is any uh, like visual problems especially diabetic uh, retinopathy and having any cognitive and communication impairment and critically ill patients was excluded from this study. And tool for data collection used was there are two types, uh, types. section A, social demographic variables, section B, food care self-confidence uh, scale. And it is a uh, rating uh, like Likert scale and which is uh, having 12 items and food care behavior scale is uh, 17, uh, uh, 17 items in this. The least score is for uh, self-confidence, it is uh, least is uh, 12 and highest score is 60. And then uh, put care behavioral scale, it is the least score is 17 and highest is 86. So your reliability, reliability was conducted using the uh, Cranbach Alpha. So English tool, it was uh, for the self-confidence, it is English tool Alpha <laughs> was 0 0.92 and 0 0.71. The part two, like a food care behavior scale, it is English tool 0 0.98 and Canada to 0 0.84. And data was collected using this uh, administration. Before that, ethical permission was obtained from the medical college, in Rama Medical College and ethical committee. And then permission was obtained from the hospital authorities and later introduction was given to the subjects regarding the purpose and explain the purpose of the study and informed consent was taken from the subject and tool was administered to collect the data. It was taken around 25 to 30 minutes for collecting the data from each patient. The collected data was analyzed using the descriptive and inferential statistics. So here it is the result. It is taken the uh, like a frequency percentage distribution of the sociodemographic variables. So here it is taken majority of the subjects. So 33.3 .3 subjects were age group of 50 to 59 years. 50.7 were females and 34% were completed their graduation. 30% ha uh, uh, had that uh, private employees and 86% were married and 32% had monthly income of rupees 20 to 30,000. 54% had or re residing in urban area and 47.3% had uh, diabetes for more than one to five years and 58% were received for, uh, information on food care and 48% uh, was taking insulin to control their blood glucose levels and 83.4% did not visit any podiatrics for their food problems. So here it is a uh, section uh, table two frequency and percentage distribution of the subject in relation to food care self-efficacy and food care behavior. So here it is uh, like uh, it shows the highest and lowest scores. Majority that is 98% of them having their high levels of food care confidence and relation to food care behavior. 96% of them had the food care behavior. So on a, <clears throat> standard mean and standard deviation of the food care self-efficacy and food food care behavior. It shows that uh, like a 51 point mean for uh, food care confidence is 51.04 with a, a standard deviation of less uh, plus or minus 4.396. Food care behavior scale, it is the mean 64.50 with the 
um, standard deviation of plus or minus 7.316. So next, uh, it is correlation between the foot care self-efficacy and foot care behavior. It was, there was a moderate positive degree of correlation was found between the self-care efficacy and foot care behavior. And it is statistically significant, 0 0.01 level of significant. Hence, the uh, uh, research hypothesis one was accepted. There is a correlation between the self-care efficacy and foot care behavior. And association between uh, self-care efficacy and food care behavior, selected social demographic variables. There was no significant association found between food care self-efficacy and selected social demographic variables, except for education, occupation, marital status, and information on food care. As the calculated chi-square values were more than the table value at less than 0 0.05 level of significant. Hence, the research hypothesis stated H2 was rejected, and there is no association found between self-care efficacy and uh, selected demographic variables. And there was no significant association found between food care behavior and selected demographic variables except for age, gender, education, occupation, monthly family income, duration of diabetes mellitus, and information on food care. So the calculated chi-square values were more than the table value at uh, less than 0 0.05 level of significance. Hence, hypothesis H3 also was rejected. So discussion, first objective was to assess the food care self efficacy food care behavior among diabetic uh, patients with diabetes mellitus. Here, 98% had high food care self-efficacy, 96% had high food care behavior. This study was supported by the study conducted by Jano Corona in Indonesia. So in this study also says that 61 uh, had uh, high self-efficacy. Those who had self-efficacy uh, uh, performed their food care behavior. And 35 had low self-efficacy and they did not perform food care behavior. Second objective is to assess the relationship between food care self-efficacy and food care behavior among patients with diabetes mellitus. Here uh, in this study, moderate degree of positive correlation was found. And uh, supported by the study, same study, here also there was a relationship between the self-efficacy and people with the diabetes mellitus and behavior in food care activities. So uh, third objective was uh, to find the association between food care self-efficacy and food care behavior and selected demographic variables. There was no significant association found between food care self-efficacy and food care behavior and selected demographic variables. Uh, except for education, occupation, merit status, information on food care, age, gender, monthly income, and duration of the diabetes at uh, 0 0.05 level of significance. Hence, H2 and H3 was rejected. So, the study was also supported by the study conducted. There was also uh, there was a significant association between food care self-efficacy and food care behavior uh, among variables like gen age, gender, ethnicity, religion, and education, occupation. Come to the conclusion, the findings of this study showed that patient uh, with the diabetes mellitus had a high self-efficacy and high food care behavior. So ongoing patient education and the counseling program led by the trained nurses edu educator can be initiated at outpatient uh, clinics of the tertiary care hospitals and information booklet on diabetes mellitus, importance of self-efficacy, food care behavior and prevention of complications of diabetes could be made available for all the patients who are coming to the OPD so they can have that information so they can continue like they can have the confidence in taking care of their foot and then they can perform the foot care effectively so that the disability can be reduced and majority of the complications like amputation uh, can be reduced and so that they can live a quality of life even with the diabetes. I have finished my, my this one. Thank you for Thank giving you. me Thank an opportunity. You. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I request, uh, I request uh, the session chair for any queries. Hello, ma'am. Um, tell me. So, a nice presentation and all the best. You have given a lot of information on the food care. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I now invite uh, Ms. Adira B, College of Nursing, AIMS, Yoga, India. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll uh, share my screen. Uh, ma'am, uh, whether my uh, screen is visible? It's visible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. 
Uh, a very good evening to all. I'm Adira from College of Nursing, Ames, Devgar, Jharkhand. The, my paper is a narrative review. It's about tools for pulmonary function measurement of workers of coal mines. Uh, in interaction, occupational okay. respiratory disorders caused due to exposure to coal dust persist in both developed and developing countries, despite the knowledge about means of their prevention. And if for this prevention, the occupational health surveillance, screening, and prevention activities are an important component of an overall occupational health and safety program. We nurses play a pivotal role in occupational health surveillance and screening programs. And as per WHO, the 1996 document on surveillance of workers exposed to mineral dust recommends that the in the respiratory surveillance of workers in exposed to mineral dust. The following techniques need to be employed, like a questionnaire has to be administered that systematically inquires into work and exposure history. Systematic inquiry into relevant symptoms may also be desirable. Then physical examination, lung function test, chest radiograph, and that too it should be systematically interpreted using the International Labor Organization system. And tuberculin skin testing, unless the workers have been immunized with BCG. So with, with, the, with parallel to the, this document, many countries, they have adopted many surveillance systems. Like in USA, they include a work history questionnaire, just radiograph, respiratory assessment questionnaire, spirometry, and blood pressure screening. And here they recommend an initial chest radiograph and spirometry at commencement of work, second radiograph and spirometry no later than three years, and third after two years following second assessment thereafter after every three years. And in India, as per Mines Rule 29B, 1955, the initial medical examination is mandatory at the time of employment and the coal miner it, uh, should undergo a chest radiograph, pulmonary function testing and TB testing. And if it is positive, the sputum negative sample has to be produced by uh, before his joining or a certificate like he is on treatment has to be produced. Thereafter, periodic medical examination is prescribed every five years combined with chest radiography and spirometry. So from this uh, introduction, it is evident that there should be a pulmonary uh, screening surveillance or pulmonary function testing tool should be available, which can be easily administered, especially by an occupational health nurse in on-site as well as in hospitals. In clinical me medicine, inquiring about patient symptoms is, the, is usually the first step. Those suffering from occupational lung diseases may cough, wheeze, or experience shortness of breath. Thus, asking people about respiratory systems in a systematic fashion and analyzing the result has been one of the most powerful tools in epidemiological investigation. So, questionnaires can provide a wide opportunity. So, that is the aim why uh, the this narrative review was undertaken. So the objective was to identify tools for pulmonary function measurement of workers of coal mines that can be used by nurses in occupational health setting. And the design adopted was a narrative review. Uh, the methods which, I, which we have adopted are literature search from 2000 to 2023 in Science Direct, PubMed and Scopus were reviewed. And the search terms or the mesh uh, terms which we used were pulmonary function, coal miners, coal mine dust lung disease, prevalence and respiratory function. Eligibility criteria were study population of coal miners, quantitative studies and measurement of pulmonary function. Which studies they adopted measurement of pulmonary function among coal miners only were included in the review. Two reviewers analyzed the result using a numerical and thematic analysis. This was the selection process of articles for review. Uh, uh, in the rapid search of three databases, we found 1,020 titles who were, uh, which were uh, uh, in congruence with our search terms. And uh, But again, we had to re remove 975 duplicates. And again, we have examined 45. After uh, duplicates have been removed, 45 articles were reviewed. And as per the eligibility criteria, finally, only 12 pa papers were included in the review. So the result of the review had found out that most published literature originated from USA, UK, Australia, India, and China. And the sample size of our review, it ranged from 115 to 2073 participants. All studies which we have included in our narrative review were observational and quantitative. And the common dimensions measured were pulmonary function, quality of life, as well as the association of pulmonary function with demographic variables, and also including the test exposure.
were compared in some studies. And from review, we have found a variety of well-validated respiratory symptom questionnaires, which can be primarily designed for research or for diagnosis in symptomatic individuals were found. Overall, five tools were identified from various studies. Most of the literature addressed the use of well-validated respiratory symptom questionnaires, primarily designed for research or for diagnosis in symptomatic individuals. And in many of the studies, the tools like Modified Medical Research Council Questionnaire, COPD Assessment Test, Sinchol's Respiratory Questionnaire, King's Brief Interstitial Lung Disease Questionnaire were used, and these were not used alone. It was combined with spirometry test and sometimes with chest radiography. Uh, results continued. On review, majority of the studies used survey questionnaire compared with spirometry. That is 95% percentage. they used survey questionnaire compared with spirometry and most of the studies among these used modified medical research council questionnaire combined with spirometry and some have used uh, like 4 percentage they have used Sencho's respiratory questionnaire where it was uh, primarily purpose was assessing quality of life along with pulmonary function. In few studies, researchers have used structured respiratory questionnaire for assessing pulmonary function. And about the majority of the studies, they have used this tool like the Medical Research Council questionnaire. It was developed by Medical Research Council UK. It has a tool to study respiratory epidemiology in communities and occupational group. This tool consists of 17 questions on respiratory symptoms, cough, phlegm, uh, breathlessness, wheeze and chest illnesses now and during past two years and as well as there is a detailed history on smoking status. From the review, we have found that MRCQ or this tool was found to be used in various countries including India. In some studies, among the Indian studies, the researchers have modified the questionnaire and validated again including language in translation. The future directions from this review is that this review identified tools for assessing pulmonary function, which can be adopted by an occupational health nurse in on-site clinic or in occupational health units. However, uh, the tools need to be assessed by future research studies, especially the tools can be translated to different languages according to various countries and wider application of the tools by occupational health nurses. Uh, these were the references which I have <coughs> referred for the review. And thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me a chance for presentation. Thank you, ma'am. It is uh, our honor. Over to the session chair. Uh, Atira, uh, yes, ma'am. You have discussed about pulmonary function measurement of workers in coal mines, correct? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, do you find any abnormalities where they are working in? Uh, abnormalities, uh, ma'am, as as uh, uh, my narrative review was related to uh, tools, abnormalities, of course, in prevalence of respiratory disorders are very high among coal miners. Um, uh, as ma'am, I am a PhD scholar and uh, my topic is related to uh, prevalence of respiratory disorders among coal miners. So, yeah, uh, the... Pre uh, yeah, good. As a prevalence, like what you have been uh, suggested to the management or the workers who are working in coal mines? A uh, coal mines uh, that means uh, in India actually even though Mines Act prescribes for periodic medical examination it is not followed. So uh, so from the uh, review it is evident that a nurse led study can be adopted where we can um, uh, where we can uh, uh, teach the coal miners during periodic checkup the importance of prevention of coal mine uh, dust lung disease especially by adopting the preventive measures in periodic checkups periodic checkups are pres periodic checkups are prescribed every 3 years but it has to be compliance from the coal miners is very essential so uh, nurses okay. we nurses we can adopt means during our sessions we can give health education and we can uh, persuade them to come for compliance Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for presenting. I next invite to the final presentation for today, Dr. Meera DK from PG Department of Home Science Research Center, University of Kerala, India. Dr. Meera. Ah, okay, ma'am. Uh, um, shall I share my slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes, please. Okay.
uh, is it visible now it's it's visible ma'am okay so good afternoon one and all uh, myself dr meera i am working as a system professor in government college for women and the university of kerala as you can see on the screen the title of my study is study on mental distress and job satisfaction among south indian nurses to the introduction job related stress and job dissatisfactions are becoming increasingly large disorder among nurses stress and job uh, satisfaction have a cause for both the individual and the organization in terms of absenteeism and turnover both of which can impact on the standard of care given to patients so sometimes this leads to various chronic health condition which may affect the quality nursing care the objective of my studies are to ascertain the effects of shift work on the psychological distress and job satisfaction in the nursing staff who works on shift rotation to find out the association between the occupational stress and the selected shift variables among nurses to find out the association between job satisfaction and selected shift variables among nurses so this was the methodology of my study the area selected for the study is a trivandrum district in kerala uh it is the southern uh, part of kerala the extreme uh, southern part of india uh, the it was a cross sectional comparative study only female nurses were taken for the study of age group between 25 to 45 years who have a minimum 5 years of experiment uh, experience those who are doing uh, shift work from day of joining uh, purpose is sampling technique was adopted here uh, so 250 nurses were taken from uh, government and private hospitals uh, total comprises 500 uh, sample size the tools and methods include the adapted version of nursing stress scale and job satisfaction scale were used to assess the mental distress and job satisfaction so statistical test are uh, implemented where the peers chi square test and the percentage analysis so this is the sample design of the study so the total samples were taken from the hospitals in the trivandrum Uh, in the case of government hospital first we approach the district medical officer after obtaining the permission from that they give the list of total government hospitals in the uh, trivandrum and uh, those host we approach those hospital who show willingness to participate so general hospital taluk hospital specialty hospitals were included in the study um, in the case of private hospital first we draw out the total number of private hospital and we approach those hospital with a minimum 100 number of beds so with the help of a ward in charge and nursing superintendent we made a list of nurses who met our inclusion criteria so from the total 250 number of nurses from the uh, government hospital uh, we took 125 each from rural and urban area and for conducting the in depth study again 25 each from the rural and urban government hospitals were taken uh, same sampling technique was adopted in the private hospitals also so moving to the result and discussion so here is the result of demographic profile of the subject the graph a shows the age details where here uh, one more than one third population of nurses from the government hospitals were belong to the age group between 40 to 45 years and more than 50% sorry 50% of nurses uh, from the private sector were belong to age group between 30 to 35 years the b graph shows the marital status where the majority of nurses from the both sector were found to be married the c graph shows the years of experiences here more than one third nurses from the government sector were having minimum 5 years of experience and uh, more than nearly one uh, three fourth population of nurses from the private sector were having 5 to 10 years and the d graph shows the salary details here um, one more than one third population of nurses from the government sector were having salary package between 30000 to 40000 and uh, near more than three fourth population of nurses from the private uh, uh, private sector were belong to the salary package of between 20000 to 30000 now coming to the stress levels of the respondents the stress level of the uh, nurses were studied with the help of a nursing stress scale it is a uh, we used here an adapted version of a uh, nursing stress scale actually the scale was developed by gray, gray and toft in the year 19 uh, in 1989 uh, actually the, from the 34 statement we reduced it to 22 statements uh, according to the purpose of our study with the help of an expert so after checking the reliability of the scale we implemented this uh, for our study so actually the scale has two parts one is to check the severity of stress another is for the frequency of stress that is nss s and the nss f 
So we checked its association with the uh, shift variables. Shift variables we taken with the number of shift changes in month, a number of uh, night shift rotation in a month, and year of experience. We checked its association uh, association with the NSS score derived, and the result shows that uh, with regard to the severity of the stress, moderate stress was most common in both sectors. Positive association seen between the stress and shift change in private sector. Those who work for more than six shift were more stressed in private sector. And positive association between the stress and years of experience in the private hospitals. And those who work more than 10 years were more stressed. In regard to the frequency of the stress, majority of nurses of both sectors were more frequently stressed. And there was a positive association between the numbers of shift change per month and stress frequency in both sectors. Now, uh, the work satisfaction particulars, the various particulars we taken with the professional pride, recipient of additional elements, attitude towards promotion and seeking better employment. So majority of nurses from the both sector were proud about their profession and uh, it were no nurses in the both sector were receiving any additional elements for the additional time they were put in. And also the majority of nurses from the both sectors were not satisfied with the promotion procedures followed in their hospitals. And about three-fourths of nurses in the private sector were seeking better employment abroad, uh, which indicating uh, their uh, uh, dissatisfaction towards their job. So the job satisfaction also checked with the help of a job satisfaction scale uh, so here also we are used the adapted version of a job satisfaction scale and we derived the job satisfaction score and we checked its association with the shift variable and the result shows the majority of nurses in the both sector were having average job satisfaction and younger nurses in the government sector were unsatisfied with their job. So uh, this is the job satisfaction score graph. Actually, I, uh, as I already told, like a uh, majority of nurses were having the average job satisfaction score in the both sector. But when we consider the high job satisfaction score, the number of nurses in the government sector were having more uh, that is having the high uh, job satisfaction score. And one third nurses from the private sector were having the low job satisfaction score. So I'd like to conclude my study, uh, the study has identified that the poor pay scale, overtime hours, frequent shift change, staff shortage, inadequate leave, various occupational hazard, along with the shift and the stress, sometimes make this profession vulnerable. Specific measure to reduce the stress of nurse associated with the frequently occurring courses and measures to improve the job satisfaction associated with compensation and independence will be helpful to improve the performance of the nurse. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Over to the session chair. Thank you, Dr. Mina. Nothing oh, thank to you, ask you. My okay. presentation on the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for presenting. On that note, we are wrapping up the second session of the technical scientific sessions for today. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank our uh, Professor Mrs. Bula Ganta, Principal Jawahar Bharati Institute of Medical Sciences, College of Nursing, Nalur, Andhra Pradesh. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for sharing your valuable inputs with all the presenters uh, and for accepting our invitation to be a session chair. I would also like to thank all the presenters for your active participation. Tomorrow again, we will meet again uh, using the same link. Thank you so much for joining today. Have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity as a chair and uh, I hope and wish you all through this all conferences in future and using practice of collaboration with Dr. Manuel Ramaya College. And I wish you all the success to come up with more conferences and thanks to all the participants and presenters, scholars, researchers who have presented your topics. All the best for your future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma'am. It's a pleasure, Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>